Now I need to pop up the links to the live stream in the various locations. The live stream has just popped up, so that's working. All right, there it is. It's live stream. I've put it in the chat there. And let's pop it up on the Facebook page. All right, I've posted to Facebook and let's pop it on LinkedIn as well. It's been tweeted. Right. Thank you very much, James. So we've done all our little bits of social media duties. I think the conference has been going very well so far. It's been uh, very easy to, to run it in this way. There were some fantastic talks yesterday. Really enjoyed them. No pressure, Tim. <laughs> yeah, no, it's been great. From a, just a audience tracking perspective, we've kind of set the counters a couple of times as we've edited videos and stuff. So it's a bit hard to get a good count, but um, yeah, we can sort all that out later. Yeah. Well, one of the most valuable things to come out of this dev conference is the set of videos, um, you know, so that the people to refer to, you know, on, on these key features that are being talked about and going really in depth with them. I, I popped a link to the soaring one from uh, Samuel uh in the soaring on discuss we should probably do it with the other sort of main topics um and uh you know make sure that people are well aware of these you know in-depth uh videos yeah tom posted his into the discord perif chat so for the same sort of reason yep that we... exactly is that coming through it's coming through beautifully but uh, it's lost the propellers yeah, that's uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, either that or they're tiny ducted fans, you know. Oh yeah. Do we list the uh, videos on the wiki anywhere? I don't think so. Um, we could. We should certainly. Maybe we should actually have you know like a developer conference page or something or and I, I thought I might do a final blog post with a, a summary of all the videos at the end yeah, of the conference. Yeah, yeah. Um, some, sorry, some yeah. of them we can uh, stick on the um, on the wiki as well in appropriate places like Leonard's talk, you know, I mean, yeah. obviously I haven't heard it yet, but um, you know, we can put that uh, maybe on one of the control pages. Yep. Andy's, Andy's could go on the uh, notch filter page. Yep. So there's two, kind of two ways we could do. We could do a, um, you know, a list of all the videos that were, uh, all, all the presentations, uh, and we could also link them from the appropriate spots, as Randy's pointing out. Yeah, I mean, we already have the playlists in in the YouTube channel, so it's just kind of linking to playlists if, if people want to do that, I guess, um, for the broader stuff, and then where things fit into the wiki specifically, we can hook them in with their own link. That's good. We're like pushing out Rover 4.1 pretty soon as an indication as to how much Work we've done. There's a hundred lines in the release notes. 
Yeah. And that's that's like after, you know, come, you know, collapsing someone together. Yeah. Yeah. You that that would be a summary. That's not yeah. That's not all the changes. It's been yeah. I was rather stunned when I saw that, you know, well over half the lines of code in our code base have changed. Um yeah, I was uh, impressed by that. How did you um generate the statistic? I just did a git diff between a git hash from one year ago master and piped it through diffstat. Doesn't um, git diff dash dash stat give you that number anyway? Probably. Um, but I've always been used to using GIF stat. <laughs> GIF stat. I, I wasn't aware that there was a minus minus stat option to git diff. So thank you. Yeah, I think there's also git show dash dash stat as well. Obviously not all of those changes are, are logical or functional changes. Some of them will just be white space and that, or shifting and that kind of stuff as well. Party pooper. Who's a party pooper? James. Undermining all these changes, just saying that's nothing more than a few white space changes. All that work this year. <laughs> little more than fixing carriage returns at the end of lines. <laughs> yeah. Well, the other thing is that, um, that stat is just off the, the main firmware repo. It doesn't actually include the work that's happened in Pymo Link or in... Um, that's right, yeah. Or in, in Companion or any of that, you know, any of the ecosystem stuff. Um, it does include all the, you know, all the const fixes from Peter, though, you know, Peter Barker. So, you know, that's probably 20% of the code. Uh, actually, I think you'll find those const fixes are attributed to different authors. I just, I'm just, I'm just the messenger. <laughs> yeah, I'm well, a fan of the, uh, the const changes. We should also go through and re-edit or redo the PR of uh, changing all the divide by hundreds to multiply by 0.01. We should revisit that. One way to get your... Um... Uh, line count change up there, Tom. Actually, I was looking oh, yeah. at adding a an AP scheduler loop US and loop MS actually to all the places we ask for millis micros. Often we want to know the time that of the IMU sample rather than the current time, and it might reduce noise. So you know that was one that'll be a bit of a global change if we yep. we make it. So it's like an AP but, scheduler loop US and loop millis. But then a lot of other places want to know their own D, want to calculate their own DT. Um, yeah, but not necessarily. See, most of the people. It's 9 a.m., guys. All right, we're ready to go. Okay, it's 9 a.m. Thanks very much, James, for keeping us on track. <laughs> All right, so I'll just uh, start the recording here locally. Right, welcome everyone to the fifth session of the uh, 2021 Developer Conference. Um, and this morning, we are delighted to have uh, Tim Whitehand from Petrodynamics, and he's going to be describing a rather remarkable aircraft called the Transwing and the efforts to uh, uh, fly this with Pilot. Over to you, Tim. Thanks, Andrew. Um, good morning, good afternoon. I guess good evening to you, Pete. Um, anyone else in the UK? Um, so, yeah, Tridge gave me the opportunity to present Transwing. Um, for the, those of you who don't know it, um, really we've got a unique or novel transverse folding wing design. Uh, we're really focused on small UAS at the moment. Um, it's sort of scalable to a variety of different applications. Um, and um, recently, among other autopilot systems, we've been using Argypilot to um, see what we can accomplish. Um, I'm relatively new to Argypilot. Um, I'd say I've been using it for a good part of one, maybe two quarters, um, but um, it's been fantastic. I mean, coming up the curve is really fast and really easy. You guys have done a really fantastic job with uh, the documentation and the support community. So, um, I've assumed that a number of you have probably not been exposed to this. So I thought first thing I'd do is jump into a video. It really describes um, 
you know, what, what we have, what we're doing. Um, so I'm going to try and play this one through the um, PowerPoint presentation. Um, Trudge, let me know if it comes through okay. Yep, coming through fine. So this is a flight test from, oh, I'd say, October last year. So you can see take off to a hover, straight into transition. So onto the wing in 10 seconds, and then you're off flying like a regular plane. Um, you'll see a mission planner overlay here. Um, we actually flew this um, using RG Pilot as a fixed wing controller only. This was before we were sort of comfortable with it, um, you know, doing any forms of transition. So we're actually flying this in VTOL and transition with a KK2 controller, which switched over to RG Pilot when it was on the wing. So as you can see, um, that's what it does. It takes off like a quadcopter, it's on the wing and it's uh, in an efficient mode of flight as quickly as possible, which is, you know, quite unique in the sense that, um, you know, where we're going after the hybrid quads that'll take off and sort of lope up to a sort of a vertical point 30 feet above you, then sort of move into a forward transition. Um, we're all electric at the moment. So we're, it's all about energy conservation and efficiency. Um, so we want to get on the wing in that efficient state as quickly as possible. Um, and, um, you know, we have a propulsion system that um, acts for both VTOL and uh, fixed wing flight. So we're not carrying any sacrificial like booms, any additional propulsors that are really just carried along for 98% of the flight. So I'll pause that and we'll go to the next slide if I can. So here's a bit of more of a close up of the, uh, the transition fold. So this is one of our uh, 12 foot prototypes. We have um, aircraft from four feet to 12 feet at the moment. And we're working on some larger aircraft up to about 300 pounds. Um, but our focus right now is on this uh, 12 foot design. Um, in the fixed wing state, pretty conventional. Um, so essentially a high wing can be a low wing, V tail can be a T tail or a cruciform tail. Um, really, that's um, not really a factor in terms of the design itself. It's all about the wing fold. Now, uh, what makes our uh, guest configuration interesting? Um, so I've already mentioned the same propulsion system um, for VTOL as for fixed wing. Uh, we get on the wing really, really fast. Um, that's really key. Um, so because we're not carrying that sacrificial uh, lift system, we can um, we can cheap higher lift the drag. And when it comes down to electric VTOL aviation, the heavy hitters are, you know, lift the drag, disc loading, payload fraction, um, and um, battery energy density is a limiting factor for everyone. No one is going to have some magic battery that's going to be, you know, 20, 30% better than everyone else. So you've only got a few buttons to play with and lift the drag is a big one. So we've got a really controllable transition. Um, we'll jump into that in a little bit, um, but basically um, we're able to transition this on a very, very simple like KK2 PI controller. Um, what we're doing with RG Pilot and some other uh, flight controllers is we're um, looking to tune that transition in more detail. So to really sort of um, get the most out of this configuration, um, you really need to be able to tune a, a various number of set points through the transition um, in the, you know, the PID loops. And, um, and you know, we're making really good progress on RG Pilot and I'll um, get into some more detail um, on that in a few slides. But um, some other factors, uh, reduced takeoff and landing area. Um, a lot of people are really interested in that. Uh, wings fold in, um, you know, instead of having a 12 to 16 foot wingspan, you've got a you know, five, six foot span, effective span in uh, VTOL. So you can pull out of a box, launch it without having to put wings on. Um, we have some interesting, I'd say, um, wind resistance. Um, so your typical hybrid quad with a large wing span will be pretty susceptible to a cross. It'll want to lift up a wing. Um, we're in a little bit different where we have sort of a, a transverse, um, like flat plate that'll want to push us sideways. Um, but we have some unique advantages in terms of our inertia and the ability to take off and maneuver in cross conditions. Um, got a scalable platform. Um, as you go bigger, obviously the wing fold, um, there's definitely some challenges there. Um, we don't see them as problems, um, more a case of just getting the work done. 
And uh, the angle of attack of the wings, so between fixed wing and about 50%, the uh, effective angle of attack stays within 20 degrees. So you'll find actually through most of the transition, the wing is actually very effective. And you can see that um, in test data, um, you look at your power consumption through the transition. Once you get through uh, effective translational lift, um, the power comes off really, really fast. So that's uh, really quite interesting. So why RG Pilot? So we started with KK2, it's simple, it's lightweight, it's cheap. You know, you can buy a board for $20, $30. You can stick open arrow on it. It allows you sort of linear scaling between two states. It was a great place to get started, um, but um, you know, no logging of telemetry, pilot inputs. You can't really do much between those two states. Um, so it was great to prove out the platform and, you know, look, this does work. Um, here are some areas you need to work on. Now we want to dive into that sort of that transition um, portion and really tune it in properly. So RG Pilot, um, you know, preaching to the choir here, a lot of large selection of boards and peripheral devices, um, you know, much higher reliability than some of the cheap, smaller um, uh, boards, cost effective, you know, the system we're using is all up about 250, 300 bucks. Um, open source, the community that, you know, gets excited about it, uh, the documentation. Um, when we actually do get to a point where we're actually performing proper missions and, you know, operations, the training burden is really low for RG Pilot. There's a you know, huge user base out there. There's going to be some unique things to our configuration. However, um, you know, a lot of the work's already done there. Um, so another thing that's really interesting that's, um, I'd say, you know, sounds like it's reasonably new is the custom scripting um, via Lua, which really allows us to make some really interesting changes without having to read compile code. Um, and then also the um, software in the loop with real flight. So a little bit more about controls. So um, what I've got here is um, a six foot trans wing um, showing center of gravity and center of pressure, uh, the subcomponent level on the left and combined on the right. Um, one of the real sort of unique challenges here is that the wings fold back, you'll find there's a crossover in center of gravity and center of pressure. So, you know, traditional fixed wing aerodynamics, you wanna keep a positive static margin. Um, we keep um, quite a lot of mass in the wings for inertial relief. Um, you can imagine some batteries in the outboard nacelles, possibly some batteries in the inboards. As that wing swings back, we have a huge CG swing. Um, so from an aerodynamic and um, also from a uh, motor management standpoint, you know, there's a few tricks in there, particularly as the, the center of gravity crosses over the center of pressure. Um, what else? We've talked about roughly the weight and balance, thrust vector sweep, which I'll jump into in the next couple of slides. And we've got some interesting aero going on. Um, you know, we've got a, quite a lot of spanwise flow, um, particularly some um, interactions between the nacelles and the wing. Angle attack is really not as it seems. It's sort of hard to um, show you in a 2D picture, but you know, the first sort of 50% of the transition, the effective angle of attack is actually fairly low. You know, you don't you have a semi-stalled wing, but it's actually um, providing lift. It's actually the control surfaces are active. Um, in the later stages of the transition, the control surfaces, it, it's, it's somewhat um, uh, difficult to characterize how they're actually working in the later stages because the wing's fully stalled. Um, but another a, a brief way to describe it is they act as sort of like a damper and they're actually really important to some of the uh, transition stages. Uh, we've got some blown effects as well. You know, we've got big props right in front of the leading edge. Um, we've got an articulating hinge at a um, pretty critical part of the wing. So if you've ever done any um, wing structural analysis, you'll know your bending moments are gonna grow as you come towards the root of the wing. So we're converging a lot of our wing loads to a single point. And um, because of that, um, we're gonna have to deal with some unique stiffness challenges. Um, we're just not going to have the same stiffness as a full box wing. Um, and then that leads to, you know, control challenges, um, phase lag, and also simulator versus actual. So a little bit about the transition mechanics. Um, so I'm going to step through the transition um, from VTOL to fixed wing. So in the VTOL position, it's essentially a quadcopter. What I'm showing you there is basic thrust vectors and the torque reaction from the motors, uh, no control surfaces, no lift, no drag, no MG. Um, so nothing, um, you know, unusual here. It's a quadcopter, fly around at, you know, minus eight to plus eight. Um, 
pitch and roll really strong. IXX is really low. IOI is, is fairly high. Longitudinal CGs centered between the propulsors, right about here. Can you see my cursor okay, uh, Andrew? Uh, yes, no problem. Very good. Okay, 25%. This is where it gets interesting. Um, you're still flying around like a quad. Um, it's sort of a, uh, you know, a bit of a messy quad or a dirty quad in the sense that um, you're still, you know, flying it with the same, you know, reference system, you know, um, you're still in Q stabilized, it's still stable, but you're going to get starting to get a bit soggy in some of the axes. Um, this is really interesting and I can show you in a chart later on. This is where you have a yaw crossover. So basically imagine your diagonal motors, the torque reaction in a quad motor um, situation, giving you your yaw control as the wings come out. Um, there's actually like a, 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 a essentially a flipping where you've got the diagonal motors, which will be fighting the left versus right thrust to control your. Um, so in this configuration, you can fly around just fine up to about 10 meters a second, uh, any faster than that really doesn't start to like it. And you want to open up the wings a little bit further. Uh, the control surfaces are coming active. 50%. Um, again, you can fly around just fine. It's um, it's more like a flying like a plane. You've got some forward speed. Your angle of attack is coming up. Your wings are still effective. Um, we've got some cross coupling in the propulsors, um, which makes control a little more interesting. Um, so you're starting to get a bit weaker in pitch, but your control surface, your VTAL is becoming more active, which is helping out there as well. Um, one thing we notice here is. Um, it really helps to have very active ailerons at this point here, even more active than on the wing with lots of D. Um, and that's why we want to sort of dive into the transition and actually go and tune each points um, in, you know, with P, I and D all separate to actually get the most out of the configuration. 75%. So generally what the way we fly at the moment is we will um, transition to about 50%. Um, verify everything's working fine and then slowly transition to 100. We won't dwell at around 50 to 75 percent, but technically, you know, you can. 75 to 100 is fine. It'll just fly around like a, like a very sort of so much uh, slow, dirty, draggy uh, fixed wing aircraft. Um, at these later stages, the wing, the inboard portion of the wing still not active um, there's a lot of drag being created there and also have a little bit of a um, upward angle on the thrust so imagine it like high alpha flight you can fly quite slowly but it's not very efficient another little video here this is an outbound transition from a hover um, ignore the linear actuator there it was starting to come apart you can see we're at about 50 percent still wings level Happy to fly around in some turns. Um, you'll get some roll oscillations if the controller isn't tuned right, some of the cross coupling. And I believe in this video, it'll go through a full transition as well. Ah, up to 90% on this guy here. So at this point, it's just flying around like a normal uh, fixed wing airplane. Okay, let's get back to the presentation. Okay, next slide. If I can operate my computer. Is that coming through okay? Yep, coming through. Yeah, that's good, Great. looks good. So uh, fixed wing, a um, little low on the volume metrage. Um, I'm not sure if that's me. I can only just hear you, but that's okay. We'll continue. Uh, it's probably at my end. Yeah, right. Okay, It'll so fixed right. wing, transition mechanics, um, no big mystery here. Cruise configuration, we're a conventional multi-propulsive V-tail. Tail is a bit on the stubby side at the moment. Um, we're playing around with different tail sizes. Um, we're still sort of optimizing for the right sort of tail length, tail size. Um, we've got a vertical stabilizer at the moment that's not moving for directional stability during flight tests. That'll probably disappear. Um, and um, differential thrust is nice to correct for any adverse yaw. We've got the really long skinny high aspect ratio wing and the kind of not so, um, a tail that, um, 
is somewhat um, you know disproportional to what you typically see on like a high performance glider. So IXX is really high, IYY is sort of medium to low. Couple more videos. So this is one of our flight test prototypes with the folding props. Um, the previous video was a um, earlier prototype with um, much higher, uh, lower aspect ratio wings. So this is the, the higher aspect ratio design. So this is actually transitioning on KK2, uh, manual flight. Um, so really it's just providing basic stability augmentation. Um, as you can see, it's um, some pretty tight turns there. Um, that's outbound and inbound. Okay, now into uh, Archer Pilot and what we've been getting up to. So um, already talked a little about KK2. Some of our early attempts were to create custom code to really replicate KK2 gain scaling, which is basically two essentially set points. Um, you can use that for a variety of things, even tail sitters. Um, that worked just fine. Um, but when we're sort of replicating it, um, it, 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 it was okay. Um, and it was a really great way to uh, learn RG Pilot its strengths, its weaknesses. Um, but I'd say in the last quarter, we've sort of, sort of shifted gears, changed strategies. And what we're looking at now is taking quad plane and determining what elements are missing to actually allow this configuration to fly with as minimal sort of uh, code manipulation as possible. And what we've done with that is with Lua scripting. Um, so, you know, basic block diagram there, really straightforward. We went from the CAD, we create a MATLAB physics model, which informs a set of matrices that we put into a custom branch of, um, of master um, and run it in the SIDL. So at this point where we're still in the sort of the simulation bench test phase, um, and um, I'd say in the coming weeks, we'll probably start stretching out and start doing some testing um, on the actual aircraft itself. So a little about the physics model um, that um, Peter Hall um, assisted us in building. Um, so I'll uh, do a little introduction and Peter can talk through some of the uh, scaling factors. So we talked about, we talk about two references here um, and we're sort of still developing both. Number one being your standard reference frame. Number two is a little bit trickier in the sense that if you imagine the IMU is sitting inside of the wing so if the IMU is transitioning and folding and rotating in 3D space, um, that's what you're seeing on the right there. So really um, basic model that takes the CAD, um, replicates the, um, the geometry, the thrust vectors, and then rotates them through a sweep. So um, are you there, Pete? Oh, I'm not yep, sure if Pete I'm has here. present uh, capability. Oh, there he is. I'm here, yeah. Yeah, so I'll just introduce this, Pete, and you can sort of jump in and um, um, mention anything that, interesting that I might have missed. So what you've got here is in the bottom left, you've got our matrix factors, or oh, sorry, top right first. So matrix factors, bottom left is the same factors normalized by inertia, really important. And then the bottom right is the final gain scaling factors that we apply uh, essentially like a number from zero to one that's applied to AP motors. Um, and you can see three um, points of the charts that are uh, circled. These are interesting. So I was talking earlier about the your crossover in the early portion of the transition. You can see that guy there. Um, in pitch, um, as the wings fold out, you've got VTOL on the left to fix wing on the right. You can, um, if you can visualize by looking at these vectors, pitch control via motors only is gonna come less and less effective as that uh, moment arm decreases dramatically. And then towards the end, you almost get to a, you know, a singularity or like a divide by zero error. Um, roll, um, 
let me think about role here. Um, Pete, do you want to explain the um, the yeah, so, role so that, chart there in the right? So that role weirdness is as role. So so as we're in the sort of quad mode, role is is dominated by thrust, and then as the wings come straight, suddenly role is now controlled by only motor torque. So you can imagine all the thrust vectors are lined up. So the you you change the thrust, you don't change role, but the torque changes role. So that inversion is when they go from being thrust dominated to torque dominated. Yep. So what we've done on the next slide is we've taken the bottom right and blown it up. So um, we've basically gone and manipulated the code a little bit, or at least the physics model to cap out those, essentially those funny, um, you know, um, I guess off to infinity errors. And um, really this is, you know, in the guts of it, this is what you're looking at. So you can see roll pitch and you're on the roll side, you're in the quad mode, very effective in roll um, as you go to fix wing. Obviously that goes down to near zero, but that's fine because midway through the transition, all your control surfaces are coming alive. Um, and pitch and yaw should be, um, you know, fairly straightforward. So I'll leave this one to you, Pete. This is really talking about what we've actually done with um, Lua and what we've had to change inside of master to allow us to run these scripts. Yeah, so it's it's actually not that dissimilar from my uh, six off stuff uh, we talked about uh, this morning. So so firstly, we just add a new motor backend. Uh, so you can see uh, there's a, a commit here adding a motor backend. Uh, there's a few scripting bindings, and then we we add each motor. We sort of define each motor with this uh, add motors table uh, motor interp table. So it's very like the stuff we looked for six stuff uh, uh, yesterday. So we've got roll, pitch, and your uh, motor one, two, three, and four. So it's it's almost exactly the same. Uh, unlike the six stuff stuff, obviously we haven't got you know uh, forwards, uh, backwards, left and right. So we've got our standard roll, pitch, your just as you would have for a normal copter. And then we associate each of those table with a point. So this table at the top is uh, like point zero, and it's got all of these factors for motor one through four, roll, pitch, your. And then we add another table. So this is point one in this case, and we've got another set of factors. So we've got, uh, in this instance, there's 11 of these tables. There's one for zero, point one, point two, all the way to one. So that zero to one value that is associated with each table is an interpolation point between forward fly and the hover configuration. So we just do a big lookup table for, for AP motors and load in these, these numbers and uh, just like the six stuff stuff, loading it in with a script in the beginning is much, much easier than having hundreds and hundreds of new parameters. Uh, so uh, sort of scripting is a, is a sort of easy way to make this really easy to configure. We don't have to add hundreds of parameters uh, and it, it is all quite friendly. And in fact, the, the MATLAB plots we were looking at early, earlier, they, in fact, the MATLAB plots just generate this, these tables for you. So you, it's, it's a copy and paste job uh, from that MATLAB physics model. Very good. So then on to simulation. So, um, sorry, can I, thanks. Actually, can I just jump in? It's Randy. Um, sure, I was sure. wondering, um, maybe this is one for, for Peter Hall, but I'm, or whoever really doesn't matter. Um, how do you know what, what, uh, like, how are you tying these, uh, tables to, um, to the point in, in the transition? Like, I mean, I, I guess, you know, there's a pilot input Are you using pilot input to pick the table or how's that happening? We've got a couple of um, we've got a couple of methods um, at the moment. In the latest release, um, there is um, the ability to control the wing tilt manually um, using the Q man throttle command, I believe it is. But that's really just for testing in Q stabilize. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Peter, but we're really just pegging this to the Q wind tilt parameter. Yeah, that's, that's right. So we 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 just grab the output. The, the wing tilt servo output, we just get the normalized output for the wing tilt. And we just use that as our as our lookup table interpolation point. Uh, oh, so right it's, okay. it's all very straightforward. 
right, yeah, we cool. haven't got any tricky. We haven't tied it to airspeed or some other like uh, parameter that you do in more sort of an automated operation. We're still in the sort of exploration phase and we do want to have you know control over some of these things. But, you know, going forward, um, when we want to really automate this thing completely, we don't want to pilot on the sticks. You know, we want to plan a mission, select auto and go. Um, you know, there's there's some cool things we could do there. Um, once we know we've got um, you know, airspeed acting reliably, um, it might be more complex than just using the Q-tilt parameter. We can, um, we can yeah, depending on actually, the mission profile and the transition profile. It is actually linked in directly. If you, if you did take off in auto, the, because the wing tilt itself during the automatic transition um, does go as a, as a rate until it reaches the specified angle, but it then holds based on the airspeed. So it is indirectly linked Q to the airspeed. Yep. Um, but uh, it's not, it's like there's a step function there and it's using the same strategy we use for current quad plane code. So there is a linkage in there to airspeed, but not a smooth one. Um, one of the problems is you might end up backing off and oscillating and particularly with some lag in the wing tilt. If you've got You've got the, the the rate of airspeed update, the rate that the wing is tilting, etc. If you tried to link it too directly, you could end up like oscillating the wing tilt, uh, which is yeah. why in the original tilt quad plane we didn't actually directly link that to airspeed because otherwise you you I actually did try that very early on. You end up with very very nasty oscillations, and you're far better off sort of driving it through slowly. Um, and uh, if you are on a forward transition. The, the difference with this aircraft is that I, I think it'll be a far more common operation to hold partially uh, tilted. Whereas our current quad planes, we either are, we're either doing a forward transition or we're doing a back transition or the pilot's controlling the transition. Um, you're not doing a mission where you're deliberately holding a partial transition. And that's something new in our quad plane code that's going to require some some considerable thought in how we control that angle versus airspeed. Yeah, I've got that in the latest slide, Andrew, which is more like a, a Q tilt max overhaul, or not so much an overhaul, but you know, expanding on that. Um, yeah, you know, it's we're going to be different very in the sense that to, to see, particularly with sort of noise and gusts and things, and you don't want a gust to sort of change the tilt suddenly if it's just a short gust. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You add more complexity and, you know, your fault tree just expands. Um, yeah, one thing that uh, I guess it doesn't too much differ from your normal tilt plane, but, you know, from flight testing and, you know, I guess operational experience, this, this airplane wants to accelerate through transition quickly. So, yes, you know, we do want to get to a certain airspeed before sort of committing, but we want it to be very dynamic. We don't want it to you know, take off, sit at 50%, build up speed, move on to the wing. It's it's going to happen fast and we don't want to, uh, I guess how I say, like cap it to a Q-tilt max at the moment. And you'll sort of see that in this video here. Um, so what I've got here is we've got our real flight uh, model for our six foot prototype. And um, I've got this um, video running on master. So this is just straight up master. Um, the new code is not part of this, um, not quite ready for prime time, but um, we'll see if this comes through. So my screen capture was not quite um, as clever as I thought. So you only got a quarter of the screen, but it should be coming through fine. So take off straight onto the wing. A short little mission to fly out on the other side of the, uh, the desert here to have a look at a sign. This was just a Q hover, uh, may have been a Q loiter to fly by YA. So on fly by YA now, uh, bring back the power, reducing altitude. Um, it likes to transition, you know, closer to 22, 24 meters a second. Back transition, you can see some um, some pitch disturbances there. Um, you know, we can play around with the, um, the Q pitch settings, but um, I think what will happen is once we load the new code, a lot of this stuff's gonna go away. Um, we're able to tune the, the D terms a lot better. So then turn around back onto the wing. See where it paused there. That was where I believe it hit the Q tilt max. Um, didn't have sufficient speed to continue.
Um, we're sort of tricking it at the moment by setting our fly-by-wire minimum speed very low and our Q-tilt max very high. So I think the Q-tilt max on this is about 80. Our um, fly-by-wire min is about 22, which is kind of like right on stall. Don't really want that at this weight. Then back into a normal multicopter. We've kept this model um, as close to the real life aircraft as possible. Um, we're carrying a five pound payload at about 23% mass fraction. So with this wing area, we're carrying a really quite a high uh, wing loading. So, sorry about that. Um, it'll want to fly fast um, and, um, you know, fairly different to, you know, your normal RC airplane where um, you'll, um, sorry, I've just got a phone call in the background, I'm killing. An RC airplane where you'll sort of take off at, you know, moderate speeds, fly around the loop. Um, this plane really wants to accelerate and get out of you very, very quickly. So, you know, we're excited to get this thing flying nav and auto missions as quickly as possible. So flight testing. Um, I guess this is a work in progress. Um, we've got the airplane flying uh, as a quad, flying nav missions. Um, we've been massaging the uh, Q man throttle, uh, the Q stabilized settings. So basically you can fly this like a multi-copter with the wings at a uh, partially folded state. Um, and uh, I'd say, just watch this space where uh, we're pretty close. And um, when we do have this flying, um, hopefully we can post some more videos. So on to sort of the roadmap ahead. We've got a long shopping list um, and, um, you know, we're going to chop um, a few of these off at a time. Uh, maybe some of them will be wrapped up um, depending upon the time I've got, um, some of our supporters and the projects we can fund and the projects that people are interested in. Um, but number one is we're going to choose a, um, a reference frame approach in terms of the uh, physics model. Um, so that will have two very distinct, um, I'd say, forks in the road as to how we handle the custom scripting through to master. At the moment, the second approach on the two, um, Peter did some really clever stuff with Q-trim pitch, which is typically used for tail sitters. Um, as you're coming in, say, for instance, you're on the wing, you're doing an inbound transition, you're going to click in Q stabilize, the AHARs will immediately pitch 90 degrees down and trick the, you know, the INS into thinking that um, it's actually moving with the wing twist. It works. Um, there's some, you know, there's some things we've got to work on, with it, but um, it really, when we explain this to new people, the, the reference frame on the right there, number two, it's really sort of hard to get, hard to get your head around. Um, number one, the standard reference frame, you know, straightforward out the gate. Um, with one, you have these, you know, these issues, these singularities that we run into, but um, there are ways of dealing with that manually. So once we've made a decision on the reference flame, I think we'll, um, we'll move through the next stage pretty fast. So on to the next slide. Error scaling of, scaling of control surfaces. So right now, all of this is just focused on the motors. Um, at the moment, when we do our testing, our control surfaces are fully active, same with KK2. It's absolutely fine. Um, but one thing we'd like to do is have the control surfaces really, they don't need to move in a quad mode. Um, and then we want to probably linearly scale them up to about 50% transition where they're at actually a very high effectivity. And then as you get back onto the wing, then to settle down again. Um, nothing um, overly complex there, but just some work. Um, we previously talked about Q tilt max, um, got some work to do there. Now um, at the moment, our scaling factors really are uh, really just applied um, a scalar to the output of AP motors, which I understand is sort of like a, a, a mix of essentially the inner loop is taking into account the individual P and ID, PID terms. We're applying a factor to that. That's turning into a PWM that's going out to the motors. Uh, one thing we'd really like to do is be able to sculpt those terms individually, um, particularly the derivative. Um, part of that is um, we want to make it a bit more user-friendly. So I noticed in the latest beta on Mission Planner, there was a enhanced, I think it was a nav tuning tab. 
um, it'd be pretty cool to put together a tuning tab to customize those um, those set points um, live the emission planner as opposed to shutting down, reloading the script, starting again. Um, it'd be really nice to have sort of dynamic um, tuning of those. Climbing transition with Q options. Um, so at the moment, we're sort of at least my uh, primitive operators standpoint with uh, mission planner the missions are sort of take off to five or ten feet stop move into a forward transition what we really want to do is you know take off to a low hover just out of in-ground effect and then transition in an outboard climb uh outward climb um as you saw in that first video that's where a lot of this magic is we can get onto the wing really fast um that video uh the first one i showed of paris 12 you know that went from hover to fixed wing in less than 10 seconds. And you know, that's what we're targeting. Um, inbound I approach. A, I have a question. Sure. Uh, Tim, uh, this is uh, Tom Pittenger. Um, how do you handle the uh, integrator buildup on your kind of flight surface and your, your pitch and roll when you're kind of in a quad plane or quad quadcopter mode and then you kind of hold it in some other, you know, some opposition and you fly around and go into other modes. What, what, what is your integrator term doing? Do, do you do anything to restrain it? Yeah, we're going to cap it. Um, in terms of what, how far we've got at the moment, I don't have a really good detailed answer or some data to show you right now. Um, but typically um, we want to keep the I term on the low side and then have a, an I max to prevent that wind up. We haven't had a huge, a lot of wind up issues to date. Not that we're not going to encounter them or we, you know, I fully have, um, a, you know, a deep understanding of um, where we're likely to see problems in either the, uh, the motor control or the control surface. Um, are, you, um, are you primarily focused, is your question more on the motor control or the control surface or both? More on the control surface. Because yeah. on plane, you have like the whole, just you have just a, um, you know, like an auto tune was doing the roll and pitch uh, type type uh, tuning. I'm just wondering how, how, that in, in, how, how, that, how that really messes with your eye as far as just dealing with your wind up. Like, yeah, like, I mean, for, for, we're not doing anything, anything you... special right now, um, but okay. um, I can absolutely get back to you on it. I mean, if I may, so so when when we're flying on the on the motors, so you so we're in a Q mode. The motors aren't all locked to the to the, to the same PWM. So in, in that case, we use the integrator term, the sort of copter integrator term. We run the integrator off the motors, and plane keeps getting zeroed the whole time. And so so long as you've got enough sort of control authority on your motors, you, and and obviously you've got a huge amount more than than you would have on your control surfaces. So, so long as we've got enough headroom on that motors item, we just keep zeroing the plane item. And, it, and it's basically a fundamentally, you can't have the plane item and the copter item running at once because you end up in a, some, you might end up in a situation where like copter is trying to tilt forward and plane is trying to tilt back and the two items fight each other. So you can only use one at a time. And when the motors are active, we use the copter item and you've got so much control authority that, uh, you probably won't have a huge item just because there's so much power there. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you've got active. the control, you've got the control surfaces wagging at that low speed, right? Um, as you know, they're trying to work, but there's insufficient airspeed to get a response, but the motors are controlling that. So, um, I mean, Peter, you could probably explain this in more detail, but um, if we weren't zeroing out the control surface eyes, they would, you know, effectively wind up, wouldn't they? Because yeah, they, they are, they saturate. yeah, yeah. Cause the motors are doing the work, the control surface are trying, but they don't know that the motors are doing the work. Yeah, exactly. And, and you'd have the thing that you get on uh, uh, like tail dragger takeoffs and things like that. You get, you would get nasty wind up and suddenly it would all become uh, effective and it would, would do a big dive or something while it's trying to clear its item. Right, that's why you'd freeze it or lock it or, or zero it or something. Well, what, what, what my question is is really not not a what do you do when you're in full airplane versus that it's, it's the transition because when you're in you know when you're flying around at your seventy five percent transition, uh, so you, so you're you know mostly in the fixed wing size, but you're still having effects from your motor library for that. You you have a, you have basically have a large error that you're going to build up, uh, you know, intentionally because you need it for various 
you know, pitch or whatever aspect. So how does that, how does the integrators, uh, like at what point do you, maybe on the plot, what, I, what, I, what I'm, maybe the disconnect I'm not seeing is on, on that MATLAB plots. Um, if you can go back to yeah, that slide. Yeah, I think, I think um, you're going to see that more at the earlier stages. At the I later here. stages, um, yep. you know, your control surfaces are very active and your motors are very ineffective in pitch and also roll. Um, so, you know, at those later stages of transition, the motors are great for differential yaw. They're very ineffective for everything else. So you're relying on the control surfaces at that point. Yeah, uh, can you go back a slide? I, so I think on the gain scaling here, I think this is probably answers my question maybe where the role in the pitch is, has more authority from the motors, but then not much on yaw, I guess. Is that, was that what this, um, the, the bottom right one shows like so so this would be like a decision of where you'd switch your pids uh, for 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 the roll for the roll pitch yaw it'd come from motor library versus come from the surfaces like the plane library uh at the moment the surfaces are independent of this this is really just a scaling factor applied to the motors itself and the the surfaces are fully essentially active from the start and they're going to come effective as airspeed builds up, but there's no logic in there that tells it to flip from one to the other. You know, correct me if I'm wrong, Peter. No, you're, you're, you're right. So, so basically uh, we're, uh, as far as quad plane is concerned, we're a, we're a copter until we get to that hundred percent tilt. Only once we reach that hundred percent tilt, then we're a plane. Um, there's, there's a little subtlety in there in that, um, you, you said earlier, Peter, that we could end up with, um, you know, the, the fixed wing trying to tilt up and the copter trying to tilt down. That actually won't happen because we always use the one demanded rate on each axis. So we always we only run the one attitude controller, but we run different rate controllers. And we actually slave the copter rate controller to the plane attitude, the desired rate coming out of the plane attitude controller when in a forward transition. And in a back transition, we do the opposite. We take the desired rate from the copter controller and we feed that into the planes rate controller so that we don't end up with competing rates because otherwise you end up with the two controllers fighting each other in a really nasty fashion um so it's we are actually on a single attitude controller just a different rate controllers on each of the the two controllers does that make sense Anyway, it's a, it, it, we changed that last year uh, a little bit and, um, and the way we slave in the rates between the two, but they could be running with different time constants because the different filtering between the two, uh, the target filtering is different. Well, there's yet to be a day. I haven't learned something new about RG Pilot. The, the, the hole keeps getting deeper. Oh yeah, it's a, it's a fun hole. Okay, so back to where we were. Um, so we're talking about uh, climbing transition, uh, expand inbound approach nav planning. So we can do some interesting inbound approaches. We want to be on the wing as you know, long as possible, descend quite a high speed, low altitude, and then we want to extend our sort of transition past our normal five, six seconds to do a sort of a, a, a long, flat, uh, like uh, the way to describe it is like a long flare. Um, like we want a minimum energy approach. So if you can imagine coming in on low bats and you really don't have a lot of power to give, you want to have to avoid putting in that you know high throttle until you're almost ready to put down like an auto rotation on a helicopter. So um, we're going to play around with what what is actually able to be done now with Mission Planner. I expect there'll be some some cool things we can do um, in there. Um, Next uh, bullet point I added at the last minute. So one of the earlier talks, um, Tridge, was related to ESC control. Um, one of the things we do at the moment to control a linear actuator that controls our wing tilt, we have a you know, off-the-shelf um, DC brushed motor controller with some micro switches. Um, so basically um, your uh, motor encoder output is going to give you the state at which the um, the transition is at, and we can control that by PWM. But we want to get a bit more sophisticated. We want to actively monitor the uh, motor temp, the motor current, because you can imagine as the linear actuator goes back to fixed wing mode, it's going up against a hard stop. 
essentially, or at least a very hard spring. We want that motor to be tuned very well to keep those wings in the locked in position, particularly after we have like a secondary interlock, but we don't want that motor to keep pulling, you know, a couple of amps in this case and you know, burn itself out. So having more precise control over that motor and encoder, um, that'd be really, really nice. And I'm not sure if there's any sort of segue into what was previously talked about ESC control. Um, lastly, what we got? Um, a better way to turn off and stow motors and fixed wing flight. So uh, we have folding props on this six foot model. Um, the idea is you take off on four. Once you're in a efficient cruise flight, you drop two, fold them up, increase your lift to drag ratio um, and have more efficient flight. So um, I believe there's some like bit masking options to do it. Um, we haven't really dived into it in too much detail, but um, it'd be really nice to be able to issue a command through a plan and say, you know, once you're on the wing, drop those motors, turn them back on, we're ready to transition. Uh, also variable pitch prop. Um, this configuration excels um, with the ability to control uh, you know, pitch of the props itself. So you could imagine at the moment, a lot of our tests are done with a fixed pitch uh, sort of climb prop. Um, as your lift to drag ratios get into the low teens, the ability to go to a much coarser pitching cruise gives you tremendous gains in uh, range and endurance. So we've got a few little R&D projects uh, working on variable pitch mechanisms for the small size of aircraft so from like 12 inch props to up to about 22 inch props. Um, and when we get to that point, we're gonna wanna be able to have some, um, some clever control of, um, of that um, via RG Pilot. Um, unaware if there are actually any uh, functions available at this point, um, but I wanted to uh, drop the note in there in case it sort of um, pricked up anyone's ears. Um, and then lastly, you know, operator enhancements, you know, specific to the trans wing. Um, we want, you know, the person to be planning a mission. We want the system to give the operator feedback on the, the health of the approach. Um, you know, is the aircraft in the box? You know, way to describe it. Is he too fast? Does he have enough power? Um, you know, is his sync rate within limits? And, you know, give him some, you know, visual enunciator to let him know where he is. And that is about it for now. Um, before I jump to um, questions, I'd like to um, just thank Peter Hall. He's done a tremendous amount of work um, on the Archipelago code. Uh, Brandon, who's been helping out a great amount on the real flight model and obviously Tridge and Andrew Rabbit, which was, um, it was great. He did some really awesome uh, code manipulations in the early days and um, look forward to working with all you guys some more. Um, at this point, um, I guess I'll, um, uh, give anyone the opportunity to ask any questions. Happy to uh, discuss anything in more detail. Um, go for it. Absolutely fantastic. It's really uh, great to see this aircraft coming together. And I'm, I'm looking forward to the first uh, full transition on, on RG Pilot uh, flight video in, the, in a real vehicle. Uh, that'll, be, that'll be great to see. So any I, other... I have, a, yeah. Yeah, I have a question about just the, uh, how that, the slider that slides back down the fuselage, how that impacts just the structural integrity of the of the body. Yeah, so if you're thinking about the fuselage side, um, you're talking about this linear actuator running down the tail. Is, mm -hmm. Do I understand that correctly? Yes. Um, yeah, so you can imagine a normal fuselage, that entire section is gonna be a torsion cell. Um, so you're gonna have you know bending and torsion through that depending upon the tail loads. We've basically gone and sliced that in half. So, um, that's still a closed cell torsion, a box, um, but it's only got half of the, I could say, area moment of inertia. So what'll have to happen is if we're going to continue down this route, and we've got a few different mechanisms for actually actuating the wings. This linear actuator is only one of them. Um, but basically, depending upon your tail loads, you've got to size that lower torsion cell to take all the, the structural loads. This top section here is really just a cover, an aero shell. So is there a considerable amount of strain when you're in like a halfway, you know, 50% or whatnot? Is it torquing 
Load, the, bearing the load somehow? Yeah, you're talking about the axial load down the actual uh, linear actuator rod here. Um, in this case here, um, this is a six foot model. We're talking, you know, probably in the order of like 15 to 20 pounds max. Um, we've actually designed this uh, linear actuator like um, like a, it's a custom all the way. We've got a, you know, a carbon tube and a, and a thrust screw and we've kept it really, really minimum gauge. And you saw in one of those videos earlier, um, I'll see if I could pull it up again. You saw the linear actuator sort of bucking around. Um, there's sort of a really, you know, there's a balance between strong enough and stiff enough and then starting to, you know, weigh too much. Um, let me have a look. Oh, this might be another good view. Um, actually, I'll go back to this guy here. Um, So again, similar to the six foot model, you've got the slice down the side. Um, and on the 12 foot model, you're gonna have much larger loads. Um, but in terms of, can the structure handle it? Um, the linear actuator is actually the least of our concerns. Um, it's more the, well, I'd say the, the least challenging problem. Um, what's actually more interesting is as we scale this airplane up, um, the, the wing hinge itself, um, we're going to be focusing all of our loads on that. That's really what becomes the critical link. And as you go bigger, you can imagine having to put a secondary interlock in the back uh, for fixed wing flight. And um, as your you know, bending loads and your shear force of scale, um, your wing is going to be taller in airfoil and the, um, the wing hinge is going to scale with it. Um, Stress isn't really uh, a concern. It's more of a stiffness problem more than anything else. All right, thanks. Um, I have one more question about uh, propellers or, or the motors during fixed wing flight. Do you keep all four motors going? Uh, at the moment we do. Um, the idea is to drop two. Um, you don't need all four um, for right. fixed wing flight. So then you have um, like the inners or the outers or whatever uh, um, be folding prop? Yeah, uh, so you'd have two that would be variable pitch, um, and they would be the uh, the motors that you're going to run throughout the full duration of the mission, and then the others will just be a simple uh, fixed pitch folders. Why variable pitch? You can achieve much higher efficiencies in terms of um, prop error efficiency, better advance ratios. So basically, in in VTOL you're going to be wanting a really, really fine pitch, you know, high RPM. Once you transition onto the wing and the airplane wants to surge forward, um, you're going to want to coarsen up that pitch. So with a variable pitch, you get the best of both worlds. Um, if you've got a slow, draggy airframe, um, like a Cessna 172, um, you won't really realize huge, um, I guess, performance increases. Whereas if you had a more... Um, like slick, higher lift to drag aircraft, like a, um, what's a good example? Like a long easy or a, um, I'm just trying to think, um, total mental blank, but long story short, um, lift to drag, once you get up above sort of seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, as you grow higher, the efficiency gains you can get from a variable pitch prop um, start to start to build up quickly, and well, we're talking so, in the in interest of this airplane. Assuming we've got a lift the drag of let's call it twelve to fourteen, we can probably increase our endurance and range by between fifty and one hundred percent. Right. So just to be clear, the uh, the variable pitch is not necessarily for your forward flight. It's the to have a similar motor being uh, well to have one pitch configuration for VTOL and one configuration for forward or do you actually want variable during your forward flight oh no you want the variable is all about the forward flight um okay. what we could do like say for, with fixed picks you can optimize for one side or the other um if for instance we had a, a high pitch props fixed pitch we're going to really really struggle in VTOL um we're going to get to a point you'll keep coarsening up the pitch where you'll actually stall the props so ideally you want a low pitch for VTOL to maximize your cargo carrying capability, maximize your control margin in VTOL, um, which is really important for taking off in you know, windy conditions. But once you actually transition onto the wing, you want to coarsen up that prop. 
And that really gives you all the advantages. It's in fixed wing because your, your, your VTOL portion is, you know, one, 2% of your whole mission. The, this sort of aircraft might do better with a, if you lose a, one of the motors and you need to do an emergency fixed wing landing, uh, that, a lot of quad planes struggle with that. Um, and because they, they fly very fast. Um, how would this do if you had a partially, if you partially tilt the wing, you, you deliberately cut off the matching motor on the other side. So you're on two motors. Uh, mm -hmm. I wonder how slow you could get it with a, with a partially tilted wing for a low energy, you know, emergency landing. Yeah, it's a good, um, uh, I guess, an interesting thought process. Um, in its optimal configuration, um, this has a, a, a much higher wing loading. And we don't have mm. to actually have any low speed devices. Um, so mm. really we want to load up that wing um, to maximize our fixed wing um, I would say fixed wing portion of our mission, depending upon what we're doing. And mm. really we're focused on, on getting fast. Um, a lot mm. of the hybrid quads, you know, they fly around at 60 knots, you know, we can get, you know, really flying with this guy, you know, well over hundred knots. And as we go to a higher aspect ratio wing, higher wing loading, um, you know, that makes, that really opens up that envelope. People want to get from point A to point B very quickly. Um, mm. So in this current configuration, this is more of a, um, you know, get somewhere, drop something off, take a photo that's 50 nautical miles away, as opposed to something that's going to take off and fly very low and very slow to take, you know, photos of a field. Um, so um, the configuration can be optimized from, you know, one side to the other. We could go and put a, you know, a large cord, low aspect ratio on this, on this aircraft and you know create a photography or surveying platform mm. um, but this uh, configuration really does um, distinguish itself from the competition um, when you can access those you know those faster speeds um, in relation to the belly landing um, that's going to be tricky um, I mean uh, the Paris 6 that you're seeing that generally likes to fly around, you know, higher than about 22 meters a second because uh, we don't have any low speed devices, you know, getting this thing slow enough to not, you know, come apart on the ground belly land, it would be kind of tricky. But you mentioned opening up the wings a little bit. And I've actually seen that um, in what you can actually visualize that in one of these videos here. Um, let me find it. This guy here, um, where the wings aren't completely closed into the um, fixed wing position. And what we're finding here is this is, um, this actually didn't have a payload. It was fairly lightly loaded. We were getting this down to about 11 meters a second um, mm. flying around quite comfortably. So yes, you know, if you don't care too much about efficient flight, you can crack the wings open a little bit and bring that stall speed lower. Mm. Um, you also mentioned about uh, turning off two of the motors um, in, in the future for a forward flight. Mm -hmm. Which two motors? Well, that's a good question. Um, so normally um, you'd want to be keeping your uh, inboard ones on, right? Because um, if the advent of a motor out, um, you know, technically there's, there's a possibility you could still fly on one if you had your, both your inboards active. Um, in our case here, um, when we're on the wing, we don't really want to be using the motors for active yaw. Um, you know, we're running all electric. We want to conserve the battery as much as possible. We'd rather the tail be doing all the work. So, I mean, they both have pros and cons, um, but um, yeah, I guess something to explore. Um, we don't have to comply to sort of the traditional rules of thumb in relation to, you know, motor out on two, you want to minimize that moment arm so you don't have to kick the rudder to stay flying. But at the same time, um, there might be some advantages. Um, I haven't really thought through it. Uh, uh, Tim, it's Paul. Can those wings be opened up asymmetrically? I mean, if you had a reduction of thrust on one side, um, at the moment, no, yeah. but it's a it's an interesting um, point. Um, if we were able to control them individually, you could you could do some pretty clever three D stuff. 
but, but the real question is how well does it fly upside down? <laughs> well, um, in the sim, it flies just fine. No, um, it's, um, we've definitely done a lot of interesting testing, um, you know, getting to this point, you know, there's definitely been some tumbling and, um, you know, I, I can't say we've done any fixed wing upside down flying, but um, the upset recovery is, um, you know, it's important. You're flying around at some mid transition state, something goes wrong. Your bailout is to go straight to VTOL. Um, everything's set up really nicely. Um, you know, you're talking two or three seconds, minimal loss of altitude. So um, well, as, we'll, we'll eventually it, start getting into those maneuvers. If you start doing variable pitch, then you can just land upside down too. <laughs> yeah, if we take off that uh, vertical stabilizer and just stick with the VTOL. All right, I think we're about out of time and uh, done with, with questions. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, it's a fantastic presentation. Really appreciate it. So oh, thanks uh, for the opportunity. Brilliant. Yeah, okay. not not a lot of, not a lot of technical detail, but that's coming. You know, we'll do some do some cool stuff with RG Pilot and um, sort of watch this space. Fantastic. Looking forward to it. All right. So next up, uh, we have uh, Bill Geyer and giving us a helicopter update. And uh, just hang on a second, Bill, while I switch over the recording. Okay. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you fine. All right. Right. So uh, we now have Bill Geyer giving us a helicopter update for RG Pilot. Over to you, Bill. Uh, I am the Trad Heli Maintainer. And um, so basically a little bit about me, uh, been a, a flight tester for rotor for air, for uh, helicopters uh, with the Navy for the last uh, 28 years, and uh, last 10 or so I've been teaching academics, uh, specifically helicopter stability and control. And basically, uh, as you can see, my passion uh, with with uh, the Trad Heli work has been mostly in trying to improve the uh, handling of the air aircraft, and uh, certainly. One of the big things lately has been this uh, auto tune, trying to get something workable for uh, helicopters. And please, if you have questions, uh, feel free to stop me uh, during the presentation. So I know that I did this last year, but I know a lot of folks uh, may not have as much <clears throat> um, experience with helicopters. And I thought uh, a brief uh, introduction to rotor dynamics is, is worthy. Uh, only because it helps with uh, understanding of what I'm going to be getting into in the rest of my talk. Uh, then I'll go into kind of some of the changes since last year, uh, kind of listed there, get into the current projects, which I show there, and then, uh, and then finally finish up with some of what we're planning for the next year. So to start into the rotor dynamics, we kind of have to talk about <clears throat> the degrees of freedom of the rotor system. And there are four and uh, kind of what each of them add to the control of the aircraft. Uh, so obviously the first is the rotation, axis of rotation or basically the rotational degree of freedom. And that's essentially just the, um, <clears throat> the rotor spinning around the shaft, right? Nothing big there to, to say. Uh, one thing is, is that uh, our model helicopters uh, rotate counterclock or rotate clockwise when viewed from above, whereas the uh, well, American-made helicopters rotor, uh, rotate counterclockwise full scale. So a little bit of difference there that kind of comes into play with single main rotor, tail rotor configurations because uh, of the thrusting tail rotor. Uh, next, we have the flapping degree of freedom. And that's basically this vertical motion of the blade uh, that could be either done through a hinge or the flexibility of the uh, blade itself or maybe even some flexibility of a, a yoke or something inside the hub that allows that uh, blade to flap up and down uh, out of the plane of rotation. And this provides for how, this is how the helicopter essentially, or the rotor imparts moments on the aircraft. <clears throat> now, and I can talk about kind of the two ways that, that that's gonna happen here in a few minutes. Um, but that's the main reason for the flapping is trying to create those moments uh, on the aircraft in the pitch and roll axis. The next is the lead lag degree of freedom. And that's this uh, fore aft uh, motion of the blade, what we call in the plane of rotation. The plane of rotation essentially is a perpendicular plane or a plane that's perpendicular to the shaft. 
right? And so this plane of rotation, it basically moves uh, in the plane of rotation forward and aft. Um, and really there's no, it doesn't serve any purpose other than to relieve stresses uh, because of the flapping motion, right? And the reason why we have, uh, we need this, it's a nuisance mode, but the reason we need it is that the uh, blade as it flaps up and down uh, changes the rotor's inertia, right? Moment of inertia. And so um, basically, or I should say the blade, blade, blade's inertia as it's spinning around in that shaft. So as it gets closer to that, that shaft, the inertia um, decreases and so the blade wants to spin faster. Uh, so it speeds up. Uh, and then as it, uh, as it goes back out to the plane of rotation, it slows down. It's basically kind of like the ice skater effect. You think about the ice skater, they put their arms out, they slow down. As they pull their arms in, uh, they speed up. And that's the same idea there. And that's um, essentially why we have lead lag. So you either have to you know, put a pin in there or, and let it uh, do that motion, or you can uh, restrain it, but you have to account for the fatigue and vibration that you might get from that. And lastly, we have the blade pitch or the uh, feathering. Uh, and basically, this is how the, uh, the pilot or the flight control system uh, controls that. Uh, the Use the blade pitch to either make collective blade pitch input. So all the blades either pitch up or pitch down at the same time at every point around the azimuth. Or you can make cyclic blade pitch inputs where uh, one uh, blade will change its uh, blade pitch in a cyclic motion uh, so that it, uh, you know, maybe it's going to create more um, longitudinal type uh, forces than lateral. Um, so basically that's the idea behind the cyclic blade pitch. And the, basically the, the idea for the swash blade is to provide the, that cyclic blade pitch motion. Uh, so a little bit more about, um, you know, our, our RC helicopters and, uh, and kind of this idea of a teetering rotor uh, head. And so you can see here at the bottom this, this axle pivot and the spindle that goes through that. Uh, for modern uh, full-scale helicopters, uh, they actually allow this axle pivot for a teetering rotor system. It's actually free. They can actually, um, the blade can actually uh, flap up and down like uh, 12 degrees or so. Um, whereas for most RC helicopters, they add this. They add this solid head, uh, this head dampener. Essentially, it's a piece of rubber or plastic or something that's put in there to restrain that blade motion, and it stiffens that that response uh, in the head, um, and so it changes the dynamics of the rotor. It makes the rotor much more stiff. Um, and then you can see that the most cases for our uh, scale helicopters, our lead lag is done through. Uh, the blade grip uh, and, and the pin that mounts the blades on there. It basically provides for that uh, lead lag degree of freedom. So let's talk a little bit about rotor phase lag because that has a big impact on the dynamics. And essentially rotor phase lag basically says that, um, you know, with the rotor spinning, um, if you make a cyclic input so that your max blade pitch, and let's say, call it an aft longitudinal cyclic input, so elevator input, um, so when we pitch the aircraft up, uh, you'll have your max blade pitch over on the left side of the, uh, of, of the rotor system, like on the left side of the aircraft, because you're spinning around in this direction and you want the response of the blade to flap up. And you would have the min blade pitch on the right side of the aircraft, and then you want the blade to flap down. And we say that the, the response is not going to happen until 90 degrees after uh, the max input is made or minimum input. So for a teetering rotor system that doesn't have any uh, type of stiffness in it, it's a free teetering rotor system, your J's basically get a, an aft tilt of the rotor system. And then that produces a moment, because it doesn't have any type of uh, connection moment-wise into the shaft, it's basically just tilting that tip path plane back. Uh, and our thrust vector, we say, is perpendicular to that tip path plane. And so that then just causes this moment about the CG uh, for the uh, for the pitch motion. Uh, and that's different from, uh, kind of pull this out, but that's different from the multi-copters, right? Because basically their assumption is, or basically the thrust is always perpendicular to the shaft uh, of the motor, uh, or basically the vertical axis of the, the aircraft. Whereas in our case, the, uh, the rotor in most cases can kind of change its tip path plane relative to the uh, body. And therefore you can change that thrust vector as well. 
And so when you add uh, a stiffer rotor system, add a little bit more stiffness in there with those dampeners, um, <clears throat> then you become more of this hingeless type rotor system. And now uh, because of that, we tend to see the rotor phase lag will decrease, will be less than 90 degrees. And so now our, our max blade in pitch inputs, if they're done at the left side of the aircraft, excuse me, and the minimum's done on the right side, uh, then it's gonna be something less than 90 degrees that you'll see that black max blade flapping. And so the tip path plane will actually not only tilt aft, but it'll tilt to the right. Uh, and so you see a lot of coupling that'll be involved in the rotor as well. Uh, in that case. And so with my one helicopter that I had, it was like 70 degrees uh, from uh, as far as the, uh, the phase lag. And so what they typically do is you could take and change your cyclic uh, or your swash plate and rotate it so that your max input's being made, you know, that 70 degrees prior to when you want that, that uh, uh, pure control output. For that. All right, so that's uh, like 10 minutes uh, introduction to rotor dynamics, not bad. Uh, so now we're going to go ahead and jump into the changes since last year. And you can see there we got uh, three that I'm going to highlight, uh, some with dual heli enhancements, uh, talk a little bit about the improved integrator handling uh, that we did, and then also talk about improved SIDL uh, rotor dynamics model that was kind of the preparation to get into auto tune. So um, dual heli, if those that aren't familiar, basically is this uh, motor mixer for the traditional helicopter, which allows uh, you to control um, tandem-like helicopters, so Chinook-like uh, helicopters, where the one rotor is in front of the other. Uh, and then it also allows you to control transverse or side-by-side -side configurations where uh, make me, I can say like a V-22 style where, um, but you know, minus the nacelle tilt. <clears throat> and so the, you know, the way they control the axis that those, uh, that those rotors are on. So the you know, tandem rotor, the, the uh, rotors are on the longitudinal axis. And so they're used to control pitch through this differential collective pitch. So one, the aft rotor system, if you want to tilt forward, the aft rotor system is going to increase its collective pitch. The forward to the rotor system will decrease its collective pitch and that'll cause a moment to pitch the aircraft uh, forward. And then likewise, uh, same idea for the side-by-side -side configuration. It, and that's how you control the roll axis. Uh, and then we have two others um, and I'll talk about the intermeshing, uh, but they're basically, they can use differential collective pitch in there as well. Um, but in any case, uh, so the big enhancement here is that Previously, when, uh, and this came about because of um, a user in Germany, he flies Chinooks, scale model Chinooks, and, uh, and so he was having difficulty you know, always finding it. They, you know, you have to trim all three of your swash plate servos uh, in order to make sure that you, to fine tune um, the, difference, the difference between the two if, in case you're getting some sort of uh, offset that causes some pitching moment. Uh, and he said it was just difficult. So uh, we put in a new, um, tr a, a new parameter that basically allows the user with one number to be able to, to scale the, uh, you know, the difference between the swash plates and, and trim out the, uh, the swash plates better. Uh, great uh, improvement here, enhancement was this, uh, was the adding of the intermeshing uh, configuration uh, really cool work done by Pitt. Um, he, uh, about two years ago, he started this and he wanted to make this intermeshing rotor system um, vehicle, which essentially is like the full scale, uh, if you've seen Command, K-Max uh, is an intermeshing rotor or the Husky. Um, those are full scale intermeshing rotor configurations. And essentially you have these two uh, shafts and the two rotors, uh, two bladed rotors, um, are at angled very close together, but they're angled such that, you know, the, the rotor system, one rotor can pass over top of the, sh the shaft of the other, and they're then synchronized so that they can um, intertwine like that or intermesh. And so uh, he went and actually, I think he pretty much designed and built this whole helicopter from scratch. So it was really impressive aside from the, the rotor systems but just the, all the mechanics and stuff he did himself, which was really impressive. And he then built the motor mixer 
that he needed to control it. Uh, and so thanks to him for you know, pushing that forward as a, as a uh, PR to master that we were able to then uh, get merged. Uh, and kind of the offshoot of that was the fact that I realized that with his work that he did here, we could use one of the parameters uh, that would let us then and now also control coaxial type uh, rotor systems. Uh, previously, coaxial rotor systems shown over here on the right, um, you know, they're done full scale, mainly with like what they call like a ganged uh, swash plate configuration. So the swash plates are interconnected and um, they're mechanically linked and mechanically uh, mixed. Uh, and we could still do something like that with our code, but um, you know, that, that's not what we wanted. We wanted the, the ability to control each of those swash plates independently. And so like with this helicopter here or this coaxial system here, you, know, you have the motors that's turning it, but you have two independent swash plates, one controlling each of the uh, rotor systems and that uh, this um, uh, coaxial, you know, the intermeshing through intermeshing motor mixer can allow us to do that. All right, so integrator handling. So, um, you know, the integrator is responsible for, for that long-term matching of the requested rate, right? Trying to keep them, you know, if you're requesting zero roll rate, you know, the integrator is gonna work uh, if there's some disturbance to, over the long-term to kind of help you maintain that zero uh, roll rate. <clears throat> and so prior to this change, uh, the, way that, the way that Trad Heli had done its uh, integrator was to, um, you know, reason we, we have difficulties with, the, with integrators because we're always rotors turning on the ground. And so the uh, users would have issues where, um, you know, too much I-term would build up and it would then basically drive the rotors into the dirt. Uh, so we had to find a way to um, limit the I-term while you're on the ground. And then when you get up, up and away, then allow it to build so that you can, you know, basically, um, oppose any type of forces that it develop and you want to, um, you know, to get your, the, the long-term rates where you need them. Um, in any case, uh, so what happened with the integrator is that it remained, uh, you, you first turned it on and allowed it to build when you started spooling up the rotor. And then um, it remained active until the uh, aircraft was disarmed. So not only until it, um, it uh, was, you know, motors interlock disabled, but but after you disarmed, and reason being was if you ever to, were to go and pull the motor interlock off, like turn off your motor in flight, which we do could do uh, for an auto rotation, you don't want to lose that sta stabilization, and that's why it was done that way. Um, and then one other thing is, is again, like I said, we wanted to limit the amount of uh, control on the ground, so we use this ILMI parameter, right, for less than five knots. And that was kind of the minimum leak is what we called it value. And so, you know, as the integrator would build up, if it went above this minimum value, it would be leaked off. And then when it went below it, uh, or if it, you know, it would just leak it down to that minimum value, it wouldn't leak it, let it get any larger. Um, so if you were sitting on the ground uh, on an angle, then it would, uh, it would just limit it and you wouldn't cause the rotor to be driven into the ground by the flight controller. But then greater than five meters per second, it, uh, it basically allows, allows it to go to IMAX value. <clears throat> so in 4.06, um, I uh, took and talked to Leonard a little bit and, uh, and learned off of him and basically kind of learned how to uh, invoke the multi uh, scheme. And so I uh, did that and you can now have H options. I did it as an option for our users because this new technique uh, relies heavily on the um, on the landing detector, and so we needed to really be able to trust the landing detector. And I've heard of instances where, for heli, because of the large vibrations in the ground, that sometimes the landing detector isn't always um, trustworthy. So I just wanted to make sure users had the option at first to uh, to try this out if they trusted their landing detector. So what this new, inter, what I call it an improved integrator scheme does is we, like I said, we leveraged off the multi-copter integrator handling. And um, it uses, uh, includes the use of that multi-copter hover throttle feature, which now I call hover collective for, for helis. 
And again, like I said, it requires the accurate landing detection. Uh, but I also added, I don't know if any heli guys out there realize that you know, when they landed, maybe in Reuter with the old system, right? You'd land and, um, and maybe you're on, a, on an incline or something and you'd see the rotor kind of all of a sudden just snap back uh, to, uh, to the kind of center itself. Um, that was actually the uh, eye gain being um, taken off and reset instantly to zero. And so, you know, that wasn't very kind to our helicopters. So um, I basically decided to put a decay in there since I was messing with it. Uh, and that smoothly resets the integrator. Uh, so here's kind of a show of how during takeoff, the integrator handles itself. And so uh, unlike the previously where we turned the integrator on when they started the rotors turning, uh, here the integrator stays uh, clamped at zero. Uh, until uh, it detects takeoff. And how does it detect takeoff? Well, it looks for when the uh, collective is raised above 50% uh, of the hover collective, and then it releases it. Now over here, you can kind of see that uh, it kind of got released a little early. This is an alt hold mode. And you have to remember that in alt hold mode, uh, it says it's not landed as soon as you get your, as soon as you start uh, requesting a climb rate. Uh, and so that's what happened here is it started requesting and it kind of released it, but then it clamped it uh, until it saw the hover collective was above 50% and then released it. You can see that gives a really nice uh, climb and you know the, the aircraft lifts off and matches the uh, requested uh, attitude very nicely. Uh, and then for landing, <clears throat> again, it requ uh, relies heavily on landing detection. And so hopefully you can see the blue line here because that's the integrator. Um, but basically, uh, you can see the red and green track together and then on touchdown, as the skid starts, one skid touches and then the aircraft starts to roll, um, you can see the ro it's rolling over to, you know, basically sit with both skids on the ground. And so you get this error in attitude and now the integrator starts to build. Uh, now, when the landing detector says, hey, I think we're landed and, and it invokes the land complete maybe flag, it freezes the integrator at that point, and then once it says, hey, yeah, I know I'm landed, and then it will then smoothly decreases that integrator value over a half a second, and then uh, resets it to zero. Hopefully, any questions on that? Any questions so far? All right. So, um, so the other uh, enhancement over the past year, I, uh, like I said, as, as I was getting ready for AutoTune and trying to, to develop the AutoTune, I uh, decided that I needed to have some sort of simulation that would be accurate enough to test the AutoTune uh, before I went into flight. And I realized quickly that um, <clears throat> real flight rotor dynamics are not modeled very accurately. Uh, so I had to go in and um, develop, uh, I was at work, I was doing this type of work anyway, developing a rotor model for a helicopter. And so learning off of that, I was able to um, go out and do the flight test uh, on my scale helicopter, my RC helicopter, and gather the data and, uh, and develop that model. Uh, right now, the model uh, is only uh, flapping dynamics, um, <clears throat> and that basically accounts for that coupling that you saw uh, for a stiff rotor system. You know, it ca captures both the on and off axis rotor dynamics. Um, the flap regressive is one of the two modes of the rotor that are mainly responsible for that feedback instability that you see. Typically when you increase your gains too high, you'll see the aircraft start to flop around or you know, oscillate pretty heavily. Uh, and that's typically when you're tickling that uh, flap regressive mode and, and destabilizing it, uh, you, you'll see that. Again, like I said, that um, it was developed from a 600 size heli that I uh, that I own. Um, it was I used it for both the single main rotor and uh, configurations, which are the conventional and the compound options uh, for SIDL. And uh, I fixed the rotor speed at 1500 RPM uh, for when it was in flight, uh, or you know that was the operational RPM. And then uh, it does a spool up and spool down as well. Um, I also modeled the rotor torque effects, fairly simplistic model there, and pretty simple model for the yaw dynamics as well. So, but this down here shows um, the uh, 
magnitude and phase for, uh, this is like a Bode plot. And we'll get a little bit more into this uh, in, in the talk here in a few minutes. But basically you can see uh, the dotted line is my model. The solid line is the, uh, the actual aircraft. And it matches fairly well. This is uh, 10 radians per second here, 20, 30, 40, 50 radians sec per seconds out here. So it matches fairly well up to four or five Hertz um, it, it, for this model, especially in pitch. Now you can see in roll, we start to lose, uh, it doesn't model this very well upwards at these higher frequencies. Well, what that is out there is that the lead lag regressive mode. That's a different uh, dynamic mode of the rotor. Um, so that lead lag motion of the rotor can be excited and, uh, and also become unstable. And at first I didn't model that, but then I found during my development auto tune that was, that was pretty um, important to model. And I had gone back and done that. But right now in SIDL, the master has this model here. <clears throat> and I plan to improve that model. Once Bill, I, uh, yes. Sorry to interrupt you, but it might be just worth telling people how you collected this data if they wanted to try and do, there's a lot of interest in people sort of characterizing aircraft similarly to the, what you've done here. Maybe it's just worth quickly telling people how you collected that data. Sure, sure. Um, so, uh, and this is a plug for, for Leonard as well, um, as far as the uh, using the um, frequency response, essentially the, the new mode, the SysID mode that, uh, that was developed. Um, basically, you can use that SysID mode and uh, do frequency sweeps, essentially oscillating the aircraft side to side or for, forward uh, in one of the axes uh, over uh, a range of frequencies that you're interested in learning the dynamics on. And so then you um, basically get the frequency sweeps, the re frequency responses, uh, and you have to decouple those responses. So there's a little bit more to it than what I'm saying here, but basically uh, when I originally got this data, I actually wrote my own frequency SysID uh, because I actually did it without having the, um, the feedback loops, the PID loops were all zero and, uh, and basically did it that way. And, and so basically you go and you grab, gather that data and you come back and you use your favorite, uh, you know, uh, FFT or your spectral analysis uh, uh, software. I use Cypher. Uh, you could use MATLAB. And basically you can develop a model of the helicopter um, based on those uh, frequency responses. And, and that's how you kind of go about that. But again, if you're, if you're going to use um, the SysID mode, you're going to have to, uh, you know, because you have some of those feedback loops, you're going to have to decouple um, the responses in order to develop a, a, a raw um, model for the for the aircraft, basically a bare aircraft model, which is what I had to do for this, right? I need it to bear a frame model. Questions hey, on Bill, that? Uh, hey, it's Matt. I just can ask a quick question about that. Yeah, go ahead. Um, um, coming from a position of complete ignorance with this um, the system ID stuff, um, what I was just wondering about um, when you're trying to capture the model damping, um, is it? <laughs> Are there limitations on the damping that you can capture with this methodology? Is it something whereby your damping, you know, has to be scaled in proportion to your mass and stiffness of your system, or can you get something a bit more clever in terms of the damping you're trying to capture? Well, um, it it kind of falls out from the from the frequency response uh, for the aircraft configuration. Um, so I did one for a multi-copter. And in the, when the class I took uh, on Cypher, basically I learned that uh, you know, the dynamics that it can't see. So what you learn quickly is that um, you know, because multi-copters pretty much have fairly low damping um, because they're effectively unstable, right? If you don't have any type of help uh, from a flight controller. Um, but basically when you go and do the, the, the frequency sweeps, uh, that kind of falls out of this methodology as to what you know you're gonna you're gonna set um, what you have to do is you have to when you ID it you have to set a structure for your model right you're gonna say well it's gonna have you know speed stability derivatives it's gonna have uh, damping derivatives it's gonna have control sensitivity derivatives and you kind of set the model based on what you know uh, is going to be in the aircraft uh, and then you kind of go through the process of uh, well, Cypher allows you to basically identify based on the frequency sweeps, what those uh, are the frequency responses 
you know, what the derivative should be, right? And in some cases it'll say, hey, uh, yeah, no, this is insensitive. Uh, it really, you don't have this, I don't, it doesn't see that response in the aircraft. And so it'll tell you that it's, it's insensitive uh, to that particular derivative. And so then you basically make the decision, if you believe that that's the true, and in my case, when I did the Y6, um, I found out that, yeah, multi-copters don't have uh, damping, and so basically, uh, or very low damping, and so you basically, you basically just remove it from the model and, um, and then continue with your uh, identification. Does that answer your question? Yeah, 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 no, that's great, thank you. Okay. All right. So that was the uh, Siddle helicopter uh, model. And like I said, I, I kind of went along and improved it as I went into the auto-tune work. Okay, so uh, on to my uh, current projects uh, and uh, two of them here. One is the improved rotor speed governor. About two years ago, uh, Chris Olson, one of my, who was my co-maintainer at the time, um, <clears throat> he uh, developed a uh, rotor speed governor, internal rotor speed governor for, for RG Pilot. And a huge success, um, really uh, advanced um, the RG Pilot for uh, combustion engine helicopters to have that internal rotor speed governor. Um, and he went on to uh, enhance that even more in a new uh, improved version uh, that we are getting ready to uh, push and merge to master. Um, so basically uh, what this does, the enhancements are is that it allows for this automatic spool up and governor engagement. And it actually you know, monitors the response of the rotor during the engagement, uh, the governor engagement, so that uh, if the motor kind of coughs a little bit, it's gonna you know, manage the throttle to then uh, help bring the, the engine up to speed if it can. Um, uh, he designed it to maintain rotor speed within two RPM with the appropriate settings. Um, it's got, a, got an automatic spool down that allows this um, cool down period for combustion engines, includes that. Uh, and then it also includes this rotor speed sensor fault detection logic. <clears throat> so if you have a, a, a high side governor failure or a low side governor failure, you can, uh, it'll basically fall back onto the, um, onto the thro throttle curve. Um, so, the design based on, uh, he had done it based on mechanical governors. It only uses a proportional controller based on rotor droop, um, and basically rotor speed error. And I, you know, I say the throttle curve is used somewhat for forward, feed forward input, but he says that it really isn't required. It can run without the, the, the throttle curve, but um, it's always a good thing to have that throttle curve in there. Because again, if you hit some sort of high side or low side uh, fault, um, you want that throttle curve there so you can basically be able to come home, even though your rotor speed might not be, you know, dead on, at least you're able to fly the aircraft home and land it. Uh, it does require RPM sensor, of course, uh, and this governor uh, has flown, at, he says, over 1,100 hours on, uh, air, on helicopters that he used in his business under a modified branch that he was working off of for RG Copter. Uh, so a big thanks to, to Chris for this contribution. Um, you know, again. It's going to help out um, you know, advancing our ability to support combustion engine aircraft and get ourselves to this automated uh, start up and shut down with, um, with RG Copter. So the spool up, um, I have shown it here just to give an example. This is from, um, I did this with uh, real flight. This is an actual real data. I used, um, I can't remember what helicopter type it is in real flight. Uh, but in any case, it had the, essentially a simulated combustion engine. Um, and uh, basically, you know, you enable motor interlock and that initiates the spool up. And so what the logic does is it basically increases uh, linearly the throttle along the, uh, the throttle curve until it gets to 50% rotor RPM. And then it engages the, um, the rotor governor, which then again, like I said, monitors the rotor response uh, and then uh, adjusts as necessary until it gets within uh, two RPM of the uh, desired rotor RPM. And then it goes into the governing phase uh, to maintain RPM. Uh, and then when you disable motor interlock, it initiates that spool down and cool down period. Uh, throttle is reduced to 1.5. So if you set the cool down to uh, some time, uh, it'll set to then and during that 
uh, th that's the parameter. And so uh, if you set it to some like 30 seconds or so, then it basically goes to 1.5 times the throttle output for idle. So uh, H uh, idle, uh, or H RSC idle is the parameter. And so basically it's 1.5 times that uh, for that specified cooldown period. The big thing to remember is that you want to set your, um, your spool up time or your rotor run up time long enough so that because it uses that rotor run up time to then uh, dictate uh, shutdown time. And so you wanna make that long enough so that when it goes to do the shutdown that it actually allows the rotor or allows the throttle and the, the engine to cool down before it goes to, to ground idle and then shuts down the aircraft if you're in an autonomous mode. Um, so that's the big uh, plug there. Uh, what I really wanna do with this is um, make it, when you have an RPM, make the uh, spool up and shut down uh, dependent on the rotor speed rather than the timers that we use right now uh, in the uh, rotor speed governor or the rotor speed controller. And so you can see that uh, spools down, you can see the idles of 1.5 times the, you know, the, the cool down period here, you can see, and then it finally goes down to, uh, to the idle output. <clears throat> All right, um, so on to auto-tune. Uh, pretty much in the last 10 months of my life, uh, weekends and nights working on auto-tune. Um, and uh, it's, you know, we know that helicopters are a little bit more difficult to tune. Uh, and why is that so? Uh, well, you know, they, if you look at the uh, plots over here, you know, we're talking, again, this is frequency domain type uh, look at the response of the aircraft. So on the x-axis, you have the frequency uh, in radians per second. On the y-axis here for the top plot, it's magnitude. So it's basically the output response, which is maybe it's pitch, pitch rate uh, over the input, which is the control input, or the, I call it the control output. But basically, it's the control that's applied to the, um, to the servo, uh, you know, and it's divided into the uh, pitch rate response, right? And uh, it's, instead of a ratio, it's actually displayed here as in dB, so it's just a conversion to a decibels. Um, but that's the top plot here. The bottom plot is phase. And effectively, you can think of it like the phase lag of the rotor system. It's not, but you can think of the phase lag of the rotor system. It's, it's the response, the output response relative to the input as far as the phase. And um, so, Kind of think of these both if you're looking at uh, how you're controlling an aircraft, right? And let's say you're making some pumping, pitching motions into the into your stick, right? And um, and you do it at a certain frequency. Uh, at lower frequencies, you'll notice that the aircraft will maintain the same amplitude that you're basically pumping the stick at, right? But then as you get increase your frequency, you'll see that the amplitude will start to actually uh, die off as you go to higher higher frequencies. And that's effectively what that's showing here is that that your, as you go to those higher frequencies, your amplitude ratio or your magnitude is going to die off your, your gain. Um, so now phase kind of describes this idea that as you're making these input, let's say you're, you're in stabilized, right? And so you're commanding attitude. So your stick directly relates to the attitude of the aircraft. Well, low frequencies, right? You're, it's going to basically match your, at the input of your of your stick, the attitude is going to match. But then as you get to higher frequencies, you know, you'll see that the aircraft will actually start to get out of phase with your hand and maybe even go to like um, being totally opposite to what your inputs are at higher frequencies. That's this, that's what this is describing down here. And so at these higher frequencies, you see that it's 180 degrees here. That would be when the, um, you know, at this frequency, you know, 10, 20, 25 radians per second, maybe four Hertz. Um, you know, it's going to be 180 degrees out of phase. You know, not that you could actually pump the stick that quickly, but your flight controller can, <clears throat> your autopilot. Um, so kind of the quick uh, frequency domain dis uh, discussion there. Uh, so why is it so difficult? Lightly damped rotor modes, right? We have this flap regressive mode that's sitting right here. In this, and then when you see this peak in the Bode plot here in the gain, that essentially is indicating a uh, lightly damped mode. And as this peak grows, that means that the mode's getting more unstable. Uh, and so that, this is your um, 
flap regressive, and then back out here, in the, and this is the roll response, this is your lead lag regressive, right? You can see that peak out here. And so we can actually excite that as well with our um, feedback loops. <clears throat> um, and you can see it also in the pitch axis, but it's at a much lower um, gain because um, pitch has higher inertia for our traditional helicopters. So we can't use enough rate P to, um, because we're gonna uh, destabilize the rotor, we can't get that rate P high enough to get a good response uh, to control the aircraft well. So helicopters rely on feed forward, right? We rely on that feed forward gain. And essentially that's just like a stick to swash plate. That's all it is. There's nothing being fed back. You're just putting a straight gain into the swash plate to then uh, command a rate. And so that's what that guy's doing. And so in the perfect world, right, we could fly a helicopter strictly on feed forward gain uh, if we had no disturbances uh, and it responded exactly accordingly to that, right? But, um, but of course, through, we have non-linearities non and we've got you know, um, disturbances. So we need to have somehow force that uh, rotor to respond or the aircraft to respond to that feed forward uh, request or to, to our request. So in most cases we try to use um, angle P uh, integrator to help um, keep the aircraft to maintain the attitude we request. So, you know, ask Leonard, we can talk uh, hours about, you know, what makes a good tune, right? What are we, what are we really looking for when we look uh, for a good tune? And, you know, it comes down to this, right? Um, actual attitudes match closely to your desired attitudes. Um, so how close? Well, that's a, that's a good question, right? One to two degrees maybe can be a really good uh, tune. Uh, I don't know, Leonard, with some of his, uh, his, uh, Racing quads probably can get it to a degree or so, but basically you want it to match very well uh, so that the, um, the controller has good uh, sense of where the aircraft is at. Uh, so the other thing is good disturbance rejection. Uh, what does that mean? Well, if it gets hit by a gust, you know, it's not gonna cause the aircraft to go off of the attitude very much. Um, if you're commanding uh, a response, Right, you don't want very much overshoot in the response. Um, so if you want to go to 20 degrees instantly, you want it to pretty much come up to 20 degrees and maybe overshoot a little bit, uh, maybe a degree or two, that would be okay. But uh, you want it to nail that 20 degrees as quick as possible. <clears throat> and then lastly, you know, that the response remains in phase with your desired response, that what you're requesting the aircraft is, is keeping up with you or keeping up with the controller request. And so those are the things we kind of want out of a good tune. Um, and so we can kind of see this in our, uh, in our Bode plots uh, and the way we see it like, so this is a manual tune of my Synergy helicopter. Uh, and this is, you know, Leonard and I worked on this uh, for a while and this is where we got it to as far as, uh, and we thought it was a, a good tune. Um, but you can see that there's still the, this kind of, you could see this lightly, you know, but the higher frequencies, you're going to see a significant amount of overshoot because of this. Um, the gain is so high here because um, this is added. This is basically comparing the output attitude to the to the desired attitude uh, over different frequencies. And so you can see that's uh, you know you got some some uh, response that you're going to have some overshoot at these higher frequencies. Um, and then you can see the phase dropping off. So it's not going to it may not stay in in tune you know in line with your requests as well. Uh, but that's what I have a good for. This is kind of my, I don't want to call it the uh, standard, but this is essentially kind of representative of a good tune for a helicopter uh, for the Bode plot. What you really want is that, right? You want this flat at zero dB, basically a one-to-one -one output to, based on input. You want this flat across the, the top here, and then you can, it rolls off, but you want this roll off to happen out as high a frequency as possible. As high as you can get it, you want that roll off out there. Um, and then the phase, you again, you want it to stay near zero degrees phase as far out as you can and then roll off. Um, and so that's would be, that's like, you know, where you want your tune to be. Um, <clears throat> but it sounded, uh, looking at my tune of my Synergy helicopter, it looked like that wasn't where we could get to with a helicopter tune. But uh, we'll come back to that. 
So the tuning approach here is that you want to go and identify your feed forward gain. And we're going to, I'll show you real quick or in a few minutes kind of where that is, what we do to do that. Um, and so you're basically uh, going to use a time domain test and you essentially um, put in a rate response or a rate request <clears throat> and then you see what the output is. And uh, we do this, we can do it with the PID, PID gains on, but effectively this is just a, what you're really trying to do is determine what that, uh, v, that feed forward gain should be to get the desired response to match the actual response or the actual response to match the desired response. Um, and so here's a little black magic, right? So we're, we wanna determine what the maximum rate P and maximum rate D gain is. You know, when we go out and tune our helicopters, one of the scariest things we do, or to even tune any vehicle, right? One of the scariest things you're doing, right? Most users would deem this as being scary uh, is to go and increase your rate P or your rate D gain until the aircraft starts oscillating, right? That can be a little, you know, unnerving for some folks. Um, and, but you don't have to do that. Um, you can go and use control theory and be able to you know, oscillate the aircraft at different frequencies, find uh, the frequency that causes a 180 phase um, between the input and output, and then be able to do uh, kind of close the loop analytically uh, and determine what these maximum rate P and rate D gains can be uh, through flight test. And so I'll show you in a minute about that. And then you can use that knowledge to then, you know, at least know where you don't want to go. Uh, and then kind of it's like, well, okay, what's, what's a good value, right? I've, I've found that a good, you know, starting value is like 25% of maximum allowable for, um, for the rate D gain. <clears throat> Uh, but really, I don't have um, a good, I haven't come up with a good process yet to kind of determine where is the optimum D gain or P, rate P, P or rate D gain. So, uh, so, and the other thing is, is, you know, you could excite other modes, right? Um, right now I'm looking for, you know, the frequency that's results in a phase of 180 degrees. Um, but I could have the, uh, I could excite the, uh, lead lag dynamics at higher frequency at like nine hertz where i might be looking at four hertz for this uh this uh, to go unstable so anyway uh, another frequency domain test that I, I i use and then lastly is angle p where we basically look at increasing um finding the increase the frequency until we find the maximum um maximum gain uh, and so that's going to be for the actual atti attitude divided by the desired attitude uh, and then increase the angle P term until your gain is mo no more than two, which results in about a six dB uh, change. So, you know, basically we're looking for this to be no higher than six dB, which is right here. Uh, and that's effectively what I'm, I'm, how I'm tuning that there. Questions so far? Uh Bill, it's, it's Paul. Yeah, Paul. Uh, we've got a, uh, a PR in progress at the moment that will looks like it's going to improve the limit cycle protection with tuning P and D on PIDs. So it um, doesn't take away the risk completely, but it makes it a, a less scary place to go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean... Yeah, that's, I mean, I, I remember seeing that type of uh, work that, um, that I guess Tridge was doing and he told me about it. And, and I don't know if Peter Hall was involved with that or not, but basically I did, uh, I did look at that a little bit and, and certainly, yeah, I, I see how, you know, it allows you to kind of creep up against those limits and certainly allows the users to go out there. Um, I guess I was looking, you know, I can through for the, my, for the auto tune feature here, we can at least do that test and be able to know where we don't want to go and yeah. then now it's a question of where where should we be right that's the bigger question so i'm really not looking to so now it's something more fine i'm looking for something more fine than limit cycle oscillation i'm looking for you know what gives you the best uh the best response but that's yeah that's a i've heard that it was coming down the pike and that's that's a cool feature to, to have uh all right um, so 
now with uh, the different tuning types, uh, the feed forward, like I said, is just a straight uh, time domain type test. And it especially in involves a single oscillation where you're rolling, in this case, um, using the roll axis, you roll left 20 degrees, you roll right 20 degrees, and you come back to wings level. And between the 20 degrees left to the 20 degrees right, you want to try, you want the aircraft to produce a 50 degrees per second roll rate. <clears throat> and so you look at the uh, roll rate it produced, and you take the control output of your, um, essentially it would be uh, R out from the motors library. And you are able to divide uh, the actual rate into that in radians per second, you can come up with your feed forward mean. And then what it does is it then goes through and uh, that calculation the first time it does it, and then um, it refines it. Uh, if it, you know, if it doesn't get it exactly when it tests that new gain, if it doesn't see that it matches exactly within 5%, then it'll increase or decrease um, the gain, feed forward gain until it, it matches within 5%. It's done in both directions and then uh, the gain is average. And so here's a plot of that, uh, of that tuning, uh, the feed forward, and you can see uh, this is showing the roll angle, and then this is showing the rates. And you can see as you're going from that left 20 degrees to the right 20 degrees, it comes up on uh, 50 degrees per second, and you're looking to see how well these match uh, there. And so that's how that's, that's done. So finding maximum gain, uh, again, <clears throat> we use this control theory uh, to then uh, look at open loop data, uh, where we're basically, if we look at this control law diagram here, real simple one, um, we have our input, we have aircraft dynamics, and we have the response. Now that's the open loop. That one line there is basically the open loop um, uh, control of the aircraft, right? And then we can close the loop by wrapping around the response and feeding it back into the input. And that'd be our closed loop system. Um, so the open loop, we just basically will control the aircraft and uh, you know, put in um, varying frequencies until we see the 180 degree phase frequency, and then we can then go through and analytically close this loop uh, based on that to then determine what our max gain would be that would give us 6 dB margin with, um, with the instability. Uh, and we can do that for both the rate P gain, which looks at the roll rate response to the uh, R out or P out, whatever that control output is to the motors class. And then we can also do rate D, where we're looking at roll acceleration to the, to the control output uh, and I do that by um, mathematically with the, uh, in the frequency domain, rather than just actually looking at straight roll acceleration. It's just too hard. So we just do a mathematical version of that based on the, in the frequency domain. So here's uh, our response. Um, here's, here's basically the input here uh, at uh, plus or minus 50 uh, degrees per second um, oscillation. And here's our response. Um, or I should say this, this is our input. It's not actually 50 degrees, but this is a VFF here. It's scaled um, or the, the control output, I'm sorry. It's the output scaled uh, from going to the motor, from the motors to the, the servo. Uh, and then here's our response output. Um, and you can see the difference in gain. So then you come over here and you can find kind of where you are. This is a four Hertz. So we come up here to 25 radians per second. And so we're kind of right here maybe this point right here. And so that's our gain uh, is the magnitude of these two, one divided by the other. And then the phase, you can see kind of here, the peak here for the input and then the peak there for the output. You can see it's probably near uh, 180 degrees. And so you kind of come down here and you go to 25. And sure enough, yeah, it's, it's a little less than 180 degrees there. <clears throat> um, and so basically uh, that's what we use uh, to then uh, determine those uh, maximum gains that you can you can drive the rotor at. Um, uh, I, actually, interesting enough, this is uh, the frequency sweep data uh, in the solid line, and this is my dwell data and the points. And you can see how well they do match uh, between the two. So the rate uh, P, rate D, angle P tuning, uh, still a little fuzzy right now, trying to really figure that out. Rate P and D is kind of the next one that I would do if I was going to do a full tune, uh, starting with the rate D probably. Uh, and basically you look at the, the frequency that results in the 180 degree phase lag 
uh, and then uh, we can start from the one where we determined for the maximum gain, but now that we added rate D, so we'll add like 25% rate D by the maximum gain rate D. And so then we go in there and since we added that rate D, uh, it actually shifts that 180 degree phase lag. It actually goes to the right. Uh, so we have to go fat and higher frequencies and find it again uh, and find that 100 degree, 80 degree phase lag and then uh, look at what the gain output is and then uh, kind of change the the and that's a res gain response response gain and then we can change the actual rate d again and see how that output response gain changes um, and kind of what's fuzzy right now is kind of like oh where do you stop right you're making inputs you kind of see the change and kind of what i'm thinking right now is that when it's you know you get the initial value and you say well if it, if it keeps on decreasing or stays the same gain value, then I'm gonna to continue to push rate D gain up. But once that starts to climb again, I'm gonna stop and call that my, my optimum, I'll call it rate D. And then you can do the same thing for rate P. And then in the angle P, um, we basically look at, uh, you know, increasing frequency, uh, looking at the maximum angle or the angle response to the angle request and seeing where we have the maximum gain, whatever frequency that is, and then increase the uh, angle P gain until uh, the response gain is uh, round two. Um, that's kind of my th current thought. So, so status, uh, <clears throat> we, um, I, like I said, a lot of work over the last year, uh, separated the auto-tune subclass, uh, made a generic tuning structure because it was all twitch, which was essentially for the multi-copters. I've uh, maintained the tuning flow, kind of the whole idea of waiting for level, testing, and then updating games uh, type idea. That's all stays the same. Uh, no, really no functional change for multi-copter. And I actually went back and tested that, went through a fairly ex um, extensive process to, to validate that. And uh, thanks to, uh, to Randy for helping me uh, kind of look through the code and making sure I, I didn't make any mistakes in, in doing the separation. Um, I uh, got added SIDL helidynamics to include the lead lag regressive. Um, I've uh, developed a required test type. So I've kind of fine tuned my feed forward test, uh, the dwell test for both rate and angle. Uh, that's that's uh, doing well and, and does a good job. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, the developing of the game tuning routines is kind of a, where they're still a work in progress. Um, so recently, um, oh yeah, and I added this this feature right that allows the the um, user to actually fly during the angle P test. What I found was during these dwells, since they took a little while, maybe 10, 15 seconds, um, the aircraft would kind of drift, and so I basically put in a feature that allows the user to come up on the controls within five degrees, as long as they're requesting less than a five degree angle change, um, they can come up on the controls and kind of help keep the drift of the aircraft pretty, pretty low and keep it in one spot um, while it's doing its dwell. Uh, and then, um, and so that, that worked out fairly well. Um, I did provide an initial alpha level version for users to start testing. Um, I only gave them the feed forward and angle P tuning uh, features and uh, it had some limited success. Uh, I, I, I think the big thing behind that test was basically to learn about other size helicopters and what their responses are going to look like. <clears throat> and so, you know, the feed forward test, I learned a lot off of that and kind of, I was, I was a little too aggressive. So I modified it to be a lot better. And then the angle P kind of gave me a first look at some other helis as, and to how they, they look um, in their response, uh, especially the smaller ones, which I don't have much experience with. Um, recently, I added a bit mask to allow kind of the ability to specify what tests uh, you want it to complete um, and the sequence. Uh, it, well, it keeps the same sequence. It just allows you to pick and choose which ones you want it to do during that sequence. Uh, so you can have it, if you, you know, know what your feed forward gain is, then you can basically take that out and let it continue on with the rest of the tests. Uh, and, and you can, again, cut out different things. Um, so I think it is for, at least for now, it provides a little bit of um, flexibility 
in looking at some things and testing. All right, so here's a video of uh, early on doing the, um, the feed forward test and the angle P test uh, and kind of give you a first look at what that's going to look like uh, in flight. So hopefully you guys can see this. You'll see it'll nose forward and kind of that nose back and then nose forward. And so I reposition the aircraft. There it goes again, goes back, goes forward. Now again, I've changed this so it does it uh, in both directions. This is early on when it only did it in one direction. So it found the feed forward, it was happy with it. And so now it starts going into this low frequency half hertz dwell, right? And so I'm using my stick to kind of keep the aircraft in one place. You'll see that I think I get distracted and it kind of floats off in one direction on me uh, and I end up having to bring it back. Nope, see, I, see, I paused it there because I'm moving it back. I kind of got it back into position. And so now I kind of have to let it start over again. And so for the angle P, it's kind of tough because it has to actually go through a fairly large range of frequencies to really look to see where that maximum gain is at, uh, what frequency, uh, and then it then increases the angle P gain value to, um, to then uh, tune it. Are there any questions? I mean, I, I kind of, this is going to go on for another minute or so. There it goes, getting a little faster. I got a quick question, Bill. So, um, yeah. you see, I take it, are you, um, are you actually changing any of the gains here or are you um, keeping your P gain the same and then and just oscillating at different frequencies to characterize yeah. it? Yeah, this is a great question. So this first uh, sequence of frequency, it's essentially going, doing a uh, spot frequency sweep, right? It's keeping the angle P the same for this whole entire sweeping of, of the frequencies. And then it finds that frequency that uh, it sees the maximum response at and goes back to that one and then starts in increasing um, the angle P gain for that, for that response or that this frequency. Is, yeah, this is very similar to what the system ID does as well. It runs through uh, a, a, a sweep of frequencies um, and so Bill's basically doing a little mini system ID here to, to pick his, to pick his uh, frequency he wants to operate at. Yeah, and so uh, plug to Andy Piper, right? If you wanna like do develop a spectral analysis that can happen behind the scenes, right? That would be awesome. On the controller, that way we can then use your, your uh, use the, um, is that that peak picker that you have? Basically, you, you're picking the peaks from the FFT. That would be really incredible. That I, like I could then, you could essentially do what Leonard's saying this this frequency sweep without having to stop at each frequency. Basically, just do a continuous sweep of the frequencies and then do the spectral analysis on board the aircraft, pick the peak, and then go back to that frequency and, and change your gain. And you can actually then, at that point, kind of get a full picture of where you might be seeing kind of another instability kind of rearing its ugly head at, at another frequency. So yeah, that was that was something that I, I think I talked to Tridge about that uh, briefly, but uh, it was it was kind of one of those things that have to be a separate thread and then it have to run. And I was like, oh. Awesome. Uh, because, because we actually do a chirp as a chirp, we may not need to do anything near that complicated to do that. Um, this is where, uh, um, uh, yeah, I, um, Paul is probably um, best place to sort of talk about that, but uh, we're already in the frequent, well, I don't know how to, how to say that correctly, but uh, because we're doing a, a chirp, we can probably do a, a constant readout of magnitude versus, um, uh, versus frequency because we know our instantaneous excitation is just you, moving. So, you need to do a slow chirp for that method to work because with the second order system and a lot of damped mode, it takes a few cycles for the amplitude to build. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you'd have to slow the chirp rate down. 
Yeah, and that and that's why uh, you see it, it oscillates for about ten cycles because I'm letting the the it uh, it only really takes about two cycles for that to to uh, die out uh, or to hit steady state. But then I need I'm kind of averaging those last five to then um, get a good read of of gain and, and phase. Yeah, so you might need to do your chirp over like we do it over. Well, most of mine when I do it, I do it over two minutes. But I'm not sure. It depends on the frequency range whether that would be enough for for your particular application. Yeah, I guess if I could target a um, target a low, smaller range of frequencies, right? If I could target more a smaller range, then I could maybe you know be able to uh, do that more quickly. This is good. I, I mean, what I'm doing here is I'm kind of for the maximum gain where it finds that 180 degree phase point and that frequency, it then goes and tracks that, that 180 degree phase. So it kind of works pretty slick that it actually can then moves with the 180 degree phase frequency um, that it then keeps it there while it's still checking to make sure to see if we're seeing any type of rise in, um, in the gain to see the first instability. So that kind of works. It's just the, the thing that is getting me right now is that I could have other frequencies like the lead lag regressive, how I can check to make sure I'm not, you know, exciting that. So. All right, if there's other questions or, talk, or discussion, I can kind of finish up here. Um, so uh, yeah, future auto-tune trying to finish that. I um, certainly have gotten a long way. Uh, I don't know that I'll have the time that I need to dedicate. Uh, I hope to, it, it's certainly not gonna make it into 4.1, um, but hopefully I'll have something uh, ready by the time we're getting to release 4.2. Um, so, but it, it's coming along and I think we're, we're getting there. Um, <clears throat> based on what I learned here, I'd like to, you know, obviously improve the tuning, manual tuning instructions to help out there. Uh, then look at, uh, Another big thing is kind of getting this reliably reliable, fully autonomous flights from startup to shutdown. You know, it gets to a point where helis can basically you invoke auto from uh, maybe armed with the aircraft, uh, you know, motors interlock disabled and let it spool up by itself, do the takeoff, go do its mission, come back and sh and then shut down after it lands. So, uh, and. So Matt Keir had been helping us for autonomous auto rotation. I don't know. I'm going to put Matt on the spot and see if he if he's still awake. Uh, yeah, I'm here. He has an update on that. Um, yeah. So I mean, a bit of an apologies there. Like it's um, been pretty stale the past year. Um, where we're at, at the moment is essentially I got as far as I could in real flight um, and wanted to start getting out re doing some real testing. So spent some time. I've uh, got a much bigger test frame. Thank you to the uh, RG pilot uh, community. And um, but then obviously uh, I just couldn't get out because of uh, being in lockdowns all the time. So um, that's definitely on the um, uh, the, the, the plan for this year is to kind of get out and start doing some real world testing and uh, um, seeing how, how well real life compares to the sim. <laughs> yeah, that's always fun. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, no, that's great. Uh, I did have another user uh, who uh, is in Italy and he has, uh, I'm not sure, maybe I'm speaking out of turn, but he's actually done some, uh, he's been doing some full autos to touchdown. So I'm interested to see kind of the methods he's using. He is using RG Pilot. So um, I'm hoping to kind of drag him in to see if he can uh, to help us along. So maybe we can um, work That would be really cool. Yeah. Yep. Bill, I had a, just something I thought of looking at the, the chirp method. I noticed on um, one uh, user that I, I helped with their trad heli setup that to get around the rotor vibration, they'd end up quite softly mounting their autopilot. And I was looking at that setup thinking they probably had a, a roll mode or a, on their mounting system that was probably getting down towards the order of about 15 hertz. And yeah. that. I mean, what's the impact of that on 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 the roll on the roll chain? I guess it it would just show up like a like a regressive mode, and it would take it into account if they ended up with the oscillation well, in the system. Yeah, I've uh, I've changed my 
changed my tune. I know I've changed my thoughts on uh, on how we handle vibrations. I've actually I'm really the since the ad, you know since the whole harmonic notch came about, um, I've worked hard to you know basically pull most of the vibration out through the harmonic notch, basically going on the one per per rev the end blade per rev and the two end blade per rev frequencies and that pretty much pulls out a lot of the noise out of the control signal um, and so then you're just left with the the um, the feedback instability modes that you might be exciting um, so yeah I, I do go with a more firm mounted um, uh, controller um, so as to kind of keep the the looseness of that mount from interacting. I mean, the big thing is trying, I mean, controlling vibrations is kind of one of the huge things and trying to maintain, uh, find a good spot on the heli where you're going to get uh, low vibrations, either do the frame or um, you know, the mounting. Um, yeah, and also making sure that the four, six degrees of freedom on that isolation mount don't coincide with a, a rotor fundamental right you don't want it yeah. yeah 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 exactly yeah and i mean if it if it does well the rotor yeah if it's a, a rotor regressive mode or feedback stability mode um yeah that would not be good because we don't have enough um don't have the ability to notch as many modes as we want i mean we still have that other static notch which which could be used but yeah definitely have to keep it from from being excited exciting that uh the um mount So yeah, and, and I guess my last point there is just to clean up the trad hilly specific files and improve code efficiency. So kind of a long-term goal there. So that's pretty much all I got. Um, and if there's any other questions, I'd be happy to, to answer or discussion. That was absolutely fantastic. Thanks, Bill. It's really great to see the progress on the auto-tune. I think a, a lot of heli users are going to be um, so pleased to be able to get the, the tune right with less risk to the aircraft and a better result. Uh, that's brilliant. Thank you. Thank so you. Um, any final questions before we, we move on? Yeah, Bill, um, awesome work, man. I know it's, a, it's a huge marathon to, to work <laughs> through an auto-tune. Like yeah. people... Um, People try and do auto tuning of pid loops um, a lot, and uh, yeah. I think you've I, I think you've so like helis in particular, like multi rotors are uh, incredibly simple and as a con, uh, control um, as as far as a control problem goes compared to the helis, and I think you've done a pretty good job of sort of showing the ele the the level of um, uh work and understanding that needs to go in to break a problem like this down and actually make it easier it, like easy for a novice that has no understanding of controls to do a quick auto tune and have an aircraft that's flying well um yeah. so yeah thanks a lot for all all the hard work from everybody i'm sure yeah thank you for your uh for your help as well and, and guide me along different roads often the wrong one no no so especially the, the knowledge of the, the the knowledge of the the control loops is it's definitely helped a lot because of, and then how each of the gains impacts the response it's uh definitely your understanding is it's definitely very you know you're the expert so it's great all right thank you very much bill uh right. so i'll just switch over the recording Great, all ready. So uh, now we have the talk we've all been waiting for, uh, the final twist in the S-curves. Um, so uh, Leonard talked about S-curves last year and it's now merged into master, which is absolutely fantastic. So over to you, Leonard. Okay, now I've just got to make sure I, I uh, halfway through Bill's talk, I kicked my, uh, kicked my network link out and had this mad panic that I, I wouldn't have it up again and running before the before my talk. But hopefully I can uh, get all this um, running and sharing screens. So I've just got to get the controller. All right, now, how do I do this? Uh, where do, where's my... 
There we go. Screen two, there we go. So is that all coming up? Does everybody see that? Yep, looks good. All right. So I, I uh, I've been I've been waiting for this talk too. To be honest, I'm re very glad to be giving um, the last uh, Esker talk. <laughs> my my wife in the background is appearing and disappearing. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, the uh, the um, uh, sorry, that was a bit of a trick. So uh, all right. So the um, uh, this is, I think, actually going to be my third S-curve S talk um, and a little bit of a controller update and what we're sort of trying to do here. Um, it's uh, been a little bit of a long road with a lot, lots of twists and turns and dead ends. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, um, yeah, thank you very much for Randy who really like, it's one thing to get something like this to a proof of concept um it's another thing completely to then get it up to a level where uh it, it deserves to be um in master and that's where randy peter like th that's where the whole team comes together to to turn really a, a pretty a pretty rough around the edges proof of concept into something that that's actually uh workable at, at at the at, at the expectations yeah. of master so um all right so uh before we get into that though i want to talk a little bit about 4.1 and um i i think uh with the with the talks that have been coming up i think everybody's got a really good understanding of what uh the significance the of the um fft work we, we've known that it was going to be a an important tool um in in control in the multi-rotor control of noise management that sort of stuff for a long time and and um Tridge and i have been talking about it for years it's been um shown to be really effective in beta flight um as as well and um yeah it's uh, been great work by andy bringing that in it's had awesome uh, impact on helis as well um i i suspect uh a plane will will uh, take you make use of it as well for um dampening out or getting rid of uh like the engine noise and that sort of stuff into the control loop so it's especially with the with the um more flexible um fft based approach um to allow us to hook onto things that aren't as predictable so yeah there's been great work there um uh, pit objects, the the slew rate limit based on um, uh, base gain shaping. Um, um, uh, this uh, was work done by Paul and brought in through Plane, um, and it's one of the first uh, sort of uh, uh, well, one of the immediate adva uh, advantages um, that uh, we've seen as we've as Plane started using the multi rotor pit loops as. That was one of the first things that Tridge wanted to bring in. And at, at, at that point, I was pretty much uh, uh, unaware of it. Um, and it's, uh, I, I have a, it, it's going to be a nice little safety net for a lot of people. And I'm hoping, um, I'm looking forward to experimenting with using it to manage things like ground resonance and that sort of stuff. I, I hope that we can we can use it to offset some some problems like that but at very least it'll um, provide a nice safety net for a lot of aircraft and a lot of people during tuning um, it may also provide a trap for people during tuning when they're looking for oscillation doing a manual tune and not finding it um, we might get a few uh, few examples of people with 10 times their gains and asking you know why their aircraft flies funny but um so uh the other the other big things part of the s curve stuff we've done a lot of the uh, the uh, position control uh, loops are being brought up to speed with um, the uh, attitude control uh, loops um, the attitude control sort of um, 
I, I feel is a pretty good representation of where we want to go with our control and our control methodology. I think it's sort of well proven and, it, and it's, I think it's got all of the parts and I'll perhaps talk about that a little bit more in a, in a minute and um, we'll, uh, I would like to see that, that maturity um, move through the position controller and I think we're, we're about to sort of take that step with 4.1. I'm hoping to sort of get just before 4.1 starts rolling out that run through the, the position control uh, uh, library and just clean up a lot of that sort of stuff and um, you know bring it up to a to a cleaner um, a cleaner implementation. Um, part of this has been uh, we've sort of we've developed a lot of um, tools that we use throughout the systems as as all this is sort of consolidated over the years and and uh, um, so there's been a lot of sort of code reuse. And so we're sort of, uh, one of the other things we did is we sort of moved all, a lot of that to a control toolbox um, so that we, we don't have this code being repeated anywhere um, and that we can get it right once and generically um, to, to, that captures the full range of, um, uh, uh, full, full, full range of uh, particular tools, usage cases, all in one thing with all the right checks, um, as opposed to sort of having different areas, use it slightly differently, but not need all the checks, but then maybe you get the next step in the evolution of that, that does start you needing these other checks, but you forget to add it into that spot. So, so that's been nice to, and, and given me a lot of confidence working with the code that we have, um, that we're able to sort of do that properly. And I'm not going to get bitten um, by my own, my own ineptitude there somewhere. Um, so, uh, Attitude controller, um, uh, there's a bunch of changes still still yet to go in. We've been sort of waiting for the S curves to go in. And I think there's gonna be a little influx of changes and, and stuff that now go in that's been waiting for the S curves to get in there. Um, but uh, support for larger lean angles. Um, currently the attitude controller really assumes that you are you know, hovering, your, your thrust vector is mostly vertical. Um, and uh, we, there are a few things that sort of limit our ability to go past that, but there are um, aircraft around, um, like multi-rotor aircraft around that do benefit from being able to go significantly past 45 degrees and 60 degrees and can quite happily uh, cruise uh, at um, 80 degrees or 75, 80 degrees lean angle. Um, going quite quickly. Um, that brings in a whole heap of uh, little issues with thrust boost and how that feeds back. Um, and so there's a few little enhancements there. Um, the other big one, and I'll talk about that near the end of the end of the talk, is the thrust vector control input into the attitude controller. Um, one of the, one of my, uh, each, each cycle, um, I find I, I develop an understanding in a different area and, and the, the key, um, my key understanding improvement over this last cycle of development has really been the importance of paths as opposed to, you know, <laughs> the, the journey as, as opposed to the destination. Um, the, like, you know, that's sort of epitomized in ESCOs, of course, but, um, it's also uh, becoming, um, it's become very obvious to me that um, the paths that we take within the attitude controller um, uh, are, are, are especially important as well when we're talking about um, optimal control, especially when you're talking axes that, that have um, uh, dissimilar um, response rates and things like that. Um, I, I, I was quite surprised when I developed the attitude controller, the Quaternion attitude controller in the first place, what, how it didn't feel right to fly when I 
when I did it as a quaternion control, it felt bad. It felt uh, it was not doing what it should do. Um, it was ending up at precisely the, what I told it to do. Um, however, the path it was taking to get there was wrong. And that's why if you have a look at the attitude controller, there's a quaternion input. And then there are, there's Euler, the specific Euler input. It's not, it's not just a conversion from Euler angles to quaternions and then passing in a quaternion command. Um, and that was specifically so that the paths taken by the aircraft um, following the pilot's sticks um, were the correct paths and what the pilot was expecting um, to, to see. And this uh, thrust vector control, um, that's really that same, um, that same uh, problem. But now we, we, we actually are, it's what the position controller expects to see um, as opposed to the pilot. So, so far we've been using what the pilot, the paths that the pilot wants for the position controller. And that's, that's not what we, that's not the optimal approach. It's also, of course, got some added benefits uh, with the sixth off um, or greater degrees of freedom vehicles that we're starting, that, that it's another step along the way of setting the code up for vehicles like that to be able to um, Re like handle what they need in the way they in what's optimum for them, as opposed to um, uh, sort of hacking around multi rotor to get what they need. And and a lot of that, a lot of the big advancements in heli last year was trying to better support um, that frame type and the and the unique requirements. Or they're not unique. They're actually they're not unique. They're just more pronounced. Um, of the, that frame type within the multi-rotor system and, and um, you know, both the state machine and the controllers. Um, and a lot of what we're doing here is really sort of accounting, trying to account for things that are not with not multi-rotor specific or that, that aren't significant for multi-rotors and we can afford to ignore that other frames can't. So um, position controller updates. Um, uh, full pit object for 2D velocities, um, uh, improved logging, um, uh, feed forward parameter, which uh, again, it gets quite significant. Now, um, when we actually enabled fast logging for the attitude controller, as, as I was um, doing the Quaternion um, controller, it, it blew out logs, made logs really big. Um, uh, if you had that uh, fast attitude logging enabled, but um, it's been one of those really enabling um, uh, changes that we've made that's allowed us the 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 uh, insight into what's happening behind the scenes to to uh, that's then spurred on a lot of the following changes. Knowing you've got a problem is the first step to. Um, fixing a problem. And, and a lot of this, these logging um, things help us um, target specify, characterize problems so that, that we can then sort of start brain, brainstorming what those actual solutions might be. Um, so the uh, upgrade to old total vertical controller, that's actually one of the currently, um, one of the oldest controllers in the code and um, therefore one of the ones that's most in need of an overhaul and a cleanup. Um, that's, uh, uh, for some reason, Paul Riseborough is drawing on my page. Um, so <laughs> I don't know how that happened. Um, so uh, uh, that's uh, that's getting a, a cleanup. There's a few little hard coded, um, things in there that aren't um, ideal um, that will that that limit our ability to uh, tune some aspects of that controller um, and so uh, part of the uh, the s curve work is to um, clean that up and to really make that um, uh, to, to remove any um, naively in naive uh, controller aspects um, and, and 
open it up so that so that it's uh, people can get the most out of their aircraft in, in that particular axis of tuning. Um, and I've just, uh, Paul, thank you very much for helping me out with this. It's, um, I, I've, uh, one of my problems is I don't have a very strong background in, in formal control theory. So, so variable names and, and knowing what things are called are a little bit of a problem, but model, model reference control methodology is, is the formal name of what we're, what we're doing. And I, I've um, sort of always called it this feed forward approach where we, where we know what we wanna do, we know what the position is, the velocity is, the acceleration is, if everything goes well, and we feed those into the various levels of the controller, um, and then we let the PID that, sit, that we're feeding that into, in between each PID, um, deal with the errors, deal with the unknowns, deal with the disturbances. Um, and so our attitude controller has been um, a model reference control uh, methodology for, you know, for quite a while now, for, I don't know, six years or something like that. Um, but we're now bringing that into the position controller. Loiter has been, um, the last uh, version of Loiter is, is very much it, like is, is that um, approach to, to control. Um, and that's how we get simultaneously a really fast response from our inputs uh, while still having um, uh, a, a multi multi level like position velocity acceleration controller if you just do it um just pass in a position you've got to wait for a position error to build up before you get a velocity command and then then the velocity command has to wait for an error to build up there before you get an acceleration command and so you you are um your response is limited by how long it takes for that position change to feed through all this and you get a very soft response around um around those small position changes however if you use um if you know what position you're changing what velocity you're doing it at and therefore what acceleration you're changing that velocity at up and down then you're able to actually directly feed in um close to the actuators and you get a very fast response all the way through the PID loops, but the PID loops stay almost zero. All the errors stay almost zero the whole time. Um, and so it, it gives us the best of both worlds. And S-curves um, moves the navigation controller uh, into that same, it uses that same methodology, whereas the navigation controller as previously was done um, uh, based on on this position on this by feeding in that target position movement and what we refer to as the leash which is the difference in our target position to where our aircraft actually is that results in that velocity command and and we do we did a whole bunch of tricks and stuff to make that work really nicely um, and even going back over it now if we we did a good job of dealing with all the quirks of that um, of that controller and making it work well. Um, so S curve navigation. Um, so uh, S curves. Uh, it's a straight way. We use the S curves uh, S curve formulation for straight waypoint navigation. Um, now we did over the last couple of years. Of last year in particular, I focused on one of the attempts to do spline um, navigation um, using S-curves, using multiple S-curves connected and laid over each other in particular ways to create an approximation of a spline. Um, and, and they all worked sufficiently well to make me think that um, they might be good enough, um, but Randy's really picky and um, he wasn't happy with any of them. So we ended up um, going back and rightly so, um, but I'll blame Randy. Um, but we end, so we've ended up going back and uh, with the splines we've used, we haven't, um, we, we've uh, used the position and velocity of the spline and then we have left the acceleration. We're not um, feeding in the, the target acceleration because splines are inherently discontinuous in acceleration. So by um, feeding in the target 
position and velocity of the spline and leaving the acceleration as an error term, um, it allows some flex in the controller to absorb those discontinuities. Um, and uh, uh, then we've just, then we've linked those up with um, S curves with the straight segment S curves during the, the crossover and and it and it's working quite well. Um, there are a number of things that we could do to do this a little bit better, um, but the solution we've got at the moment is working working quite well and um, it, it ensures that our our splines are what people want them to be fast, long curves, um, joining straight segments and, and uh, allows you to do long sweeping curves around things as opposed to uh, corners in straight segments. Um, so yeah, the tricopter, Josh, I haven't forgotten about the tricopter. I'm, I'm going to get that in there. So, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure there'll be a few little SMSs somewhere going, what about the tricopter? But uh, that will, we'll get, we'll get the, those mixer updates of the tricopter in there as well. So some of the things I hope to sort of squeeze in um, uh, to 4.1, now takeoff, improved takeoff. Now this is something that may not make it, but it's, uh, I, I have a, um, a pretty clear plan for it. Um, it might have to wait for 4.1, I'm oh, sorry, 4.2. Uh, and it's also something I need to work closely with Bill with to ensure that it's going to be appropriate for helicopters as well. Um, but we would like to move to a, um, throttle a, 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 um, a, a time constant a, or a throttle up time. And so as a pilot, when you're taking off, what you do is you, you start from a low throttle position and you progress your throttle forwards until you see takeoff ta um, occur and then you start controlling your attitude from that moment. At the moment, what we do with the attitude controller is we say, take off and the attitude controller goes and um, builds up eye terms until the aircraft takes off. Um, but what that means is that your takeoff time and the, and, and the response of the aircraft to that takeoff um, can vary, especially with different payloads, um, which when it comes to eye term buildups and you know, if you've got a big payload and a slow eye term buildup, you can be down there in ground effect where you're flying, but um, your legs are grabbing on grass or sand or dirt, like, and, and you're, you're at risk of, um, uh, of digging a leg in and flipping the aircraft over. Um, whereas a, a, a more repeatable takeoff um, uh, transition allows for a better detection of takeoff a uh, more reliable, um, like a more guaranteed takeoff and, and, and separation from the ground. Um, and it uh, ensure, it, it dramatically reduces the risk of these, of when we engage certain aspects of the controller um, uh, to, to ensure that we, uh, that we don't, don't get a position error in causing a large rollover with a big I turn build up that, that just, destroys an aircraft um, and and I'm sure we've all sort of had that rollover on takeoff at some point or another. Um, landing landing is a completely different problem but but this would hopefully uh, this will hopefully uh, enable us better control fidelity over that over that quarter of a second transition. Um, and when we when we how quickly how well we detect a takeoff and and um, uh, and uh, handle different loads and, and different, um, especially aircraft that are changing their their uh, their payload and weights. When we're, we're seeing a lot of payload carrying aircraft come into, you know, using RG Pilot now. Um, now the other area is guided mode navigation. This will um, certainly get into 4.1, but I. Um, where we need to update guided mode to take advantage of the dynamic S-curve um, path generation. Um, I want to support the acceleration input in the guided mode in that process as part of that, part of that um, process. 
I want to update the entire um, guided mode functionality. There's a few aspects of it that we don't support um, and we can support that really well now. So I just want to sort of get that in there and just bring guided mode up because that's another aspect that um, a lot of users are starting to come to RG Pilot for is to is that uh, companion computer, you know, being able to drive this thing around with a companion computer and do some really clever things um, in guided mode where they want to, they, they don't want to deal with the auto, you know, doing the whole autopilot, but they would be, um, they want to work at the level of um, building paths um, and, and control, but without that complexity. So um, the, the real time, uh, the S curve kinematic path generation has been awesome for that. Um, and, and I've used it uh, in the ship operations mode that I built uh, and it really is a pleasure to use and, and simplifies a whole lot of stuff. So, um, and uh, yeah, then there's perhaps a few other options in there to allow a bit more flexibility in guided mode and how it's used. All right. Um, Looking, looking forward to um, 4.1, a big part of the, the next development cycle is going to be looking back um, and evaluating S-curves and, and how people are using it, the problems people are having um, and uh, uh, addressing those issues. Whenever we have um, the Quaternion Attitude Controller is a great example for me of, a, uh, of an effective um, uh, implementation in that I, I don't know if I heard anything about the Quaternion when we when we did the Quaternion attitude controller. It wasn't that people said, oh, it, we love it, we love it. It was nobody said anything because nobody noticed it because there were no problems with it. And I'm hoping that S-curve is mostly like that, that um, we, it's not that the S curves, uh, the S curve navigation um, provides us this amazing new capability. It's just that it removes all, a whole heap of things that people irritated, got irritated by. And so people just stop talking about navigation because it does what it's supposed to do. Um, so fingers crossed that's, uh, that, we, that nobody notices S curves. That's 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 my hope. Is that once we get to full release, nobody notices S curves. We get the occasional. Oh, it's great. It doesn't do this anymore. But other than that, it's silent. Um, fingers crossed. Um, the other the other aspect that um, and it sort of goes into the SI units um, is uh, uh, I. I'm always a bit embarrassed when I read the attitude control code um, and um, it feels very, uh, 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 it, it feels very, um, uh, yeah, juvenile, uh, yeah. Uh, and, and a lot of it's because I, uh, I, because I don't have a deep control background, um, in, in like for a formal control background, um, a lot of the terms that we use for um, describing um, uh, the controller or variables within the controller uh, are not um, the formal terms. We've tried to collect them, but it would be really nice to, to get um, a, uh, a formal set of um, uh, uh, frame names uh, and variable names. It's a little bit difficult because there aren't very many, uh, when, when you look in um, uh, around the internet and try and look for these terms, most of these things are describing very simple control systems. Um, and, and uh, so, so the, those um, we, those layers aren't well aren't actually even a part of, of those simple control systems, and so it'd be nice to to um, 
you know, with electromagnetics, I, I have an IEEE convention of all the different names and of the different types of uh, measurements and, and how they go together. And, and it was wonderful when I did my PhD because I could have this thing and I could call everything exactly what it was supposed to be called. And I knew and I felt confident that somebody could read my thesis and they would understand what I was saying because I was using the correct terms in the correct place. And it would be really nice if we could, um, you know, and this is where Paul, um, Bill, and, you know, people with, with uh, more formal control backgrounds might be able to really help us um, uh, ensure that those, those controllers are written such a way that, a, that an academic can come in and look at that code and follow it because, because the terms in there are already familiar to them. Um, and I think it will, would help us a lot as we become, uh, you know, there are more and more people doing that. And this, I think this would really help um, the credibility of our project like I think the algorithms are awesome. I just I just think we could present them a bit better, and that's my fault. That's um, uh, that's that's my my um, a, a shortcoming that's specific to me. Um, so Randy does a great job helping me get uh, my comments. Like I just miss comments, but Randy does a great job helping getting those um, names to something that makes sense. Because for me, when I'm doing it, it's it's my sketch pad. And then, and then at the end of it, we try and go through and we change the variable names in the comments to something that make make more sense. So, um, please open. I, I might even open up an issue that uh, that helps us sort of come up with a list of standard terms that are industry standard, as opposed to RG pilot, RG copter standard, or more, or even worse, Leonard standard. Um, so. Uh, other other things, um, future improvements. Now, uh, Bill talked about um, smooth integrator-based variable variable resets. This is something that um, uh, you know, multi-rotor has a multi-rotor is is a is a beautiful, simple um, aircraft, and it's and it's been a wonderful thing to to develop. It's allowed us to rush forwards and develop what I what I believe a very advanced and and um, you know, elegant control uh, methodologies and more complex aircraft like every other vehicle type almost is is more complex than multi-rotor to control um, and uh, so a, a lot of things like the smooth integrator that multi-rotors can get away with it because we've already shut down the motors anyway but um, uh, I would like uh, we we want to support these sorts of things under the uh, so that the other vehicles that don't have those um, uh, that, that that are less tolerant to simplistic um, state switches can um, uh, can elegantly transition um, between states themselves. We did a hell of a lot of that with the spool states when we when we tried to support heli in that first round where we're doing spool up and spool down and we, we explicitly added those states into multi-rotor even though multi-rotor doesn't really need them to try and um, to, to ensure that heli could transition through those those states effectively and and uh, multi-rotor benefited dramatically from those things as well, um, just in, just in its in its presentation of 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 spooling up and spooling down. Uh, we could get away without it, but everything works that much better with it. Um, so so multi-rotor directly benefits from all benefits from all these things as well. Um, there's a number of little uh, control. Um, uh, terms that we're, we're evaluating putting in. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a sec. Um, and, and a lot of this comes out of work that Bill is doing um, and, and work that like these, these creative frame types where they do have additional elements that um, at more advanced control techniques can, can assist with. Now, this is also where things like system ID feed into providing um, a, a method to getting the information to actually characterize and make those changes sensibly. Um, 
but it also requires a higher level of commitment to the analysis and development of the of the model of that aircraft uh, or that system control model so you actually understand what you need it's it's not something that um uh, we can we can apply our normal trial and error simplistic tuning to um but as we're getting more and more uh uh industrial applications where people are willing to put that effort in um or, or or the peter halls of the world that are willing to put that effort in um to to uh where where, where we should be uh, where we need to provide tools to for to cater to the, those um applications and those needs um so yeah um there's going to be we're seeing um planes starting to use our pits now so there's going to be um you know uh, just like the other frames i suspect there'll be a number of things we need to do to further facilitate this overlap um with with plane um i suspect we might eventually we, we may need to extend that to some of this input shaping or command model um structure so that plane can roll and pitch you know so so that they start because i suspect they'll start using that as well so there might be some additional stuff we need to do to start separating those tools out to make it more accessible for other other vehicles to use um si units love to convert si units um i said at the beginning i'll say at the end <laughs> i think i think a lot of people would love to love to see us convert over to proper si units um, and, and the next thing is um, working out what we need to do next, uh, working out where our next weakest link is, um, working out what, um, what that next focus and capability is that enables uh, more users, enables more applications. Um, for the last year or two, it's really been the navigation, cleaning that up um, for, for Copter. Now, I'm not sure what the next bit will be. Um, so uh, navigation controllers. So this is our this is our attitude controller now. Um, we've got one little cross over here and this little delay that Bill and I have been talking about. Um, not sure if it'll go in yet. We need to we need to ensure that that it's justifiable before we go in. That's why you'll sort of see it sitting here. Um, nothing nothing goes in unless we are confident that it's worth the variable, um, that it's worth the 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 space. Hey Leonard, this is Bill. Do you want to explain kind of the idea behind the delay term and why we're considering it? Yeah, so the delay term accounts for, um, and this is this is where um, uh, again Paul Paul's really useful in these conversations as well. Um, but basically the uh, the observation, and, and this is something that goes back to a conversation. Um, uh, I, I never re remember his name under under pressure, but um, I, we had this conversation when we were way back early when in the attitude controller development where, with this delay. Um, the the when you when you command a target um, uh, a, a, an attitude change, there's a delay before you see it. There's a delay in in your ability to actually. Um, uh realize that change in attitude and so you you'll see that our target position and our position no matter how well we tune things up there's always this delay there and what that means is the attitude controller is chasing the um uh the target attitude all the time so you tend to over speed you you have a correction in rate to actually close that error and then you get to so they close up and and you look everything looks good then you stop but there's a delay in the stop as well and you get this overshoot now the way we generally handle that at the moment is that your you ensure that your angle p is such that um you know nothing nothing bad happens and you get this little overshoot and that sort of thing um but there's uh, that if we if we account for that delay, we can potentially um, remove 
that effect from the controllers. Um, and it's very observable with the high rate logging. Um, and it's something that we can potentially just look at and set. Um, you know, a lot of this stuff is not your, you know, your casual uh, hobby setup is not going to even bother with that. So it's sort of it's set to default or a uh, conservatively no, low number, because if you set it too large, you, you definitely risk making bad things happen. Um, so, so that's one of the things, and we, we especially noticed that in Heli. Uh, a lot of this stuff comes from looking at, um, at, at Heli being such a dramatically more complex control problem than, than Copter. Uh, Copter tends to be quite quite quick, but it's still there. Um, so, so until we actually work out how to cleanly implement it within the control structure and then test it thoroughly, there, there's going to be a little red cross on that one. But it's one of the things that we are considering. Um, so the big the big changes here um, is the dmod uh, variable that that's the uh, the plain contribution uh, of uh, backing off the PD terms um, if we see uh, large rates of change um, that, uh, uh, that that tend to happen when we get oscillation. Um, in there, this is the, the feed forward, uh, which is critical for heli and plane um, usage. Any flat, uh, you know, aerodynamic surface, pretty much the aerodynamic surface actuators, um, even rotating aerodynamic, where, where the surface itself is actuated, as opposed to, um, you know, uh, really force vectors. Um, so this is the, the this fast loop, this inner loop. Now, the, one of the things that's not in here. Um, so this is, uh, at the moment, we don't need the, in, the slew limiting on the input. Um, this filter has, the, the T filter has been uh, hugely useful in, in uh, multigrade control because the EKF um, and therefore the output of the attitude controller um, is not filtered effectively. It's, it's got an integrator on it, but the EKF has absolutely minimum filtering on it. So this helps, uh, you know, we, as we're getting all the other noise sorted out with a dynamic harmonic notch and things like that, we're actually finding a lot of the noise was coming in through the target. And so this has been really useful for that. Um, the, the, uh, the, the idea of this slew is if we start needing to run this loop much faster than the attitude loop. Um, and that's for, for a lot of the stuff that Andy's sort of doing with the little little three inch quads, any of these real tiny quads that starts to become an attractive option for uh, maximizing the use of our processor um, where we need it, not recalculating the entire attitude solution um, at 4,000 Hertz, uh, we can just do the the rate loop um, and this is where this slew limit comes in um, bill and i have also been looking at um, an additional feed forward detail now this is almost uh like you know this is starting to be sort of very sort of model you know model control like in that we set up the feed forward and the feed forward term based on the um uh, the the aircraft the aircraft's uh, response. So here we know that if we have a, um, a rate of 10 degrees per second, we need a 10% actuator output. So we set feed forward to one, right? Um, you know, don't worry about the, the, the scaling on those units, but you get the idea. But there's also potentially a benefit for accounting for the rate of change of that and um, the, the acceleration of that. And, and we may be able to characterize that quite accurately for a lot of vehicles. And therefore this feed forward D um, and, uh, and, and perhaps just a repeating of the D term filter may be very useful as well. Now, again, this is for higher level control, more effort required in setting up vehicles, but it's also with the benefit of being able to achieve better control potentially. Um, and then there's a couple of additional limits um, on the outputs of these things uh, that can be useful for some aircraft, um, especially aircraft that can experience actuator stall um, if things deviate too far. 
Um, and so you, you, it might, you might be able to quickly access, say, 25% um, of your actuator range, um, but you really do not want your PD terms um, getting a large input and flicking from 10% to 90% because you'll get instant actuator stall. Whereas if your I term builds up through that range and, and, and your PD term still only operating over say 10, 20, 10% uh, 20 of that range, you don't see that actuator stall. Um, and there are a number of different types of actuators and situations from propellers going into reverse, um, you know, stall there. The, the, suffice to say, there are a lot of different aircraft we're dealing with and, and um, some aircraft would benefit from ensuring that they could uh, limit the instantaneous range over which their PD components could, could operate. But again, until we can justify it, they, they don't go in. Um, now, just uh, the other thing that's not in here that um, has also uh, been sitting in the back of my mind, I, I, I got this graph off of some presentation on the internet um that i saw recently and this this is uh this um may be a, a good reason to actually put a um a uh, a fixed notch into the fast rate controllers that operates down in the control bandwidth to allow people, but there, you know, there's also a potentially a lead lag filter that we might need to be able to turn on to really get the most out of it. And this is where a lot of the work, you know, you know, uh, Paul's deeper understanding of, of control and, and models, um, model based control, uh, that which is exactly what Bill's doing with his with his heli and the complexity of heli control. Um, if people want to build an industrial quality aircraft, there may be a few extra tools like this that we may want to want to include in that fast loop pit object um, to allow people that are willing to invest, you know, a person's to a, a, a small team of people's time into actually generating these models to to um, uh, to, to use these things. But again, as we as we show that they are truly worth the variable names and the um, and the code, uh, then we'll sort of add those in. But um, yeah, Bill's talk was really good. Uh, I felt for sort of showing, you know, clearly demonstrating the the complexity of the problems that people are trying to deal with, um, and and. Uh, the, the usefulness of having the mathematical tools in the control loops to be able to deal with them. Um, so the trick is understanding what we need and yeah. All right, S-curve implementation. So instead of what we want to do, um, you know, it's not aspirational anymore. It's what we've actually done. Um, balloons and party poppers. So the um, navigation control requirements. Um, a little bit of background on S-curves. I've done this twice already, so I'll skip through it pretty quick. I've deleted a few, few um, slides here. So we want um, to have nice straight segments with smooth and efficient um, kinematic paths. So nice smooth speed control. We want to get up to a maximum speed. We want to actually maintain that if it's possible. Um, we want to go around corners nicely. And I've got a little presentation to sort of show you what we do want to do and what we don't want to do. Um, uh, we, we want to be able to define, we want to control over those corner geometries. Um, you know, helis would love to be able to maintain a coordinated turn um, through those corners, um, even, even with straight uh, segment waypoints. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, we don't want, we, we want to get rid of the twitch hunt. Um, you know, we, with our initial controller, we, we did a really good job with that, I felt. And I was really proud of that. Um, and, you know, we went from people complaining about not being able to navigate and go to anywhere to, oh, when it goes past this waypoint, it's got a little twitch. And why does it do that? It looks ugly and it disturbs my little sensor or whatever. And so 
we, we want everything to be ultra smooth. Um, and one of the real advantages of S curves, um, you'll see in a minute, is, is, is the minimalistic control inputs it uses to go around a, um, go around a given trajectory. So this is a single axis. This is a straight line standard S curves, which um, uh, relies on this is this is what you see in your lift. Um, this is your standard first pass implementation of S curves, um, and the jerk. So so uh, when we start off with with a position, we have position. When we're controlling position, we're in position. We move our position with velocity. We change our velocity up and down with acceleration we change our acceleration up and down with a jerk. And so it goes position, velocity, acceleration, jerk. And then we go further again with snap, crackle, pop. But at the moment, we, we, really, um, uh, we really care about everything down to jerk specifically because um, uh, the acceleration is proportional to our lean, is, is related to our lean angle. Um, our jerk is related to our rate of change of uh, lean angle um, or, or our, uh, our rates, our, our, our attitude rates. And the snap is actually related to um, how quickly we ramp up the motors. So it, it's nice if we could actually maintain sort of nice smooth curves all the way down to snap. Now, the problem is when you look at the standard S curves, it doesn't do that. You can see, you know, this ramps up and down, it's sort of continuous curves, but here at Jerk, we've got step responses, which are, with, and basically for a multi-rotor, this means that you're going to get changes in our throttle response. Uh, it's gonna, as it tries to instantaneously achieve a rotation rate, which means it's going to fall behind there which means that uh, we're not going to achieve the acceleration we expect, which means we are behind the curve straight away. And we, you know, then you're sort of chasing errors and you're, and you're working, you're exercising your pit loops. So the whole idea of this control methodology is that we want to minimize the excitation of our pit loops as much as possible. And it has some nice little benefits to the, we're actually also spreading out the frequency excitation um, uh, across the, uh, uh, yeah, we're, we're less likely to excite oscillations and resonances in our frames. Uh, swung payloads are less likely to get, get, um, get excited and things like that if we're able to do this. It's, there's a few really nice little benefits to it. So we, we actually um, formulate uh, a, uh, a, a, a we don't use we don't use a rectangular function here. Um, we actually use a, a, a another identity that will remain nameless because I understand there is a bet on how many times <laughs> I'll get that wrong. You've taken them all out. <laughs> I know this one. So um, this unknown formulation. Uh, <laughs> can be seen here down at the jounce or um, snap, jounce, snap, interchangeable. Um, and uh, we're, because, because this is now smooth, we actually see this S shaped here at the beginning of the jerk function rather than the step response. Um, and uh, so here you can see this, this is effectively how quickly your motors need to ramp up to start the, um, the, the change of acceleration. Um, so th this is effectively your, your motor, um, uh, or your, your, this is your, your rate of change here. And this is how quickly you have to accelerate your rate of change of your attitude. So you can see here, we don't have, this would be an infinite little spike um, if this was a square response. So here we've got the position, how the position, you can see the position sort of moving forwards and, and increasing as we speed up. We can see our acceleration has started at zero and increase up to a nice constant velocity here. Um, acceleration is, has curved up and this is also our lean angle, reached its, its our maximum acceleration. And then as we approach our, the, the, our target velocity, it, it uh, nicely curves back down to zero. 
and you know so on down down the road and so this is this is uh, equivalent to your lean angle which is then your attitude rate which is then your attitude acceleration so um, you can sort of see how this follows on now this is all a single axis so this is one straight line now when we do a corner we actually um, we're actually combining two of these axes. Now, one of the simple things to think about at the corner is just let's just make it a circle, um, you know, to change it in and out. The problem with that is the magnitude of the acceleration instantaneously changes as you go from a straight segment to a circle. You've got a particular centri centri centrifugal acceleration. Um, people laughing at my pronunciation, that's probably somebody's point somewhere. Um, then, uh, and so you get this uh, instantaneous spike in jerk uh, as, uh, as we uh, go through that um, change of acceleration. Um, now, this, this, is, this is the twitch hunt. This is what we want to avoid. So what, we've, what we found is that by using two S-curve um, two S-curve geometries that we saw before, you know, position, velocity, acceleration, jerk, um, and overlapping them in time, we're able to achieve some really nice corner properties that, that, that are very predictable. And we can do things like predict the maximum turn rate. We can, um, at all points through the curve, we know exactly what a heading should be. So we, we can actually, it allows us to do coordinated turns. It gives us really nice, um, it's like a motorbike going through a corner. We, we can, um, depending on the corner and the entry speed, the exit speed the, and how tight the corner is, we do really nice braking maneuvers. We turn into the corner, we turn out of the corner and we accelerate out of the corner. Um, and depending on, on the radius of the corner, you know, which is basically your, your uh, waypoint radius, defines uh, whether or not we need to break into, a, into that corner or not. And it, it all beautifully falls out of this, um, this formulation. Um, so this, this is sort of a, a, an example of one of those corners where the um, green vector is sort of the braking and acceleration in the direction of travel. And the, the um, cyan line, the light blue line is the, is the corner um, uh, the corner forces. So you've sort of got the braking forces and acceleration forces and the corner forces or the centrifugal forces. Um, and you can see that that green line, it doesn't jump. It stretches out behind as it breaks and then stretches forwards as it accelerates. And the turning uh, force gradually grows to a maximum, holds it as it goes around the corner and then, then um, retracts back smoothly into the, um, into the aircraft as you head off on that straight line. And that blue vector is, is the magnitude of the velocity. And you can see the velocity drops down and reaches a minimum at the apex of the corner and then grows as we, as we exit the corner. And this is, um, this is what I was sort of referring to with very minimalistic attitude control inputs to, to navigate a corner, which, which uh, excites um, payloads and it excites problems the least and exercises our position control, like the PID loops in our position control of the least. So um, this is a, uh, get my, I uh, think this is an example of the uh, current controllers, 4.0 controllers and the 4.1 controllers on the right. So, so this on the left is 4.0, this is 4.1. So, We'll uh, take off here and basically it's exactly the same mission. We're running at 15 meters a second and um, we are uh, 2.5 uh, meters per second. Everything freeze or just Leonard? I think it might be just Leonard. I uh, seem yeah, to be okay Leonard. here. 
So I suspect Leonard's had a internet outage. Uh, the key thing is whether he's actually aware of it. Um, I think I'll just give him a, a call on his mobile. Yeah, he was on a roll. Yep. He's still online, so it might just be a mic. I'll just call him. You just occupy yourselves for a sec and I will bring my computer up again and uh, yeah. No worries at all. We'll, we'll find new ways to tease you while you're, you're off uh, <laughs> fixing up your computer. Yeah. Thank you very Talk much. to you soon. Bye. Will do. All right. Hopefully you all got that. So Leonard's computer crashed. That could have been a much more colorful phone call. I'm glad it wasn't. <laughs> could have been, yes. It was kind of the perfect answer. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, I'm sure he'll be back soon. We're slightly over time, but I don't think that matters at all. Um, so, uh, We've got our next two speakers. We've got um, uh, Michael, and then we've got um, the, with Mission Planner. Then we've got uh, Lindy Liang from CUAV are doing a CUAV vendor presentation. Um, so it doesn't matter if we run over a few minutes. I'll just uh, open it up to YouTube questions. So if anything comes in, I'll pass them on. Sure. I'm surprised actually we haven't had more network issues with the, the conference being online and of course it, it wasn't a network issue this time it was a computer crashing but uh, I'll have to now of course you know convince uh, Leonard to switch across to Linux you know we'd never crash of course I don't think I've got much hope of that that's just silly <laughs> well I hear there's more Linux computers than humans on Mars Right. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. uh, oy, oy, oy. There's, there's also more aircraft than humans. <laughs> yes. No, they had a slight glitch. Ah, there. Are, is that Leonard coming back? It, it's it's Does me it coming back. There you go. So I've swapped my, to my laptop, so I apologize. Um, my, my audio won't be better, but uh, it might take a little bit longer to get my other computer up. So I'll, I'm almost done with the talk, so we'll, we'll, we'll soldier on this way. But um, no worries. Okay. Could I uh, get my screen sharing? Ah, uh, yes. Hang on. I need to add you in here. Uh, I can't see you connected. You change your name. Your oh, there you are. Yes. Okay. You should now be able to screen share. Okay. So, all right. Another another couple of minutes, and we would have got it done. But oh well. So let's uh, get that screen share going. All right, let's get rid of that. All right then. So here we go again. So we we got our S curves run. So we were, I think this is about where I left you last time. Yep, and we'll get up to the first corner here. So you can see by the time we get to this first corner, we'll go just through this per first corner, and I'll and I'll pause. You can see that our, our old uh, method is uh, just a little bit out in front, um, but it's also cut the corner significantly more. Now, this is because um, 
in the old version, uh, we didn't respect or account for waypoint radius if we uh, were doing fast waypoints. And what that would mean is that the uh, we would tend to blow past, um, you know, we, we could, we, we had a, uh, that how closely, the corner geometry was dependent on the your navigation parameters. Um, in particular, your acceleration versus your maximum speed, because the um, uh, the the aircraft in the old version is basically being pulled around the course with a rubber band. So if that rubber band's very long and you hit a, a ninety degree corner, you get you you pull you cut that corner a lot because the rubber band's already a long way down the next leg before you get to the corner, and so you, it pulls you across the corner. Um, a, a lot more. Now, uh, the S curve implementation, we we explicitly define the geometry of our corners, um, and we we choose that so that the, um, we will slow down so that we just skim that waypoint radius on the way past. So, um, moving on. Now we so at the moment uh, the old uh, approach is in front. Now the the um, old approach, when it hit these um, tight corners, we will pause here again. Um, it came to a to a complete stop and then accelerated back down the new leg. Um, uh, as soon as as soon as you go part like go to a tighter than ninety degree corner, um, you uh, you you in order to actually uh, uh, go through that point, you you have to flip back on yourself. And because your accelerations are going back the way you came, um, uh, unless you're actually doing a, a full corner geometry like the S-curves does, the easiest thing to do is to come to a complete stop and then head back out the way, uh, uh, out the new vector. And so there was some little, tricky little stuff to detect that and, and help us come to that complete stop and, and go back the other way. And some strange looking maths that sort of solved um, some of these problems that uh, is, is very unintuitive unless you sort of work through it. Um, okay, so going on. So now you can see because the new S curves have actually went around that corner nicely, we're out in front. And here the uh, new S curves are running um, around uh, these curves quite quickly, minimum distance to the corner and, and getting out in front again, whereas the old uh, thing is doing this whole braking, stopping, acceleration thing. Um, Okay, so now we get to the fast corner here. Now, again, um, it's a nice open corner and you can see here, let that run a little bit more. Uh, you can see see here that the uh, where the, the um, old approach is fast trying to catch up, but and as we've seen so far, it's cheating and cutting corners to do it. And again, um, the S curves, uh, it's slowed down and used a corner radius that kept us to the tangent of that um, maximum waypoint radius um, specification. In this case, it's five meters. I wanted, I wanted a nice fast run around, um, around this course um, that would somewhat, uh, uh, that, that would go around this course in a similar speed to the, uh, to the existing approach. So we keep on moving here. We're getting down to another another tight corner, which will help S curves get out in front again. And um, now we're coming up to a nice straight segment here. Now you'll see here one more little step. We're we're coming to an intricate little set of waypoints here, where we've got um, three waypoints in a straight line, not too far apart from each other, and then we've got this little um, back and forth, um, this little square, uh, this little square section there. Um, and so we've got this tight little intricate set of waypoints that we want to navigate around. Um, and we've got, uh, and we've got two closely spaced waypoints in a line. Now, this is one of those, one of those things that, um, uh, we might get 
uh, some users complain and go, oh, why is it slowing down for, for, for when I've got just these waypoints in a straight line? Now, this is one of the um, few little spots in s curves that um, we, uh, we may have to, pardon me, have to deal with some complaints. Um, now, the general approach of s curves is if you've got a, a segment, the most, the maximum speed it will travel between um, uh, two uh, waypoints is the speed it can get uh, it can get to and slow down to uh, to zero again in that segment. Um, and in this case, uh, you know, that's obviously significantly slower than the 15 meters per second um, maximum. And, and in fact, this whole, this whole uh, course here, we never get up to a full 15 meters per second. So you'll see here that the S curves slow down um, to uh, about three meters per second, but you can see that the uh, the old system here has now completely caught up to the S curve approach and is barreling along at 13 and a half meters per second, so full 10 meters per second faster than the S curve implementation, and that's because of this uh, a number of weight, short waypoint segments one after the other. So now we'll, we're going to go into this intricate little, little thing. And if you have a look at what our original does with this leash, it just completely botches it. It, um, it comes into effectively this tight um, corner section here, the close to the 90 degrees, because that, that, um, that uh, leash has sort of um, uh, immediately just swung through these tight little course at uh, 15 meters, or well, 13 meters a second. Um, and the rubber band is tightening up in this corner. And because it's a tight angle, um, the rubber band goes all the way to, to zero length. And then we're going to start off down that vector. So basically we've completely missed those first two corners and come to a stop at the third corner. Um, and the S curves on the right goes through, slows down, and then again, uh, it's going slower. So the corners are tighter because these waypoints are closer together um, and is, is progressing around there, you know, following the path and staying on the path and slowing down as needed to follow the path that you're specified. The uh, original approach on the left is now hitting the little spine um, radius turn at the end. Um, now you'll see that it's actually started this turn very early. And this is a really good, a really clear indication of the length of that rubber band that's um, pulling the old approach around, the length of that leash. You can see that, um, that the aircraft is actually pointing halfway around the spline right now. And that's because that's where the, uh, it's probably actually a little bit past that actually, but that's where the point on the, the attachment point of that rubber band is. And so um, because it's going so fast with a lower acceleration, that, that rubber band's quite long and it's, it's already um, halfway around at least that, uh, that spline section and the aircraft's just uh, getting pulled in that direction. So it's coming off of that track early um, uh, well, much earlier than what you would expect. So let's see how that progresses on the left there. And so again, you can see that that uh, has completely missed that, um, that spline curve at the end, while the S curve is still working its way around that intricate little back, uh, you know, that intricate little left-right um, set of waypoints there at the maximum speed that it can um, while obeying all of the rules that we've set. So we'll let, just let this play out now and we'll see how the S-curves handle this um, run at the end. So you're going around the curve and you can see that the S-curves actually stay right on it. Now, the other little interesting effect is, see how at the end there, we didn't follow it as accurately as we have up until now. And this is because uh, it's quite a tight um, turn at the end and we're not using that feed forward into the acceleration on that spline. So um, the, 
uh, we've got some uh, velocity and position error there due to the fact that we're not following that, that the acceleration is purely defined by the velocity error as opposed to um, uh, a full kinematic um, specification of that path all the way down to acceleration like the SCARES does throughout the rest of this um, mission. So there we can let this all play out now as we come down. You can see that uh, the um, old approach on the left has again cut that corner pretty badly to come before it came to a stop um, and started landing. And uh, the S curves comes around as a nice little corner at the end. Overshoots a little, little, little bit of position error there, but this is just the standard SIDL approach with uh, poor churning. So you expect a few position errors here and there. Um, and then we start landing there. So, so that's a good summary of the strengths of the S curve as, and, and the problems that um, we are solving with the S curves. Um, the other thing that's worth keeping, um, keeping in mind is the entire time, uh, the old approach, the actual target position was way out in front of the aircraft. And then we sort of had to just, you know, we were effectively along the ride for where we were at any instant in time. Whereas the S-curve approach, we defined the exact position, velocity and acceleration of that aircraft all the way around that path gives us a lot more, a, a lot more options in how we deal with various problems um, uh, and, and, and just the level of control we have to define the, the, the precise state of the vehicle at any moment through, through a mission. So the final thing is the thrust vector and um, heading uh, problem. Now the, uh, our current uh, approach uh, is Euler angles. Um, now, uh, this is a Euler angle is three or ordered rotations. We we yaw, we pitch, and then we roll. And and by putting putting those uh, those three rotations, we define our final attitude. Now, this has a few nasty little side effects when we're actually defining the path between points. In that. Um, we actually use the yaw axis, which is significantly slower on a multi-rotor, less so on a heli. Um, in fact, it may even be faster in a heli. Um, but it means that the attitude controller is trying to use yaw to change its, um, its, attitude, its thrust vector. Now, um, if you lose your control, uh, you're, you are constantly dealing with this your error. Now, we, we deal with that a little bit um, by uh, generating our roll and pitch angles based on our current your heading, as opposed to um, our target your heading. And we actually did have it as a target your heading for a while. And that that goes some, goes some extent to, to fixing the problem, but it still doesn't address the path. And so we have this non-optimal path. So when we're doing a dynamic change in our thrust vector, the path of that thrust vector um, creates um, uh, thrust vector errors, which causes a deviation from our desired track. Um, and of course, you know, uh, propeller, if we've actually lost propeller, lost your control on a hex, for example, um, it makes, uh, it, it has very significant impacts in the quality of our navigation. We can still do it, but we tend to approach a toilet bowling like um, trajectory, like when you've got a small magnetometer error, um, as opposed to big enough to get full to put toilet bowling, but you get that that deviation in, in, in a track. It doesn't go in the direction it's supposed to. Um, there's also, when you're starting to deal with large uh, lean angles, um, you start to get uh, your, your roll and your start to become poorly defined and controlled um, because they become, they effectively are getting amplified um, by, by the Euler, um, you know, as the Euler angles approach, say negative 80 degrees pitch, any slight errors in your creates a significant change in in the role and and you you know in the end you get to gimbal lock and you know basically nasty stuff happens if you start if you take away that small angle um sort of approximation we're past the small angle approximation but i'm, I'm sure you know what i mean now 
the thrust vector plus heading um, approach, we explicitly define where the Z axis should point. And then we define the heading as um, uh, separate to that. So, so we effectively, uh, our heading is the, the yaw if we uh, rotated level using roll and pitch. And so now when we actually um, change our thrust vector, the thrust, the path of that thrust vector is, is um, uh, achieved using purely roll and pitch. And um, it is the optimal rotation, the shortest rotation between those two points. So we get a faster response and we get a, um, a, a, thrust vector, a thrust vector doesn't skew off to the sides during that path causing a, a, a deviation. Um, and, and this also has the added advantage that uh, we can accept, um, we, we can easily extend thrust vector plus heading to thrust vector plus attitude for six stop um, uh, or higher degrees of freedom um, aircraft. Um, uh, there's, there's a little ambiguity on the heading at uh, minus one, but uh, if, 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 you're, if you're all the way down there, then there's probably more serious problems for you to deal with. And it's only, it's only a momentary ambiguity and we can just ignore heading at that point fine and just worry about not crashing um so yeah so just a, a bit of an indi indication of the differences between uh, these two approaches the uh, this is both using the old navigation algorithms you can clearly see as we get faster and faster and more aggressive in our in our navigation uh using larger lean angles that the um, that these these paths start deviating dramatically from from the uh, target path as as the thrust vector error um, uh, becomes more significant in heading. So the thrust vector has a heading error, which uh, which causes the aircraft to do these loops away from the target um, direction of travel. Whereas, whoops. Whereas when we actually uh, use the thrust vector, um, thrust vector plus heading approach, these these paths are, are very consistent all the way around. And you notice, except for the little RTL here, and I and I think I forgot to actually add it in for the RTL, so that one still deviated off. Um, so yeah, so uh, quite a dramatic change. And, and this is exactly the sort of path you see when you see a hex that's got a motor motor loss situation when it's trying to navigate back with motor loss. You see, and, and you see these uh, in extreme cases, you see these spirals um, at, at, with, a, with a full, um, it looks like uh, an aircraft that's got um, uh, toilet bowling happening as, it, as it's sort of progressing home, desperately trying to get home and basically dizzy. So uh, yeah, so very big improvement there in the quality of our control that solves a lot of these behind the, behind the um, scenes problems that people don't really fully, don't really appreciate the, the significance of generally. And they're not very big. It's just, they're just a little bit ugly. They're just one of those things where that corner didn't look all that nice. So why did that sort of bobble left and right when it, uh, you know, as it came around that corner? And, and often it's because of this, um, this heading problem. So that's the end of my talk. Uh, I, I sorry for, for going over time there a little bit and sorry for leaving you all of a sudden. Um, yeah, have we uh, got any questions? Uh, are S curves part of the quad plane now? Uh, I no. Um, uh, plane still uses its own navigation. Um, we will use, there's two parts to ESCOs. There's the straight line um, waypoint navigation um, uh, S-curves, uh, and there's the real time ad hoc navigation um, S-curves. Now, now plane was actually the first one to use that in the work that Trudge and I did for um, uh, ship landing and updating the plane navigation code. Um, and it's a dramatic simplification over the old approach, much, much easier to use and much more, much kinder 
to the airframe um, than previously. So it's not using the waypoint navigation. Well, I, well Tridge is a better place to it, answer. It that does question. use it if it's unusual, but you can actually tell a quad plane to navigate as a as a multi rotor. And that's what I meant. The simplest thing you can do is just set Q enable equals two and it'll never transition. It'll just fly around as multi-rotor. In that case, it is using the S-curve library. It, it doesn't have a lot of the features, it doesn't have splines, for example, um, but it does use in that case. It's not very common that people do that, um, but uh, you know, it is actually using the Waypoint Navigation Library in that particular case. So that so RTL uh, leg might, is probably using S-curves, that, that moving over the landing point. Yeah, there's a there's a short segment where it'll be using it like for one point, but you can also do complete missions. You know, you could do that same track that you showed in your demo in a quad plane if you wanted to. It'd actually be quite interesting to try that mission. It would be great to have that mission you created as a demo mission saved into our Git tree in our example missions. And I'd quite like to try a simple quad plane model flying that as a multi-rotor and that might well pick out any of the idiosyncrasies that happen with uh, with quad planes. Yeah, that mission's quite good at sort of showing up all the little different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please submit that in or send it to me, and I'll add it. Um, yep. We just want to get it into our our set of standard missions. I think it's a really good one. Yep. So Randy just commented that uh, what I was thinking about is a, a hybrid mission where you do part fixed wing then transition do a couple of waypoints in VTOL transition back, whether yeah. the S curves would yeah. be managed in the, that. And Randy said that, just posted a comment that it doesn't. So I'm confused. Yeah, so there's, uh, I'd have to, I'm not sure about the, oh. the cornering part, but yeah, I can, that needs I can some explain maybe. Inter intervention, doesn't it? Yeah, so, I mean, I guess, uh, multi, you know, a couple of us could explain it, but, um, the quad plane is just always inputting a single target. It's like it's always inputting just the next waypoint that it wants to get to. So S-curves only has that information. Uh, for for S-curves to do the the fancy cornering, um, you know that, that we saw in that video, you know where it always where it cuts it perfectly, um, it needs to know about the next corner at least, and maybe even the one after that. So it doesn't have that extra information, so it can't do the perfect corner. So it'll always just stop at the waypoint and then go to the next one and go to the next one. It'll still be controlled though. So, you know, it doesn't use the leash anymore. So you can be sure that the accelerations, you know, into and away from the waypoint are all nicely controlled, um, but it doesn't do the little, the fancy corner bit. Yeah, that, that, that could be worth adding. It, it's not often it's used, but, you know, it's often enough that it's worth implementing the put in the next waypoint uh, code. Yeah. And, you know, I guess we're over time, so I won't steal too much, but um, maybe when we come around to putting eskers into Rover, that would be a good time. Um, there's mm. some little trickiness that you need to worry about with uh, users uh, moving waypoints around. So, yep. you know, you told, you told it about the next two waypoints and then the user comes in and moves one of them. So we need to um, take some of the logic that's only in Copter and move that up into the mission library. And then it's where all vehicles can, can take advantage of that and not, not get tripped up by missions being changed in flight. Yep, makes sense. Um, hi Leonard, this is Tom Pinger. Um, regarding the uh, waypoints that are all straight ahead that it pauses at now, it seems like it that could be figured out and then at the, at the nav controller just skip over them. Um, yeah, it definitely could. Uh, at the same time, I don't, um, I, I don't, my, my gut feeling is that if you're putting closely spaced waypoints together, then you're doing it for a reason. And um, they like if they are perfectly straight, like um, you uh, you could do what you're saying. But if there's any corner in them at all, you need to do the generate like build these corner geometries. Um, and so my my reaction is it it if you're if you're doing tight spaced little waypoints, you want tight. Uh, tight control of that navigation and, and you're slowing down. And if you just want it to go straight, then don't put waypoints along along that straight segment um, and leave that to the layer above to de decide which of those two things you're actually doing. Um, well, well, I'm uh, worried about the scenario where people would you know trigger a camera and then inadvertently put waypoints in as they're doing that, where 
you may want to just um, and so if you looked ahead and said, well, if the next one's heading is different, you know, more than a you know a degree or two off, then you know, use a normal logic. Otherwise, just combine into the logic. Yeah, and I'm a little bit more brutal um, than you are, perhaps there. But my attitude there is, um, uh, if you are spamming waypoints in there, then you'll quickly work out that your aircraft is going slowly, and you'll fix your fix your code um, as opposed to compromise ours. So, yeah. Well, uh, uh, compromise in what way? Oh well, as in, uh, as soon as like so, so when you when you start um, removing waypoints, you're remove like so. So you you've used an approximation there to say, well, the heading's not too far off, so I'm going. I know better than the user that put the waypoint in there and I'm going to ignore that waypoint and turn it into a straight mission. And so I'm my, as, as, as when I, when I define that algorithm, I'm deciding that I know better than the user and I'm fixing a, a an uneducated user's mistake here by removing that waypoint. When in actual fact, um, well, my approach is if the user tells me that they want to do this, they're, they're telling me that for a reason. And, and, and that, one degree change in headings actually really important um, because then then you sort of say well you know okay one degree that's not too bad if it's only a one meter waypoint but it depends on the scale if it's a 10 kilometer waypoint maybe that's the difference between flying into a tree and not um, how accurately is this particular user expecting me to follow that path um, and so my approach um, is if a user tells me to do something, then I do exactly what they tell me to do. Um, and if the user tells me to do something stupid, clearly tells me to do something stupid, then I'm going to assume that perhaps it's not stupid and that's what they really want to do. Um, and, 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 you know, the, it goes back to the philosophy of um, pilots crash aircraft. We don't. So if, um, so with AutoTune, for example, we um, we allow that we we uh, we insist that the pilot the pilot tells us to change gains. We don't sort of feel good that we've actually made good decisions and we change them for them. We actually wait for a command. So the pilot is re is always responsible for that. And so that that's sort of my you know, I'm, that's my approach to these sorts of problems where, um, you know, if, if a emission generation software is is creating lots of close in missions, um, their users are going to very quickly complain about how slowly it's going. Well, they're going to complain to us and we're going to say, you've got a whole heap of really close um, waypoint segments there. Yes, it's going to go slow. That's what it's supposed to do. Go back and talk to um, whatever mission generation um, firmware that you're using and tell them to fix their problem. Well, and that brings me to, have, have you tried this on a regular mission? Like, have you looked at Mission Planner, done a, a yeah. survey? Okay. Yeah, Mission Planner does a good job. So it's one of those things, that, um, especially uh, like now we're actually able to increase the number of um, uh, the number of segments uh, a lot, but um, there's always been a high emphasis on minimizing the number of waypoints to maximize the size of the mission that people can do. So that that naturally avoids um, you know this particular problem. I have seen one mission uh, piece of mission software that when it's doing the the overshoot to to go past the end of the mission, it puts extra waypoints there rather than takes it all the way out to where it wants to turn around, um, and and that might result in the aircraft slowing down a little bit earlier for those corners than what it would otherwise. Um, but it has to slow down for the corners anyway, so it's not that big a deal. But um, you know that that piece of firmware, uh, that piece of software. Uh, is wasting waypoints. Uh, well, it's basically adding four, well, two extra waypoints for every straight line segment with this little extension at each end that it shouldn't be in the first place. So, um, so that situation might result in a slightly slower mission um, at the end there, depending on the it, depending on the parameters of the aircraft and whether or not um, or what the maximum speed between those last two waypoints are. So basically, it's recommended that people make a note of that when they run missions now to see how, comparing the 4.0 to 
um, you know, there, there, there will maybe a change in behavior a bit or in timing and all that. Uh, yeah, well, there's definitely, you saw from that mission that there's a huge change in the path in that uh, 4.1 um, is not like, is not going to follow that, uh, that if you've got a really fast um, aircraft and you, you, you've got reasonable accelerations, um, 4.1 is going to cut the end of those corners really badly. Um, and it's one of the big things that people struggle with is sort of dealing with that in the end of these um, uh, the, these, nav the, these survey missions is at the end of each line that 4.1 goes and goes whoop, and then hits it and comes back with this ugly thing. It doesn't sort of go around the And there's people have done all sorts of things to try and fix it. But when you're, if you're flying fast with, with, with sort of, uh, relatively low accelerations versus your speed, say two and a half meters per second and 15 meters per second, very, very reasonable parameters, you get a long leash and you get this problem where it goes whoop in there. Um, and so you're trading, you know, so so people are going to look at the end and, and probably not even going to notice this particular problem because they'll, they'll be uh, more focused on the fact that now it actually goes, then goes around the corner and comes back and they don't have to have this long overlap to deal with this, this fundamentally, this navigation control problem. And everybody will probably be bringing these things back because now they it's got a very well-defined thing. So there's going to be changes um, uh, in, in the way... Um, people create their missions because they're not trying to get around these um, fundamental problems with our existing navigation controller. So I, I suspect most of this stuff will just get completely lost in the wash. Because it's happening when we've got worse problems in 4.1 generally. Sure. Okay, well, um, the next next talk is uh, Michael Oborn with Mission Planner. So I'm sure we can ask him how to fix him on that. Yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry for the delay, Michael. <laughs> Yeah, no worries at all. So, uh, all right. Well, uh, thank you very much, Leonard. That's fantastic talk. Greatly uh, appreciate it. And uh, well done overcoming the technical issues halfway through. Um, so I'll, I'll just switch over the recording now, ready for our next video. All right. So our next talk we have is Michael Oborn uh, giving us a, uh, an update on Mission Planner. So over to you, Michael. Okay, so screen sharing's done. And I'll just start video as well. There we go. Are you ready to go, Tridge? Started recording? Yep, all good. Go for it, Michael. <laughs> cool. Okay, so my talk is about basically just a mission planner update. Um, yeah, so a lot of what I'm going to be discussing has actually already been discussed in one form or another, either whether it be uh, Leonard, Andy, um, <laughs> Tridge, like pretty much everything I've, I'm going to be saying has already been mentioned in some form. So I'll probably reference it throughout to, to guide people watching this to view other people's videos. So um, please feel free to chime in as needed or if you have any questions throughout. So all good. Okay. So the new feature list for the past, I think, close to close to two years, I think, because uh, last year I didn't actually do a speech, um, but predominantly these are uh, stuff within the last year. So um, all the stuff at the top of this list, I'm gonna be going through a little bit more in depth and the stuff towards the end of the list, I'm gonna gloss over fairly fast towards the end, um, but I'll give you a rough idea where to find it and uh, what it does, um, just a very brief description of it. Okay. So first thing, plugins. So on um, one of my previous speeches, probably two or three years ago, I would have talked about Iron Python plugins. So that feature still exists in Mission Planner. What has been added since then though, is the ability to add C Sharp plugins. So these are compiled at runtime and basically give you full access to all the Mission Planner internals. So what I'll do is I'll go through a very basic demo um, plugin and basically show you uh, what it does, how it would work. And uh, there's a link here to where they are located on GitHub. And uh, right down the bottom here, there's an example plugin in the Discuss forum. Um, so the example I've listed here is actually the initial params calculator, which is a community contribution. So 
I might just accept pull requests to that as required and accept it in and it ships with Mission Planner. So where this works and where this doesn't work. It works on Windows, Linux and a Raspberry Pi. It does not work on Android or iOS. Um, the reason for the not working on Android or iOS is actually App Store restrictions about uh, basically dynamically compiled code at runtime. I'm not allowed on those platforms, uh, security risk and all. So I'll just open this plugin. So what I'll do is I'm gonna go through example six. Um, so what we'll do is we'll just have a quick look through this. So basically the structure is very similar to them all. So 71 lines of code um, and I'll, I'll show you what this does after we go through the code a little bit. So all this stuff at the top is, as you can see, all fairly self-explanatory. The init code, so it's uh, actually run. So what this actually does, it creates a tool strip menu icon called change icon description, adds an on-click event. So when the button is actually clicked, and then it tells it where it's gonna add this on-click event and the button to. So in this case, it's a flight data menu map, and we're adding it to the items and we're just adding it. And then down here is what the button actually does. Um, so in this case, all we're doing is changing the description mission planner shows on the flight data menu map. And basically you can change it to anything you want. So in this case, we have the altitude, the alt unit, airspeed, speed unit, uh, the sys ID, sat count, HDOP and battery voltage. So to give you an example of that, so I'll just start mission planner. Okay, now because these are dynamically compiled plugins, they do take a little while to basically compile at startup. Um, I know now that they've actually all finished loading. I can see it on the back end screen. So there's, there's two features here. One of them um, is a hidden keyboard shortcut, Control P, which, which will actually load this screen here. So basically this gives you a rough idea of all the plugins currently loaded. And if you look at map icon description, which is our example six, that's that one we were just looking at for the source code. So that's compiled in and running at the moment. There are a few others here, like the initial parameter, that's the example that I gave you a community contribution, the generator. So that's for a generator plugin that dynamically loads as needed. And then there's a few other ones like hard, the ability to turn off things. These are, most of these are all examples. So it really depends on what example you're going for. And I try to do a little bit of everything in there. So if you did want to add a custom button or anything to an existing mission planner menu, you can add that as you require. So what that actually did. So if I right click here, you'll see down here, change icon description. So that's the feature that simple C sharp script added. So if I click that and there's our default placeholder. So basically using this here, I could change this to whatever we wanted to add. And basically that's it there. So to actually make that show up, let's just actually load something so you can actually see it. Okay, so that's basically it there. So I can change that to display anything I want. Um, and as for fields to substitute, everything you see in the status tab, if you write it in brackets, as you see it here, you can inject it into the description here. So um, it would be the same for all aircraft. So if you were connected to multiple copters, planes, whatever, it would display the same thing for all of them. Um, so yeah, height, speed, the system ID, satellite count, HDOP and voltage. So basically that's, um, that's, that's a very brief example of the stuff that you can do with plugins. Um, like, dare I say it, so if we go, I'll just quickly show one of the other ones as well. So one of these ones in here was HUD. Um, so all what HUD does is it adds a menu over here for HUD items. So using this, you could literally oop, turn off any of the options on the HUD. So say you didn't want to display the heading, it disables the heading in the HUD. So this is all, um, and the examples on GitHub as well. Obviously this may or may not have use, but it gives you a good idea or an example of what, how you can use it and what you can do with it. So I'll just close that one down. So that's an example, very simple example of a plugin.
There are plenty more examples in here, um, depending on what you wanted, like the HUD on off. That was the example, that extra HUD one I showed you. So again, uh, when loaded, add a button, the options we want to do, um, and then some code to actually read the property and set a true or false, depending on if I want to show it or not. Um, very simplistic. Um, there is, so one thing I probably should add as well is there is a loop as well. So if you wanted something running regularly at a fixed interval, you could actually run it, put your code in the loop. So whereas these loaded and in it are obviously fire once properties. Um, the only thing I might add for those that are looking at doing this is quite often these are not loaded on the UI thread. So depending on what you want to do, um, you may need to basically marshal it on onto the UI thread, but it, I think that's more an advanced topic depending on what you want to do. The examples will give you a rough idea of how to do it in the first place. Hey, uh, Michael. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is Tom Pinger. Um, so you said this run or this is loaded at uh, or compiled, I guess you said at runtime. Does Correct. that mean that Mission Planner is not need to be recompiled to take advantage of this? You just drop drop the CS file in. Correct. So 100% compiled at runtime. Okay, so the uh, stock, whatever you download from the internet uh, and install Mission Planner, yes. major release or whatever, you just make your own CS file, add those couple of lines. Yes. And yeah, that's nice. Yep. So um, it's very similar. Like I said, the Iron Python has been like, it's just Python. It's evaluated at runtime effectively, whereas this is technically compiled at runtime. So we, unlike, Iron Python, you could actually basically uh, change it, rerun it, change it, rerun it. This here, it's more as Mission Planner starts up. So you can't change the code and then just expect it to change. Um, you'd have to actually restart Mission Planner between your debugging sessions um, if you wanted to. Um, there are other options about just compiling it into Mission Planner if that's your preferred choice in the first place. Um, but this is just an example of how to do it at compile time. And the, like the initial parameter calculator, the community contribution, like what we're quite a few 268 lines. And so what, for just for what people, um, this is actually a tuning guide from Leonard, I think it is, um, that basically someone contributed. So basically just ask a few questions. So initial parameter, uh, so air screw size, battery cell count, full volt, fully charged voltage, discharge voltage, and using those numbers obviously can calculate rough um, rate limits and PID calc values and all these other stuff. So um, this, this one is implemented as a view only and then you apply it secondary. Um, so yeah, and to actually initiate this one, so this is shipped in Mission Plan and now to actually initiate this, uh, you would have to press uh, Alt A on a mission, pretty much any mission planner screen, Alt A, because it's actually taking a keyboard shortcut callback. And you could actually basically um, initiate that from anywhere in the application. So, okay. So that's pretty much um, plugins sorted out. Yeah. Um, M M Michael, sorry, yeah. one more question before we move on. Um, so this seems really amazing. I, I didn't know about this at all. So this is, this is kind of blowing my mind. This is awesome. Um, is there a way that you're able to add in a uh, runtime reloading of the print of the plugins? Because that seemed like it'd make development a lot faster. Um, technically, yes. Um, it wasn't sort of in the initial scope, but yes, it's definitely possible. Um, the, probably the biggest problem is, is actually unloading the file after it's actually been loaded initially um, versus actually add, like you could load it multiple times, but obviously that gets quite messy. Um, whereas unloading it is probably going to be the bigger issue just because of the way C Sharp works and the app domain works. So um, I'm not saying it's not possible, but I would need to look in. I'm not worried about the loading. I'm, it's more about the unloading of the plugin, which is I'm more concerned by. Yeah, when you showed your control P and you had that ch chart there, um, yep. in other apps I've seen, uh, usually you can do something like, uh, you know, enable or disable given plugins. And yep. then that's, that, that's usually how they, you know, if you disable it, you know, re-enabling is how you, you know, refresh it. So basically this, this does have an enable disable option. Um, but if you click that after it's been loaded, it wouldn't actually disable it in this run. Um, so I'll just open that again, because I know they finished loading. 
Um, so these purely just disable, uh, disable it from compiling at startup. Um, currently, it's not live. Um, so yeah, uh, that would have to be a future edition, I think. Cool, all right, thank you. Okay. So, um, so uh, basically for that plugin screen that you saw, just to show the current status is control P. Um, that will probably end up moving to the mission plan a setting screen uh, in the very short term. It's actually been in like this option's been in there for quite some time. Um, like if you look at the commit history there, at least over probably nine months ago sort of thing, uh, a lot of this stuff was added. So possibly older than that. Um, like I said, the caveat being Android and OS, um, this is not possible. Okay. So uh, the next one is just a few additions to the log browser. Um, so I'll just, and this will be another quick demo. My, I'll be doing quite a few demos today. So data flash log, we'll just, I'll just pick a log. It doesn't really matter what at this point. Let's pick this one. I don't know if it was a good, good example. So um, basically the option, the extra features in here are around the show parameters, this option just here. So um, this will basically show the parameter tree. And uh, so you can basically view all the parameters that were on the vehicle at the time. Uh, currently this, um, if there's a parameter change through the log, it'll actually display the final output value. So the value at the end of the log is the value that we'll be showing here, not the initial turn on values. Um, there is obviously you could do some tweaking around this. Um, it's hard to know what people sort of want though in that respect. So, um, but it's a good idea. And there was a few bugs Randy spotted here, which are now resolved as you can probably see by me moving the mouse around at the moment. Um, so there's, uh, yeah, it's just uh, basically gives you an easier way to get access to this stuff to be able to view it in the first place. Um, one of the other things is all about the description. So the metadata down here at the bottom of the screen. So I basically, as I mouse over stuff, it'll basically give me a description of what it is. Um, and the last one is probably, I'm gonna pick Barrow because I know that's a good one. So the ability to graph um, in older versions of Mission Planner, everything was basically put on a single axis. So now that we have this metadata, uh, basically as, as an example, you pick altitude, it knows it's in meters. So I tick that and basically we got the unit of meters. If I tick pressure, obviously different units, so it will add it to a different axis. Uh, temperature, different unit, it'll add it to a different axis. So it was obviously like we're at the integer level here, like single digits, here we're at double digits. And like you look at the different scales here, they're quite vastly different. So now the ability to go for like Barrow plus GPS um, here and have graph altitude. So all the altitudes will be on the same axis. Um, the right click option still exists. Um, and that will work exactly the same as well as it previously did. So it's really just about adding the, the individual axes um, based on the unit type from the uh, log metadata and the actual display of uh, what it is as well. So like um, obviously looking through some of the EKF stuff, knowing what VN is, velocity north, but um, estimated velocity north component as described down here. So it really just, um, giving a more novice user just more direct access as to what that value is in the first place and having it readily available. Okay, so that's pretty much the changes for the log browser. Oh, um, so Michael, what happens when you double click on one of those log entries on the right side? Oh yes, an addition from Tom. Um, so let's just open a log again. So basically Tom, quite a while ago, added the ability to scale things. So if I pick say, let's pick altitude. So I'll double click this and we can actually apply an offset or a scalar uh, that Tom knows all about. So I picked altitude in this case. So if I times that by 10, this is a really bad example, but, oh, hang on. So, and I'm, let me guess it's not gonna play it ball now. No, it's not. I 
I think it might actually work this time. Okay, so it looks like there might be a bit of tweaking still involved here, but well, no, you, you click, click, so uncheck it and then check it again so it redraws it. Yeah, that given its camera, that is the right altitude. So you might have to look into that one a little bit, I think. But uh, the intent obviously is is to be able to provide scalars uh, offsets um, similar to what MavProxy could do in that respect. Um, and of course, I've, like I would have talked about this previously, a lot of the MavProxy graphs are actually here and uh, this list does actually support um, expressions. I don't expose this to the end user, but uh, in the back end, Mission Planner does actually support a lot of the map proxy expressions for MapGraph. Um, it's just not exposed in the front end. Okay. So, uh, moving along. Okay, so U of E can and AP proof. So, after the excellent talk by Tom yesterday, um, basically, he illustrated a lot better than I could some of this stuff in here. Um, but what I'll do is I'm just going to briefly go through uh, all of just a few of the things that are options in this screen and um, basically how you can use it and what you can do with it. So on my desk, I currently have a cube orange with a here three attached. So I'm going to connect to my cube orange and SL CAN port, set up optional UAV CAN. And um, in this, so I'll, I'll probably take one step back and give you a bit of history. The reason there is two buttons is um, actually from back in the Cube Black days. So when we were using a single um, serial endpoint, uh, you had to click, you actually had to connect to Maplink first and then click one of these buttons to actually uh, basically turn it, the Maplink stream into SL CAN mode. On a cube orange, when you pick the SL CAN port, it doesn't actually matter which one you pick. They both do the same thing. So that's purely a legacy thing. Um, and yeah, it's just legacy. So I'll just connect here. So um, this has got my, my Q range has master on it. And as you can see, I've got a here connected to it at the moment as well. So um, a lot of this screen is uh, basically, as you would have seen in Tom's talk, uh, the menu to do update parameters to actually restart the node to update. So um, update actually will search the internet. I think Cube Pilot is the only vendor that actually has anything uh, firmware URLs for this. So um, in the background, all it does is uses the name of the node plus the hardware version ID to pull a firmware. Um, and once it's downloaded, it will check the software CRC to see if it needs uploading or not. Um, so there's the update and the update beta. And then the CAN pass through is another option added for the HERE and the HERE Pro, um, which basically allows direct access um, via CAN, well, direct access to the UBLOX module over CAN. So you can do firmware updates of the M8P or the F9 or whatever other system you're using. Um, so long as the firmware has been written to support that. So one of the biggest things, debugging CAN devices. Um, so down the bottom here, you'd have the node status, the debug text that the node is actually spitting out. In this case, there is known. Um, I've got the 1.7 here firmware on this. So all of this debug text has been removed. If you have a 1.5 or 1.6, there'll be debug text. Uh, probably every five seconds it is telling you the load average and uh, currently missed frame, can frame output. But uh, as of 1.7, this no longer exists. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open the inspector and it will open a screen like this. So what this helps with is if you want to check that the node is actually working and outputting what you expect to do. So in this case, I'll pick the here. Um, magnetic field. So magnetic field, I can see the magnetic field changing if let's graph that. Uh, so one query I have here is why pick points over time? And the reason for picking points over time is because it depends on the update rate. So as an example, I can see that we're doing 70 frames per second here around 70 hertz. Um, so I'm leaving that in the operator's hands um, as to how long it is. And this way I can allocate memory at the start. I know how wide the graph's going to be and other things like that. So um, obviously you could pick 5,000 in this field if you wanted to. It really doesn't make any difference. 
Now, because I picked um, magnetic field and there is actually three single values in there, uh, as I graph it, it actually shows all axes. So let me just rotate this a little bit. So it actually does something useful. Um, but yeah, so you can see uh, the data and basically do whatever you want with it. Um, so that will uh, that so that will actually stay there. Um, if if for an example you had a cube orange, uh, if you opened another copy of Mission Planner, you could connect via Mavlink uh, and do Mavlink stuff. Um, currently, Mission Planner you can't have both SL Can Screen and Mavlink connected at the same time. Technically, it's possible, but uh, at the moment you cannot. Um, so you should be able to, using one cube orange, you should be able to basically talk to it with Mavlink to do control, whatever you need to do. And then also have SL CAN connected to basically monitor what's happening on the SL CAN bus. So where this might be handy is if I just close this and open this, you'll see that I'm sending both actuator commands and also raw ESC commands. So if I was testing ESCs and wanted to see the actual command being driven out the CAN bus, um, I could do that, um, or basically set these status, light commands, or whatever else you wanted to do. So currently blue, green, red is set to zero, Ooh, spiked there for a second. So um, this would basically just, uh, so you could graph to see that there is valid output coming out of it. And I can, I can tell that this is working because there's a yellow flashing cube, uh, yellow flashing here on my desk at the moment. Okay, so, and then safety status and other things like that. So um, one of the, the, also the other things is the approximate bandwidth on the bus. Um, so I will say SLCAN is a very inefficient protocol. Um, so basically that is the uh, traff raw, raw, that is the message bandwidth on the bus, not the actual bandwidth on the bus. Um, it'd be getting close to double that by the time you got to the bus and then possibly double plus a bit for actual the SL CAN packing. Um, complex subject and I'll just leave it at that for this point in time. So um, one other thing that might come in handy is this subscribe option. So if we pick, I'm going to pick, well it doesn't actually matter what I pick here, but so that we've got the here, here three here with a, actually here two uh, with the fix. So I'll subscribe and this, what this opens is this screen here. Um, and then we can pick a message. So say I wanted to see data from this, so let's pick fix two. And what this does, it, this will just keep scrolling through data. Um, and as you can see there, the time use X is just slowly climbing. So to show one message, you do 100. I'll change it to zero, sorry. And basically all of the number does is how many lines you wanted, in, wanted to display above that. So the actual output format here is JSON. Um, if you see just there, there's the packet start and finish just at that point there. And um, so you could copy and paste that into an external application or whatever it else you wanted to do or needed it for. Um, so as you, as you increase this number, the number of packets in history changes as well. So um, it really depends on what you want to do. There's a good example with Magfield, just constantly changing, although you probably can't see that by Zoom. Okay. So, um, so that is basically the principles of the UAV CAN screen. Um, there's been a lot of work, especially SID has been certainly fairly um, busy on this topic. And I know in the future, CAN FD will certainly be one of those topics that uh, will be integrated um, into this as well. Um, obviously the amount of work involved there is unknown at this point, but um, it will be coming soon. Um, and yeah, we'll see how it all goes. Um, as for the update and parameters, uh, Tom gave a good presentation of that yesterday. Um, so it uh, should be all fairly straightforward. Okay, so I'll just close that. Oh, actually one thing I will do. Okay, so from a debugging perspective, um, one thing, uh, like I know UAV CAN GUI tool doesn't actually support this, but uh, be so before you connect, there's an option up here that says log in the top right corner. If you tick that and then connect, it will actually log the SLCAN traffic to a log file in the normal mission planners log directory. This is great for debugging and post-processing logs later on. 
Um, although Mission Planner doesn't directly support processing those logs, I do have apps in the background that do support processing those SL CAN logs into say JSON files or Excel files, depending on the data format and actually analyzing the data afterwards. Um, Mission Planner doesn't support that out of the box um, as it's probably more advanced topic, but um, if, if you needed a SL CAN log off the bus um, while viewing the data, uh, so you could possibly review what you saw during the uh, logging using the inspector as an example, you can do that later on. So all good. Okay, so obviously the future like I've written here is FD CAN um, with basically the 64 byte message frames instead of eight byte message frames. I think that will certainly improve things on the bus um, with a with a heavily saturated with ESC data, GPS, RTCM data, and other things on the bus, CAN is certainly getting flooded. So um, I, CAN FDs will definitely be an improvement in that field. Okay, so the next thing, MAV FTP. So um, MAV FTP has definitely improved the speed of connecting and other features as well, whether it be log download, uh, scripting, uh, Lua REPL, and uh, as uh, I know me and Trit were chatting before the call to before this uh, meeting today about basically the way the SIS works and future support of mission and param upload and download of mission. Um, obviously we already have param download via um, MAV FTP, but the ability to upload params and missions in an atomic operation obviously opens up many windows there. Um, now I'll very quick demo. I, I think most people here will already know how to do this, so I won't waste very much time on it. So I'll do to real hardware, uh, we'll connect via MavLink. So this process here will download the parameters via Mav FTP right now, um, very quickly, all parameters done. This is USB, as Trid showed yesterday in his talk about over a SIK radio versus USB. Um, and if we go config and then Mav FTP, basically we can see the listings of everything on here. So what you're looking at now is actually the SIS. So this, this um, obviously this incorporates both a bit of what Tridge said um, with basically this is at SIS, at mission potentially coming, at param potentially coming, or possibly a, a virtual route, which we were talking about this morning where I, um, mission planner would show one route and these would be automatically listed inside instead of showing you three separate folders as it is right now. Um, so this is this ties into where Tom was, um, basically all these folders using uh, basically CAN stats, UAV CAN stats and other threads tasks. Um, if you want more information on that, have a look at Trudge's chat regarding this one. Um, there's lots of good information. Um, so ROMFS, I might have got ahead. Technically ROMFS doesn't work in RG Pilot. Um, I don't see any reason why it shouldn't, but currently it does not. Um, I'll just leave that bit of fruit hanging there somewhere. And then um, you've got the actual... Yes, the directory uh, listing doesn't work. The ROMFS itself works. You can fetch files if you know their names. Okay. Uh, but you can't at the moment do a directory listing inside ROMFS. Yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah. So um, basically logs, everything you'd expect, uh, EPROM backups or FRAM backups, sorry, um, and the terrain data. Um, if... Uh, if I'd use this cube to do REPL, there'd be a scripting directory in here as well, and um, many other directories depending on use case, obviously. Um, obviously, upload, download is everything you'd expect. Download, burst, download, upload, delete, rename. Uh, the ability to select multiple files, delete them, and the ability to drop and drag from Windows into this directory works as well. Um, so if you just wanted to drop and drag, uh, the only caveat with drop and drag is the UI does technically hang while it's transferring. Um, that's just, I'm sure many of you have probably come across this in Windows in general. If you drop and drag the wrong thing into the wrong place, things just seem to sit there for a while. Um, Mission Planner is no different. That's a property of Windows. So um, yeah, just the way it is. Okay, so that's Mav FTP in a nutshell. A quick question. Yes. Uh, using MAV FTP for refresh of params yet? Um, currently, no. Uh, there's no reason I can't add it. I already obviously have the code to do that on Connect, um, but I will be adding that 
Um, I'll probably end up keeping a status of if I was able to do it on connect and then if it's refreshed in the future, I'll basically pull it by Mav FTP again using that status from the initial connect. Um, that will probably be the plan forward, I think. Great. So definitely future work. Yep. Okay, so next. So with all this FFT talk from pretty much every speech prior to me, um, this is something that I've been working on in the background, hasn't been a lot of public exposure to it. So Mission Planner has the standard FFT screen. Um, what this does is it actually does an FFT over the entire log. It does not display it in a logarithmic scale. It just displays it purely as an aggregate of the total magnitude of all the data in the log. So there is a windowing function over that. It's running a Hanning window over the entire log and then basically averaging the, all of the samples in that log into the FFT screen. So I've done a chat about FFT in prior years, so I'm not gonna go over that one again. Uh, what I'm, I'm gonna do is do an example of the new spectrogram screen. So the FFT screen shows it over the entire log, so it's not time dependent whereas the spectrogram shows the FFT over time. So as, a, as an example with what you're seeing on screen right now, you're seeing a log of the Excel one on the X, Y, and Z axis, and you're seeing it over time. And so you've got a pretty good rough idea of when the um, props uh, basically ramp up there. As for the banding in this data, I have a feeling that actually might be an INU issue with this specific board, um, or there's some kind of really weird resonance in the frame, but I don't think it's resonance. So I'll just quickly, oh, to get this function, control L, um, I will be moving this probably to the uh, setup advanced screen, but currently it's under control L and it's in beta and has been for probably two or three months. So I'll just start Mission Planner again. So uh, Control L brings up a screen that looks like this. Uh, load a log. I'm going to pick. So I'm going to pick a FFT from a Durandal. I'm not quite sure where I got this log, but it's off the internet somewhere. So here's just an example of. I'm not like I said. I don't know where this log actually came from, but it's an example of what looks to be a nice constant resonance frequency depending on very specific frequencies. Um, so you can zoom in here if you want to. Um, there's, because of the way it works, it's probably not the easiest way to view it, but um, it does oh, undo zoom all, um, does display it on each axis. And you can change basically the Excel 123 or Gyro 123. And you can also change the min and max scale. So this is in dB, um, unlike the other. So it's effectively a logarithmic scale. The color is based on a logarithmic scale. So obviously the ampl a red being high amplitude and the purpley blue and gray being low amplitude. So that's one example of a log. I'll just go through a couple of the logs. So um, let's pick cube orange FFT. Can't remember which log this is. So this is, predominantly a fairly big flight. You can see the primary data. So this, this same log using the old FFT screen would just show basically um, banding around what may 100 hertz and 200 hertz. So it'd be probably heavier around 100 and slightly lower around 200 hertz. I'm guessing there a little, and then slight rise at maybe 400 hertz on the x-axis, then the y and the z-axis. So the z-axis is a good one. You can see predominantly in the two, just under 200 hertz range. Um, so this, this ties into everybody that's talked about FFT in the, my prior chats. Um, yeah, it's all related ultimately. Um, it's just, uh, this, this is more for post-processing versus uh, the real-time harmonic notch or any of those other FFT stuff. So, um, and I'll just pick, let's pick uh, this one here as well for as an example. I'll click update to actually update it. So here's another log as well. Again, you can see the banding of red um, and you can tell where the motor started spinning up. Um, yeah. So all, all of this is, is a FFT 
uh, basically a sliding window FFT. I uh, can't remember how often it's sliding, but it's, it might be one to one or two, three samples for each um, time slice. Um, so sliding window over that using a Hanning window. Okay, so again, uh, so to use this, um, you need to do the uh, batch sampling, enable batch sampling. Um, exact same data as the old FFT screen, um, it uh, requires batch sampling data to generate this. Okay, so that uh, is basically an example of the new spectrogram, um, which is just displaying FFT over time. Um, potentially uh, good if you had a harmonic table of some description and um, like I know we have test data showing uh, frequency sweeps um, and using this to actually see the frequency sweep and the harmonics of the frequency sweep on different uh, different devices. Okay, so probably one of the biggest ones, uh, Android iOS support. So this one definitely wouldn't have been possible without Qpilot. Um, so if you actually have a look in the Git history around this, you'll see the mono uh, sub repo was added back into Mission Planner, um, or mono sub module was added back in Mission Planner back in 2018 sometime. Um, so it's been a long time coming um, and it's really just a, a time factor here. So for those that don't know, uh, Mission Planner is available on Android. Uh, there are still a few issues. I'm not going to deny that at all, um, but it is available on the Play Store right now. And so Play Store, just search for Mission Planner, you'll find it, normal icon. And it looks just like Mission Planner on Windows, just on Android. Um, so, and there is also an iOS version, iOS and an OSX version. Um, however, uh, there's been limited testing and you'd have to sideload that up onto an iOS device um, at this point in time. Should you be interested in doing this? Um, basically this second link here, uh, so it's actually part of the GitHub CI. So I'll just click that to show you where to get it. So currently um, Mission Planner, go to the Actions tab, and this is all the CI tasks. So we got the Android build, we got the .NET build. So .NET build is the Windows build, Android's Android build, and OSX includes both the OSX and iOS build. So what you do is you download the artifact down the bottom here, and inside there would be the packages that you could actually sideload onto a phone or to your OSX device, Mac OSX device, and basically give it a shot. So please give it a shot. Um, been there has been limited testing on iOS and OSX, um, but feel free to give me some feedback. I don't expect it to be perfect by any means, but feel free to give it a shot. Okay, so now the technical on how it works. So the way this actually works is, so from the lowest level, it's actually running Skia as the rendering agent. And this is uh, tied with Skia Sharp, which is a C Sharp uh, basically implementation of the Skia backend. Um, uh, Android runs Skia native um, and iOS is running it native in terms of the rendering engine as well. But Skia is a project maintained by Google. So um, Skia and Android are very interlinked um, and I don't expect any real issues there. So Skia provides a hardware accelerated interface. So um, depending on how you use it, uh, some people actually think that Mission Planner on Android is actually snappier than uh, Mission Planner on Windows. Um, which in all honesty could be partially true, mainly because of the hardware accelerated interface of Skia. So, uh, so that's, that's from the rendering perspective. So everything is drawn via Skia and Skia Sharp. The level above that is Mono WinForms. So like I said, uh, Mono, the Mono projects has been a submodule in Mission Planner since 2018. Um, and it's that that actually provides the user interface or all the Windows lookalike uh, items um, for what Mission Planner you see on Raspberry Pi, Linux, and also Android, iOS, and OSX. So they are all using the Mono WinForms platform to actually render the standard, uh, basically, buttons and uh, controls of uh, Windows 
like devices, um, whether it be Raspberry Pi, Linux, uh, Ubuntu, uh, any Linux distro that currently supports running Mono. So the probably the real tweak here is um, on Linux Raspberry Pi, it is native Mono WinForms. On the Android OS, it is a custom version of Mono WinForms, predominantly just a fork with a custom window manager at the back end. And that custom window, window manager is basically just talking to Skiersharp to actually draw all the controls and render them to screen. So the advantages of doing it this way are same source with minor tweaks. Um, it is literally the same source. Everything you see is in the Mission Planner repo. Um, you can compile it yourself. There is a different solution to do this. So you'll notice in the Mission Planner repo, there's missionplanner.sln, which is missionplanner.solution. And then there's a missionplanner.lib.sln, which is actually used to compile the Android, iOS and OSX versions. Um, there are reasons behind this, and it's all to do with the Mono WinForms implementation and the fact that we're overriding the system library to achieve this. So that, that part gets complex. Um, and then probably the main real differences between the platforms are the custom serial implementations depending on the platform, uh, Bluetooth and the native library access per platform. So uh, as an example, uh, GPS access on Android and iOS is technically a different API. So the ability and serial and Bluetooth, they're all different APIs depending on platform. So it's really just about um, uh, creating an interface between those different APIs to interface with well, what Mission Planner expects, which is effectively just making Android iOS like Windows. Um, this may not be the best solution, but it's a solution that works. So um, yeah. So that's pretty much um, Android and iOS. Feel free to test it. Um, it's available now for all of these platforms. Um, it's just uh, testing is probably the real key and uh, small like uh, improvements I plan for the future is currently the map doesn't support multi touch. Um, I do plan on adding that to the map because pinch zooming is so much easier than the current method um, and a few other small things like that. Um, like one thing I will say is the firmware upload on Android. It does actually work now. However, getting it to work. Uh, seamlessly, I don't think will ever be a real possibility, um, mainly because the way the libraries interact with the Bluetooth interface on Android, as an example. So when you plug in a USB device into your Android phone or tablet, it will actually prompt you what app you want to do use it with. And the problem here is, is the bootloader um, on say the cube will only stay in the bootloader for uh, one to two seconds, possibly less. So by the time Android's prompted you about this request, you've clicked accept, click go, uh, normally this time has passed. So if you're quick, you can actually update firmware on a cube, as an example, from a Android device. Um, I have done it. Uh, it's just very hard and difficult. So long term, it's probably not an ideal solution, but if you really have to, it is a solution that would work if you're willing to put up with the pain points. Okay, so moving on. Okay, so one of the other things that's been going on in the background is Healink and Mission Planner integration. So Mission Planner has recently added zero conf detection. Um, so what this means is zero conf, it goes by many names depending on which platform you're on. Apple has their name, Linux has their name, um, and I'm calling it zero conf at this point in time. So it's basically network service discovery, whether it be printer, camera, and in this case, Mavlink. So as of new versions of Healink, um, basically that will be broadcasting a zero conf uh, showing where the Mavlink endpoint is on the network and Mission Planner can detect this and automatically connect um, to the Healink on your Wi-Fi network as an example. So if your Healink was connected to a vehicle, um, then you could actually connect Mission Planner on say a laptop to that or a, yeah, a laptop to the Healink and then the ability to actually basically dual control the vehicle through the Healink. Um, 
So where this comes in is basically support for video playback. So this, this is actually a two-stage thing. It's both uh, Mission Planner on desktop and also Mission Planner on here link itself. Again, with the Android support here um, and the ability to display the video, um, video play of uh, H.264 and H.265 native um, on the Android using the Android APIs, not GStreamer in this case. Um, but obviously I'll be looking to using GStreamer as this interface into the future. Um, but that depends a lot on the support of, um, there's, there's quite a few potential issues here around device support, GStreamer support for the specific device and whether or not it supports native hardware decoding of the specific codec on that Android device. So there is a lot of variables here um, and working with HearLink in this instance, I'm, I have access to those internals. Um, so it is makes things a lot easier to integrate better in that platform. So where this is also going is dual video streams. Uh, so the last, the last three options here on this list are probably all partially related. Dual video streams, gimbal control slash second operator, and RC control via internal protocol and second operator. So what I'm actually saying here is a FPV camera, uh, the person flying it on the Healink is using an FPV camera, and then there is a secondary controller or laptop running Mission Planner or uh, one of the other ground control stations that supports it can actually view a second, say, camera feed or a gimbal feed independent of the first FPV feed um, and the ability to control that camera separately. Um, and uh, basically, so the pilot can fly and the gimbal operator can fly the camera. Um, completely independent and basically using the dual video feed to achieve this in a safe manner and also um, multiple access methods as well, whether it be here link to secondary here link or here link to mission plan on the desktop using say a joystick on the desktop, viewing the video feed. So gimbal control via mission planner via here link. Um, so there's, uh, this, this is very close to basically being released. Um, it's implemented uh, from the here link to here link side, it's already implemented. The dual video stream is already implemented. Um, uh, the, the last point on this list, the RC control via internal protocol is the only missing step, which is the mission planner step. Um, so the joystick control purely to control a gimbal, which is connected to a here link. So that's definitely a work in progress slash coming very soon. Okay, so Mavlink Inspector. I've already been through the UAV CAN Inspector. Mavlink Inspector, pretty much exactly the same thing, exactly the same UI layout. Um, it's just the ability to show both two-way traffic. So one of the recent additions is the show GCS traffic option in this screen, which will basically show traffic Mission Planet is sending to the drone. Um, so as an example, in the screenshot I've got here, there you can see the heartbeat being sent and the time sync message being sent. So uh, it tells you the frequency and the actual amount of bandwidth being used to send that. So the GCS in this situation, according to that example, is only sending 21 bytes, which is 21 bytes per second, which is the heartbeat packet. Um, and then receiving from the vehicle, um, we can see all those messages in there. So this is really a developer friendly, designed for developer friendly tool, um, the ability to see what's coming from the vehicle at any time the ability to graph the numbers as they're coming from the vehicle at any time and stuff that might not be displayed in the mission planner status screen. So if you do come across something that you see in this screen that you would like on the status screen, please let me know. Um, a lot of the time, a lot of these messages, they contain excess information which um, isn't always used. So if you did want something extra, an example of some things that have come in recently is the generator messages and also the EFI messages. So they're an example of something that have been added to the status screen recently. Um, and basically, if, if you were to give me a name and the path to the packet and the path of the field from the Mavlink Inspector screen, I could add that very easily in a matter of five to 10 minutes and basically push a new beta and you would have it. So. It's really about just making it easier for developers to get access to this information and the ability to graph this um, values obviously helps a lot as well. So, and 
yeah, the frequency of the message, estimated bandwidth and graphing. Again, this is count based, not time based. So uh, depending on the frequency of the message, um, you can basically, you could tell it to plot 5,000 points and then it'll keep that rolling 5,000 points. Um, so yeah, so that's the basis of Mavlink Inspector. Pretty much exactly the same as UAV CAN Inspector, just for Mavlink instead of UAV CAN. Okay, so the extras. So this, uh, on that very first screen of the new features, so this is basically a where it is, how it is, what it does. So remote data flash logging. So um, what I'll do is a lot of this stuff is on the control F screen. So I'll just bring that up right now. So, and what's the bet? I'll just move this over here so you, we can see a bit of both. So that first option is right here. So. Um, as an example, MavProxy and Mavlink Router can both act as a data flash Mavlink endpoint. So what this allows is Mission Planner to do the same thing. If you have a high bandwidth link to the vehicle, you can uh, log data flash messages over Mavlink and then it'll save it um, in Mission Planner logs directory just as um, MavProxy or Mavlink Router would do. Um, so each time you click this button, it'll basically create a new log and start logging. Um, currently, it's an option where you need to go into Control F to do it. Um, I think Tom was the original person that requested this. Um, but yeah, it works being tested. And uh, yeah, it works as described. So next one, cursor on target. So this is a contribution from Tom as well, um, down the bottom here on this one. So Tom could probably talk to it more than I could. Um, he knows all about this topic, but it's basically uh, similar to many of the other Mission Planner secondary screens. Uh, select an output port, select a board rate, and it'll basically generate messages at the given frequency based on the actual vehicle telemetry information. Okay, next, 3D map. Uh, uh, yeah, if, if you yes. don't mind, I, I wouldn't mind talking a little bit about that. Um, go ahead and click on there, actually, uh, on the COT. And then uh, uh, just click on UDP and just say connect. UDP? Yeah, connect, connect, connect. Just um, start going. It'll yeah. be off forward somewhere. So you actually see the output that it's generating right there. So because you're connected to a simulator, you get, um, you would see the lat longs and all that update. So it's it's just XML. Um, so so cursor on target is something that um, sort of started on uh, with the US military and it's kind of branched out into more things. but. Uh, it, it's a format that's basically designed to encompass all formats for everything. It's, it's, it's like super future-proofed um, to explain, to describe um, troops on the ground, just friendlies, people, aircraft, ground, you know, it, all kinds of different, it has a ginormous spec. So this is a very tiny portion of what's being announced, but it allows you to show up on uh, other services like ATAC, which is a little Android app that is get, uh, getting more adoption in, in civilian use with police and fire and whatnot. So with, the, and even like antenna trackers. And so what, what I have right now is I, I use this particular feature on here where I get the data from the aircraft on Mavlink, right? And then from here, I can forward this to an antenna tracker that only talks cursor on target. So it's kind of like forward in Nemo, where you forward the uh, you know GPS information, but this also allows you to broadcast information to other devices. So people on, on other networks show your, your aircraft would kind of show up as a device. And soon I'll, I'll be adding this native into Archer Pilot itself. Yep, so I just connected to a vehicle there so we can see a real latitude and longitude as an example in there. And so that's basically live now to some extent. So what it would look like in real time. Okay. So that's cursor on target. So the next uh, next thing in here is, this is purely a demonstration 3D map. Um, so 3D map basically just opens a nice OpenGL render window. This will take a while to render out, I guess, but it is, does exactly what you'd expect it to. Um, purely a, a trial 3D map. Um, so what, what people don't know about this screen is, so you can navigate around, um, it also supports clicking. So if I wanted to fly over to this point over here, I'd click on the ground over here and it'll set a guided mode waypoint. So I'll click there, it sets a guided mode waypoint over there. I'll just increase this so we get slightly better resolution. Um, but this is a 
very quick example of just some of the map. So this is purely based on telemetry stream rate. So it is does look very chunky, um, but uh, part of the reason for going this method is it really depends on the computer you're running it on. So if you're running this on a laptop in the field, um, obviously you don't want to chew through battery. So it depends on your requirement as to what you're expecting with this. So purely as a demonstration, if I loaded a waypoint mission, they would actually show up as waypoints as well. It's really just purely a demonstration, um, doesn't actually have any further use at this point in time. No, Michael, does that do it? That's all Google Earth, I presume? Or uh, where is it? So is that yeah, from? yeah, it's Google Earth. And so it's basically just Google Earth imagery and SRTM data. Okay, and how does that interact with the terrain? In what? So at the moment, I'm in guided mode. I set, like, I took off in guided mode, flew to 20 meters altitude, and now I'm just clicking the map. So it's just flying around in guided mode with 20 meter altitude. Well, what I mean is, um, would you see mountains and things? Sorry? Would you see mountains actually stick up out of the ground? Oh, yes, you would. Um, I, I just picked a bad location to start. But yes, you would see mountains. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this area that I'm looking at is rather flat. <laughs> so, yes. Um, but, well, you know, I... for a, uh, you know, cruise mode of sorts with plane, this would be pretty amazing. Yeah. So, like, yeah. You can't really see a lot here, but so I just turned off lock to mav and then basically uh, in free mode. So I just go high pretty much and see off into the distance. So there's water over that way. And yeah. So yes, uh, basically a work in progress. Um, but yeah, a few limitations based on CPU and not necessarily practical if you're limited resources out in the field, laptop, etc. Okay, so next one. Um, so uh, the EFI slash generator. So like I said, uh, recently added messages are EFI and generator. So these now appear in the status tab under EFI underscore and gen underscore. So they are purely just to display, graph, uh, do whatever you want to do. Uh, you can add it to the quick view, um, really depends on your use case. Uh, face map. Okay, so face map is basically people have been asking to basically map the face of a building or something like that. So this is a, actually a contribution from someone else, um, but it is works exactly the same way as auto waypoint and survey grid, but instead it's a face map. So a uh, quick example, I'll just do a very, very quick example. Uh, draw a polygon, let's go from there to there to there. Uh, auto waypoint face map. So that loads a screen that looks like this. And from here, you can specify cameras, um, overlaps, and anything else you want. So uh, bench height. So currently, we're going to fly 30 meters high at 90 degrees off. Um, we've only got one bench. So if I added a couple more benches, and then added meters, you get a nice picture here of an illustration of what it's going to do. So you can change the um, the camera pitch, so say it was at 45 degree down, basically you can see the camera changes here as well. So it really, I'll just remove a few of these, just like 10, not that, 10. So you can see 45 degree down, uh, four benches at uh, with a five meter um, depth per bench. So obviously if you don't want that, you'd switch back to one bench and then it's just a straight vertical up and down. So this is the ability to do, um, yeah, ben, uh, basically face surveys or whatever else you want to do. Uh, one thing a lot of people don't know is you, the red points in here, you can drag and change. So if you didn't get exactly where you wanted to, you can drag it around and move, move it as you see fit and it will dynamically change the paths. So I'll just accept that and there's our path. So there would be multiple altitudes there, all on top of each other, flying back and forward using uh, do cam tree dist. So I'll just clear that. Now, so and, and you know, uh, you know, uh, Michael, since on that page, there's a feature that I that I find very useful that um, I think should probably become the default, maybe. Yeah. Um, but if you right click on your screen, you can change your dock. 
Oh, yes. Which uh, docking. And then um, oh. when I show people that, they just, it's like, oh my gosh, this is like, everyone should do that. This should become the default. So now you can actually see all the missions and it's it's a lot easier to work in. Yeah. So yeah, this this has been this feature has been there for years. Um, obviously, highlighting it here is probably a good thing. Um, that way, people know about it in the first place. So um, yeah, switch docking, and if you want it back, just switch docking back. So this is the way it ships normally. But if you wanted to switch docking, you can go there and do whatever you wanted. So yep. And also the ability to show the maps on your uh, on your main on your data screen as well. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, show everything basically. Okay. Well, no, I mean to show your mission on the data screen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so there's actually two ways. So normally the data screen would update purely from, well, let's I'll just add something. So I'm connected to a copter at the moment in guided mode. So I'll just write that. So normally the data screen, oh, it did actually display it. Okay, so yeah, once you've uploaded, so the probably the key here is like, if I program this, but don't upload it, it won't display here. It has to be written to the vehicle, otherwise it won't display. I'm sorry, I, I meant uh, if, you, if you go back there and you, you can right click, it can go to like more of an editor, go get more information. So go oh, back we, to the data, yeah, go back to data, the data yeah. tab, and then right click on your map. Yep. Which one? And, uh, hmm. I'm not quite. I'm not quite sure which one you're referring to. Yeah, I don't see it now. Oh yeah, yeah, flight planner. There it is, flight planner. Yeah, yeah. That that puts it there in your yeah. on your main data screen on your HUD, so you can do both. Yes, exactly. Yep. Yeah. So that that again, that feature's been there for a very long time as well. So it really depends on your use case. Um, but yeah, you can. You can edit the mission while displaying it. And if when you close button up here and basically switches back to the normal flight data screen. Or flight planner and yeah. And then as, switch. as well as as well as you're tuning at the same time too. You get an upper bar to be tuning yeah. all the same so, time. So if you wanted to tuning, so basically say we wanted extended tuning. So trick here, double click a tab and it will extend and it'll pop out, switch back to flight data switch back to flight planner and we can program a mission change feeds all at the same time i actually meant i'm at the tuning checkbox at the bottom where you can plot oh, you mean like this <laughs> yeah then it gets fancy yeah so uh yeah there's many many options i don't think that worked exactly as intended but i should probably switch off and would have made that easier <laughs> but yes so the ability to tune, well, there's a, there's a good example, the ability to view your tune, change the tuning values plus program emission all at the same time from the one screen. Um, and I know one thing that's been recently added is if you right click here, you can undock the quick view tab. So you can basically put this wherever you want it to. So if, uh, obviously the main reason for that is multi-monitor setup. So you can put it wherever you want it put it, uh, close it, and it goes back down the bottom, as you'd expect. Okay, cool. Okay, so uh, moving along is Lua REPL. Um, so basically, you can find this under Setup Advanced REPL uh, because, um, so uh, people might not know this, but a lot of the stuff in the Control F screen is up here being relocated to this screen, uh, depending on what it is. So the stuff that is generally multi-use um, is being moved to this screen. It is still in the Control F screen, but in long term, it will probably be moving to this screen with a little blurb to go with it as well. So um, the old FFT method, the new FF, uh, the spectrogram FFT method, I haven't added here yet, uh, but all the other stuff, uh, Maverick Inspector, if you wanted it, instead of having to use the uh, Control F version. Um, I know Tridge was uh, requested Maverick Mirror to be added here. So this is for basically, uh, if you're connected to a vehicle, you can actually spit it out another port somewhere. So you're basically a mirror of the incoming Maverick stream. And a few other options, NEMA output, which I think was used during Outback Challenge. Follow me. Paramgen is an uh, internal function for fixing stuff ups uh, when the parameter data is bad. 
uh, moving base info anonymized log. So that basically scrambles the Latin log in a log. So you can send it all over the internet should you choose to. Um, and then of course, what I'm actually here for is the scripting ripple. Um, so basically testing Lua, and I know Michael DB's done a video on that prior, so I won't go into it, but have you his video is probably the best answer there. Okay, uh, AIS support. So this got added uh, last dev conference. Um, I didn't do a chat last dev conference, but AIS was added during the dev conference for Peter Hall, I think it was. Um, so that uh, appears just as ADSB planes do, just for ships. So AIS support for ships displaying in mission planner. Um, so uh, next is GeoTIFF support. Um, so adding more projection frames, uh, so UTM, ETRS, and geographic. So geographic is the normal lat long. Uh, ETRS is a different one uh, in Europe. UTM is global, but uh, they all have their slightly different projection. Um, there's still a few bits of work in progress on this one. There is a lot of different um, global coordinate frames. So these are the three that are supported at the moment. Uh, geographic being the easy one, being lat long, it's exactly as uh, you'd expect it. Okay, so the survey grid, a uh, couple of things that have been added to that is the ability to do corridors, offsets, and lead ins. So I will just very quickly demo this one. So plan, I'll just clear that mission since we don't care about that anymore. So I'm going to draw a polygon. So I'm going to use basically um, survey grid. So draw it, auto waypoint, survey grid. So the difference here is grid options. So say I was here, so cross grid, it does exactly what you'd expect. So using the angle from here, uh, let me just turn that off first. Um, using the angle from here, we've got the actual grid we're drawing. If you wanted to get uh, double the amount of data, basically the cross grid. So um, basically it's just the same grid turned 90 degrees. Um, then there's corridor which is basically just the outline. So if you're flying a road survey, a beach line survey, power line survey, pipeline survey, any of that sort of stuff. So it just flies to the end of the line, comes back and then flies to the end of the line. And then the biggest new one is spiral. So spiral does exactly what you'd expect. Um, think lawnmower pattern, um, that's the intent of spiral. So um, basically, it just uh, generates a pattern and goes around and around in circles. So what I'll do is I'll just turn off markers so I can dynamically push this. So it dynamically generates um, the grid based on what, how you want it. So that is a new feature as well. So if you wanted to do lawnmower patterns, um, Mission Planner has the ability and Lawnmower pattern in Rover with S curves, I think would certainly make a very nice job of these corners here. So definitely looking forward to that. Okay, so I'll accept that and, oh, and I must have had spline turned on. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'll just keep moving on. Um, okay, so that's the uh, basically, and the lead-in to is, there was always a lead-in distance. So this is mainly for plane users, copter users don't really use lead-in. Um, the ability to specify a lead-in uh, at both ends, uh, basically based on wind factors on the day. So the ability to overfly or fly in or give a bigger lead-in path to actually get online for a plane uh, based on bank angle or wind factors, upwind, downwind legs, et cetera. And then I just added this little future state down here. I, this is more of a sort of a question slash, uh, wonder if it would be useful, but um, with the ability to do remote DF logging now, is there any demand to do live FFT via remote DF logging? So you basically turn on batch sampling via remote DF logging and basically create a live FFT on the ground. Um, obviously the FFT is already being generated in the air. Um, it's just whether or not there's any value in that. It's sort of a out there question. I don't know the answer. Yeah, I've considered the same thing myself. And I might note that there's a whole bunch of other data in data flash logs, which we don't ordinarily get via telemetry. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's that's where I was heading with this as well. Like um, the ability, even the harmonic notch stuff, um, the ability to display some of that information potentially live um, because it's not transported over map link. Whereas as soon as we go remote DF logging, it is um, obviously the restriction being bandwidth there. Um, I think that's probably the biggest killer at this point, depending on uh, length. 
uh, bandwidth availability. Yep. Okay. So, um, so I was going to do a very quick demo of uh, GeoTIFF and Dem demo. So, I've just included this link here. So, this is predominantly for Australian users. Um, if I click this link, you will notice that. Uh, from data.gov.au, you can get a five metre LIDAR dem of the entirety of Australia. So um, quite often you can see trees, you can see, you can actually spot roads in the dem data and other things like that just by uh, viewing it. Um, uh, the only catch is this is an 86 gigabyte tip file. Um, so 6.1 compressed, but uh, uncompressed is 86 gigabyte. Um, this obviously puts huge constraints on the ability to load this dynamically into things like Mission Planner. Um, although Mission Planner does try, it will actually load, but um, I'm still playing with proper integration to this as well. Because if you notice on one of my previous slides, I had uh, UTM support, uh, ETRS support, and GEO. This is GDA94. So again, a different projection system and a different altitude reference system. So. Um, a work in progress, let's just go with that. But um, there is obviously a plan to support that. So where this comes in. So the quickest and easiest demo I can show with this one is let's just, so I've got I've got this, these files here. Uh, so this is a very old solo log um, of a flight over a property. And I've used um, basically, so we've got, we've got this lovely TIFF file which has already been geo referenced and I want to use this in Mission Planner. How do I do that? So um, what I would do is I'll just grab the URL from that. I'd open Mission Planner. I'll just clear this. I'll disconnect for a second. So at the moment, Control F. <laughs> Control F and then there's custom GDAL. Load a custom map tile source by GDAL. So I'll click this. I've actually already got it open. So that's the path that I just loaded that TIFF from. I'll click open there, close that. Um, and then I'll go plan. I'll just clear this for a second. Now I'm gonna change the map source from Google to GDAL custom. And what you will find is it might take a little while to load because it has to load the 300 meg TIFF file in the background. Um, so we're still in the same area. I'll just clear and hopefully it actually works. Seems to be having a little bit of a holiday. Yes, all of Mission Plan is having a holiday. There we go, took a little while. So because I had that geo-referenced TIFF, which was actually referenced in geographic coordinate frame, so it had been, uh, basically all the image has been reprojected to geographic, which just means it's been reprojected to latitude and longitude. So pixel density is based on latitude and longitude, not UTM or some other projection. Um, so, and we can see that. Uh, so this, this data was captured by a GoPro on a old solo. Um, so it gives you a rough idea of what's capable. So this is, uh, yeah, custom imagery on if you wanted a high resolution. So the actual resolution of this, um, given it was a GoPro, it's not the best resolution, but at the same time, it's certainly better than it was. So I can see that's a water tank. I can see that's a, a shell pool, a fish a shell play pool. And I don't know what that is, but it's something in trees, et cetera. So that is basically um, that one. So that is for visual. Now, in actual fact, I've actually already loaded it. But what you'll notice down here is we've got SRTM and we've got the current. So as I mouse over here, so we're SRTM, SRTM, as I mouse just here, we switch to GOTF. So I've actually loaded a DEM, digital elevation model for this same area. So as this data was captured, I generated a digital elevation model as well. Now to view, to basically add one of these, the digital elevation model again is in geographic, so the latitude, longitude. I'm gonna use control F again. So in here, there's an option called DEM. So I'll click that. And so here's, an, here's the two images that I currently have loaded as DEMs in. So we have that uh, 86 gigabyte file I was talking about earlier, which 
um, currently is not actually working correctly. And then I have my farm dem, which is the actual dem I'm using here. I click open dem directory and it will open basically the SR mission planner, program data, mission planner, SRTM directory. So in here, I would put my farm dem and there's a 400 megabyte TIFF file, which is the elevation data that um, mission planner is using. So it doesn't display properly in a Windows TIFF viewer, but it works in mission planner correctly. So to give you a better rough idea on to actually, so yes, I know it's using the DEM data, but how do I actually really know that it's using it? So I can see down here and when I mouse over that it says GeoTIFF, but how do I actually know? So there's another shortcut called Control W. I've actually done a previous speech on Control W, um, but basically this is just highlighting. So what I'm gonna do is click Terrain, and what it'll do is it'll render an overlay showing the elevation model. So as at the front of the property here, you can see trees. So the top of the tree here is seven meters. And then if I mouse up a bit, 2.6 meters. So basically you can show the trees, you can show the buildings. Um, the trees down the back of the property didn't uh, work properly by the look of this, um, but I would just blame that on the poor quality capture of the data in the first place. But um, buildings, um, you can see basically the edge of buildings. So that the roof of this building is 7.8 meters. The ground next to it is 5.3 meters. So the ability to basically get high resolution data into Mission Planner and then um, the on-flow effect of getting this into the copter to basically do terrain following or other things. So the next thing you might notice is this transition between SRTM and the GeoTIFF. So um, in this case, if I remember correctly, we didn't actually, I don't actually remember the reason for that, but there is an altitude shift. So as an example, the edge here is 3.3 meters and the SRTM data is saying 6.3 meters. So there's approximately a three meter shift between the two. I don't recall the exact reason for that, um, but as an example, um, at the same time, if you were planning a mission on this, um, basically your takeoff altitude would be ground level anyway. So it depends if you're planning an absolute mission or not. And if terrain following was on, if terrain following was on, then obviously you picked a number higher than the terrain. Um, if I remember correctly, I think there was some conversion in here that wasn't done on this image, but it was a, it's a good sample depth set purely because I can show the illustration of how the data transitions between the GeoTIFF and the SRTM data. Okay, so that's basically an example of that. So one thing I'll just touch on in Control W as well is elevation. Um, so we're currently, technically the drone is actually, oh no, I'm not flying anymore, so it won't work. Okay, let's abandon that idea. Okay, so that's basically that. Now if I go back to here. So that's a very brief example on how to use that. Are there any questions? Yes, this is Tom Pinter again. Uh, yeah. Can you pretty please uh, make a list of all your magical hidden keystrokes? Yeah. Um, a lot of what I showed today will be coming out probably into the advanced screen in the setup screen or on the mission planner settings screen. Um, depending on its use case or intended use case. So, yep. Is that a stock solo or had it had its uh, GPS swapped out? I think it was stock. Uh, you ask Philip that question. I don't know if it's, uh, <laughs> but it uh, might've been stock, I'm not sure. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much, Michael. That was absolutely brilliant and amazing as always. You know, all of the features you've you've brought into Mission Planner. It's it really is the primary interface we've got to our users, and and for many users, you know, Mission Planner is RG Pilot, and seeing it develop so rapidly and uh, and so well is is great. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the next uh, slot we have in our uh, timetable is some uh, vendor specific talks. So we have a, um, a talk from CUAV 
And uh, so they were going to present uh, on some of their new features. And so that's Lindy from CUAV. And uh, just give me a second while I switch over the recording and then I'll, I'll start it up. Are you ready to go, Lindy? Yes, hello, I'm here. Hello, great. Hey. I'll just switch over Henry, the recording just a me? second and okay. then be ready to go. Okay. Can right. you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. So, okay. um, so welcome, Lindy. And uh, so Lindy's going to be presenting uh, about uh, CUAV new features. Over to you, Lindy. Okay. Hello, everybody. Nice to meet you uh, again here. How are you? Uh, it's uh, my honor to have a speech here. Thank you so much for, for inviting. Here we show here. Today I'll talk it about the CUAV new products. Um, show. Can we see the, the, our computers now, right? Uh, yes, can see it fine. Okay, let's begin. Uh, today our topic is about the CIE new products here to share. First of all, uh, we will introduce uh, about CUAV. As you know, CUAV is a hardware supplier uh, for more than 10 years. Also, CUAV is the one of Autopilot's early partners. We, our main products, including the hardware such as uh, flight controllers, GNSS, and the RTK, 10 ministry radios, and CUAV Cloud 16 software platform. Uh, so next we will talk about the CUAV autopilot. Uh, for next year, we launch uh, S7 server flight controllers, such as S7 and S7 Pro, and CUAV NORA. For S7 Pro, we use ADIS 16470 sensor. But because of the pilot's high standard performance, now the S7 Pro's, uh, we got the high feedback from the customers. And we, we will have a high demands from the market. Thanks so much for the uh, pilot. And also this year, as this year, we will have a new uh, flight controllers, high performance flight controllers. Uh, it will integrate, we use at aviation connectors. This is the first time we use these connectors from CVAV flight controllers. And also we will use the battery temperature calibrations. It's ported from uh, the pilot uh, systems. Uh, show that the IMU will be high performance and uh, more stable. And also we will uh, add other uh, integrate into the flight controller, uh, the device to reduce the uh, uh, wire rate, such as the integrate RTK and dual x 7 processors. Uh, so next, we will share about the GNSS positional module. Um, we upgrade from new V2 GNSS series GPS to new three series GPS. As you can see this new three GPS, we can use a uh, listener for U plus M9 and G and it can support four satellites. Uh, the accuracy we can improve to 1.5 meters. And for the new 3 Pro, we use the protocol for UAV CAM, and we use the compass RM3100. It can have a stronger anti-interference performance. So this is our uh, new GNS for new three GPS this year. And next we will talk about uh, our new products in, for this year. Uh, as you know, uh, it seems for the, in the market, 
you can see it seems the PPK much better than the RTK, no? And so in the last two years, we spent a lot of time to uh, research the PPK. We call them CRTK2. So uh, we, we integrate UAV CAM protocol and it supported PPK and RTK and also use RM3100 compass and also use the UBRAS F9P receivers. So it, it will be high performance for this PPK. I think it's in the future it demands a lot of, uh, for this demands high performance for this PPK. As we see, this is a hardware, as we can see this. This is the first version for this PPK hardware. As we can see this PPK. Okay, let's talk next topics. And as you know, the drone development, uh, if you want to control the drones anytime and anywhere and also do the teamwork. So, the, so we need CUAV clouds, the accessor, it is accessor UAV network communication solutions in including the LTESC and other networks equipment, as well as the CUAV GS, Bagel and transmission and other software systems. With this, you can uh, send your videos and data to the computer and you can do the teamwork. The teamwork in, even in the office, you can control the ROM to send the data and the video by the teamwork. It is very easy, right? Uh, here is the video you can see. As the video, you can see the from this drone. This is our uh, testing flight for drones. It called Xunmin S4 integrated systems. And it can integrate the uh, CUA Autopilot V5 Plus or X7 series flight controllers and use the new V2 or new 3 Pro uh, GNSS. And it can use the LDSC, the data and videos together. And also we, we can integrate other uh, remote controllers. The flight time can reach 35 minutes and it can reach 20 kilometers so for the range. So you can see the weight can be with the three kilometers. This is the uh, testing platform. Now from more more testing, this is really high uh, testing uh, drones, very high, very stable now for this drone. And next we introduce uh, the drone systems number two, we call four plus one VTOL. And you can see this one, two, three, four, four motors and one motor here. And we, this uh, the drone, we use materials for EPO and the couple fiber, and it can reach the, the range for 150 kilometers. You can see the weights can reach 10.1 kilo, kilograms, because it is a very high performance for this storm. This is our new storms for you see. And the battery, you can use this 2,200. So the, the, uh, the speed also very high. So 
So this was uh, for today. We share today. Thank you so much for visiting. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, so uh, thanks very much, Lindy. Much appreciate your um, the. It's great to see the the hangar in particular. That's um, there's been a, a number of companies done hangars like that, and they're incredibly powerful as uh, mechanisms for for running remote operations. Uh, really good mm -hmm. to see that. Um, Thank you. Also good to see more F9P GPSs coming out. Uh, I'm a, <laughs> very keen on that. Uh, higher quality GPS makes such a difference. So Thank you so much. Any other questions from the audience? Looks like there's uh, looks like there's a question there from uh, Tim Whitehand about the connectors. Tim word connector, you mean for the CUAV club? Yeah, the new new aviation grade connectors. I guess he's mm -hmm. Tim Whitehand wants to hear more about those connectors. Uh, for the teamwork, you can uh, control the drones. Uh, for for your teamwork, you can uh, have uh, several accounts. So we can have uh, several members to control the drones, to send the data and videos to control the drones. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Well. Thank you very much, Lindy, much appreciated. And um, so um, that, that brings us to the end. We, unfortunately, we aren't able to have the, uh, the presentation from UAvionics. Um, they had some, some travel uh, apparently that need and weren't able to make it uh, sort of at the last minute. So uh, that brings us to the end of the fifth session of the uh, IG Pilot 2021 Dev Conference. And uh, so we're back in um, about four and a half hours. And uh, so at that point, we'll be uh, starting on our final session. And uh, so that final session kicks off with Marco Muller talking about uh, open mission control and IG pilot. Then Matt Keir talking about the IG pilot thrust stand. And finally, we've got the, the dev team roadmap. And uh, for the, those of you who are planning to be, participate in the Dev Team Roadmap discussion, which I hope is a lot of you, it might be worth um, having a look through last year's uh, mm -hmm. Roadmap presentation. And I'll just pop that in the, uh, the conference okay. chat. Uh, so <laughs> there's a link to the video from last year. And also I'll put in a link to the... Um, the little document, the scratch pad that we were working on during that last video. So I've just popped that scratch pad um, in the conference April 2021 um, group chat. And so um, it might be worthwhile having a look through that just so we don't cover the same ground as, as last year and then compare to what we've achieved compared to, to last year. Um, so um, uh, see you all back here in about... Uh, four and a half hours time and uh, hope you have a good rest in between for those of you who stayed up very late for this uh, these talks apologies that we ran over a little bit but I uh, hope you'll agree that it was worthwhile and some absolutely fantastic presentations all right thanks George thanks everyone thanks, George. Thank you. thanks everybody catch you later <laughs>